Generals, <coughs> honor speakers, dear colleagues and attendees. Also a very, uh, very warm welcome to all of you following us uh, online. I think we have now counted uh, two, three hundred and in that area. My name is Trygve Smith and uh, on behalf of the Norwegian Military Academy, I have the honor to welcome you to our yearly seminar on land operations and combined arms. This year's topic is lessons identified from the war in Ukraine. We have 20 presenters covering a wide range of topics relevant for land warfare. It is a grave situation in Europe now, and as professionals, it is important to stay updated on the development gather available information and increase our mental preparedness in case we are called upon. I'm very happy and proud to see you all here, where we can contribute to knowledge sharing among pr practitioners and scholars alike and on such an important matter. This is also an opportunity to network, both maintaining old friendships and to create new ones. Some administrative remarks. Since we have uh, a lot of um, uh, attendees online, we have to observe the schedule quite strictly. Uh, we have people watching from the US uh, and Australia, so it's important that we keep the timings. There are cables on the floor here, and uh, because it's a carpet, the tape is not strong enough to keep it in place. So please be gentle and do not step on it. Um, please uh, tread over. In between the presentations, um, Yuri uh, at the rear, she's the lady in the tan uh, jacket. She will prepare the speaker. So for all the speakers, please make contact with her in the breaks before you or in the break before you are going to present. For the lunch. When, uh, since we are so many, I would like to ask you to take your seats, start filling up uh, towards the left and the rear of the air, um, dining area, and then fill up towards the bar. And the uh, waiters will start serving you as soon as we have filled up the tables. And um, Major Brott, Thomas Brott, he will... Um, help me uh, to arrange this and any administrative issues, if you have any, he will uh, assist you to solve them. And uh, at the rear, uh, we have Martin. He is the technical producer. He is the gentleman to the left with the long hair. Um, so if you have any uh, questions regarding the production or whatever, you can ask him after each day we will uh, put the edited version of the video of the uh, of the of each day out on the website so it will be available for you to watch later if uh, if you would like to do so before we kick off with our first presentation i would like to introduce the pro dean at the norwegian defense university my friend jonas bjørneby he was completing his postdoctorate in Rome when he found out that he would join the army and see the world. <laughs> After completing an extended period with intelligence and the army staff, he's now back in the academic sphere and he will present very briefly the research and development at the Norwegian Defense University. Jonas, please. Thank you, Trygve. Let me start by uh, thanking you for inviting me to this timely and very relevant conference. We are now at the critical time regarding international security challenges. Russia's invasion of and warfare in Ukraine has fundamentally changed the political re uh, reality in Europe. The implications both for our societies and for our armed forces are enormous. In addition, climate change, digitalization and hybrid warfare, as well as demographic trends, will strongly affect us all in the years to come, and not least in our region. 
To meet these challenges, knowledge and high-quality research is more important than ever. At the Norwegian Defence University College, we take this responsibility very seriously. Research is fundamental as a part of our mission, and research-based education is crucial to equip future officers with up-to-date and relevant knowledge. As many of you know, the NDUC consists of seven schools and departments that are uh, involved in research and development. The Cyber Engineering School, the Institute for Defense Studies, the Military Academy, the Air Force Academy, the Naval Academy, and the Staff College, all with their unique expertise and research initiatives. Our research portfolio includes a wide variety of projects and initiatives in research fields spanning from security and defense policy, Asian studies, land operations, future Air Force operations, geopolitical development and the maritime domain, extended reality and education, military leadership, joint operations, as well as cyber power and security. To strengthen cooperation between our schools and institutes, we have also established several cross-departmental research groups, focusing inter alia on exercises and wargaming, targeting, Arctic security, land operations, the group that has so successfully organized this conference, and not least on the total defense concept and on the war in Ukraine. The overall research activity at the NDUC is considerable, and our expertise is now more than ever in high demand. We live in a global world. Research collaboration across national and sectorial boundaries will be the key to meeting future security challenges, given their cross-border nature. And only by being part of top-level international scientific networks can we advance our own knowledge and stay in the forefront? This conference is an excellent opportunity in this regard, to expand our perspectives, discuss ideas, and perhaps to establish partnerships for future joint pro projects as well. Researchers at the NDUC are in general very internationally oriented, and most of them already cooperate with fellow academics in a variety of countries in Europe and beyond. Our collaboration with Ukraine is close and is increasing, and we formalized formalize our excellent relations in a memorandum of um, understanding last year. Like all of you, we are, of course, very worried about our colleagues there, and thankfully, as far as we know, they are not harmed. Swedish and Finnish applications for NATO membership is a geopolitical game changer, and hopefully before long, all the Nordic and the Baltic countries will be members of the same military alliance for the first time in history. This provides us with unique opportunities to take the Nordic-Baltic research cooperation to the next level. We can pool our resources to address research questions unique to the Nordic countries as well. Of course, knowledge is of no use if we do not disseminate it. As part of academia, the NDUC has an important democratic function to provide policymakers, the scientific community, the defense sector, and society at large with independent research of highest quality. Our researchers take this responsibility seriously and participate actively in the public debate. Your conference here today is an excellent example to follow. In a time where knowledge is needed more than ever, I am beyond impressed by the quality and professionalism with which you have gathered such a broad audience of scholars and military professionals across national borders, scientific fields, and time zones. To conclude, global security threats today are increasingly domain crossing, and new technology represents both opportunities and challenges. In addition, the war in Ukraine will leave a long-lasting impact on Europe and the world. The world is changing, but one thing remains certain. Knowledge and high-quality research across borders and sectors is more important than ever. I wish you an interesting and fruitful three days, and thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>
Thank you, Jonas. Um, I would just also just I would just like to mention that uh, the Chief of Defense will open this uh, seminar formally after lunch. He was not able to come here this morning due to other meetings. And um, now I'd like to introduce the first uh, presenter of today. He will uh, present uh, uh, a theory of land warfare and uh, Dr. L um, Lieutenant Colonel retired Jim Storr. He is an independent defense consultant. He is also a uh, former British Army officer. He studied civil engineering before joining the army and serving in the British Army of the Rhine for much of the 1980s. During a series uh, of staff and regimental appointments in the Falkland Islands, Northern Ireland and Cyprus, he studied at the Royal Military College of Science and the Army Staff College at Camberley. In the 1990s, he worked on policy for the introduction of battlefield computing and was then a military advisor to operational research teams. He then spent five years writing and teaching high-level military doctrine. In, two in 2002, he was awarded a doctorate for a thesis on the nature of military thought. He retired after 25 years service as a lieutenant colonel in 2006. In his second career, his main actives, activities are consultancy, research, writing and teaching. He has spoken at several staff colleges and dozens of national and international conferences. His clients include defense industrial corporations, government research uh, agencies and universities, and he was Professor of War Studies, a part-time appointment at the Norwegian Military Academy from 2013 to 17. He has published five books and is currently working on a sixth. So, Jim Storr, welcome, please. <coughs> Colonel Smith, thank you very much. Generals, ladies, gentlemen, it is an honor and a pleasure to be back. War is collective armed violence for political purposes. Warfare is the conduct of war. An enormous amount has been written about both. There is lots of theory about war, particularly from our international relations colleagues about how they start, why they start, and perhaps how to finish them. There are lots of theories about warfare, and particularly some parts or some aspects. Armoured warfare counterinsurgency, aerial warfare, naval warfare, but there is no overarching theory of warfare. What I hope to do in the next few minutes is to describe the beginnings of an attempt to define, to develop a theory of warfare. The reason why I'm doing it is that Colonel Smith and Chris Lawrence, who is also in the audience, and I, we are collaborating on a book uh, this will be the first chapter, and if that goes well, then I will develop the work into the whole of another book, which will be book six, six which Colonel Smith just spoke about. But why a theory? Why do we need a theory of warfare? Many of us are military men or retired military men, and we know what we're doing, don't we? Or do we? I wouldn't say for a moment that we don't, but I'd like to draw a very strong analogy. Medieval cathedrals. Across Europe, there are hundreds of them. In England alone, there are 26. They are beautiful. They are inspiring. They cost a vast amount of money to build. And most of them took many years, and in some cases, centuries to build. So you would think that the master, built, master masons who built them knew what they were doing. Well, they, maybe they did, and maybe they didn't. Those are buttresses in English. Buttresses basically keep walls up. Interestingly, those particular buttresses are older than the cathedral that I just showed you. When a medieval mason found that his cathedral was falling down, he would stick a buttress on the outside to prop it up. And some of these are themselves beautiful. This is Gloucester Cathedral. That is an arch, 
And if I just describe, that is the main tower leading up to the tower of the cathedral. And as they were building it, this is Gloucester, as they were building it, that pillar there started to bend. So they think, oh dear. So they beautifully built this. It's actually strictly, it's a flying buttress. But you can tell that that's what happened because if you look there, it's just a normal piece of wall. If you look there, they had to stiffen the wall to carry the thrust. Okay. That painting was painted in 1689. Some of you might recognize that that is Sir Isaac Newton, who discovered, shall we say, gravity. Newton was actually a professor of, ma of mathematics. And not only could he work out what gravity was and how it worked, but he could go so far as to describe it in mathematical terms. And I'm sure that many of you who have studied science or engineering have been bored to death with how to make that work. Fine, so what? That portrait was painted in um, 1711. That is Sir Christopher Wren, who is a well-known British architect of the times. He designed and built St Paul's Cathedral in central London. It was built, it was finished by 1719. It is exactly as built. It has never been buttressed or anything else that has ever been done to it. It was built like that and it stands like that to this day. And the difference is that Wren and Newton, who were contemporaries, they knew each other. They were both members of the British Royal Society. Wren could apply the mathematics that Newton had developed for gravity and apply gravity to the other forces working within a building. And that's why St Paul's Cathedral is as it was. The dome has a diameter of about 35 metres, just under that. And you might say, well, that's not particularly clever because, for example, some of you will know, excuse me, this isn't clicking. There we go. Sorry, we've just gone too far there. I just need to get back to where we were. No, sorry. It'll take a little bit to get back. No, it's going the wrong. All right, try again. Some of you will know of the, originally the Cathedral of St. Sophia in Istanbul. That has an absolutely beautiful dome with a diameter it's not playing, come on. I'll keep it upright, that might work. It, that's, that's the picture I wanted to put up. That is the inter, in, inside of the dome of St. Sophia. It's got a diameter of about 30 metres, well, sort of. When you actually look, the dome isn't actually circular. It's out by about 60 centimetres, two feet in some places. When they actually did a very precise survey of the dome, it's out of shape as well in some places the actual, the roof has fallen by about just over a metre. And how do they keep it upright? Well, actually, what they do is they've buttressed it. And just to give you some idea, when it was first built, they had to add buttresses before it was even completed. Since then, they've had to add some more. And if you look down there, there's another one, two, three, four, five, six buttresses down there. Altogether, there are 24 additional buttresses. In other words, yes, they could build amazing things, but no, they didn't know how or why, and when they fell down, they didn't really know why they fell down. So theory is important. What do theories give us? They should explain, for example, why cathedrals fall down. Extant known phenomena. They should resolve anomalies. What the master masons found was that things that they thought should be all right, weren't all right, and they didn't really know why that was. And also paradoxes. A paradox strictly is two sentences which both appear to be true, but contradict <laughs> each other. So they can't both be true. And the reason why paradoxes exist fundamentally is that our basic understanding of what's underneath them is flawed. Now, if I tell you, many of you will be familiar with the US Field Marshal 324, when it first appeared, it's counterinsurgency doctrine, um, Petraeus and uh, Mattis. When it first appeared in 2006, it had a section of nine paradoxes of counterinsurgency operations. So that's telling us, with due respect to those generals who did a wonderful job of advancing our practice of counterinsurgency operations, they hadn't really resolved what was underneath it. So that's another reason why theory should be useful to us. And in some cases, a theory should allow us some degree of prediction. Now, this is going to be a problem in warfare, and I'll come back to that later. 
and it should develop, sorry, allow practitioners, people like yourselves who are actually doing this, to get better at what we're doing. And just think, for example, leap from 1719 to 1930 or so when Australian engineers developed the Sydney Harbour Bridge. You could not have designed that if you didn't have an understanding of Newtonian physics. And if you couldn't have designed that, you certainly couldn't have designed that, the Sydney Opera House built in the 1960s. Theory is worth having. In addition, a theory should be explicit and coherent. It should be written down so that we know what it is. Those master masons, they knew a lot about building cathedrals and most of them stayed up most of the time. But they didn't have an explicit theory and Newton gave them that. Theories also provide a taxonomy, basically a classification. What do we mean by war? What are the subordinate if you like, aspects of war, how do we classify those? Do we talk about, for example, aspects of warfare like counterinsurgency, air war and so forth? Or do we talk in a different classification about, for example, strategic, operational and tactical? Those are taxonomies. Now, Wren managed to take advantage of Newton's ability to provide a quantitative theory. Quantitative is something whereby we can measure and we can then use mathematics to understand the relationships between the various quantities that we have. If you look at a dictionary under qualitative, we get into the word quality and it means two things. The first one doesn't really help us. It's a measure of something as compared to something of, of, of similar like. So, for example, the quality of hallmark silver against hallmark gold or something like that. But more usefully in this case, Quality relates to a distinctive attribute or characteristic. So where we're going to start to get into our theory of warfare is look at qualitative aspects in the first place. Possibly, possibly we'll be able to extend that, but I would suggest not yet into mathematical treatment. But as you'll hear during this conference, in some areas I think we can. And in some areas, I think, see that as an area for subsequent development. But not by me. My maths isn't simply good enough. Taxonomies, classification require definitions. And in this place, we are woefully bad. I suspect you don't really realise how bad we are at our definitions. Because, for example, we have a NATO glossary of this, that and the other. But, for example, what do we mean by strategy? To some people, strategy is almost anything to do with war and warfare. So, for example, someone who calls himself a strategist or is called a strategist might just be a military thinker. But another definition of strategy comes down to the application of military power at the state level. So it's actually a much tighter, much narrower definition of strategy. And, for example, last year I was involved in talking to a lady who was presenting. Um, she was developing and finishing a PhD thesis on the operational art in, forgive me, I won't say which theatre of war, it doesn't really matter. But when I looked at the definition she was using for operations and the operational level, it was so wide it was almost meaningful, sorry, meaningless, because it stretched right down to the tactical and strayed up into the operational, uh, sorry, up into the strategic. We're not as good at definitions in everyday use as we need to be. So, we should be able to use agreed definitions, like, for example, Newton's de definition of gravity, to avoid ambiguity. What I just spoke about in the case of strategy was classic ambiguity. We should use terms that will, are within, uh, sorry, which are narrow definitions within the common meaning. I don't want to get into gender politics, but recently there was a case in Britain where a woman accused another woman of violence, by which she meant verbal aggression. And that was actually a reasonable complaint to make. But actually, in the dictionary, violence is force intended to do, to do harm. There was no force involved. There was verbal aggression. Can we please make sure that the definitions that we use are within the common meaning of the term. Precision. 
We should, of course, be precise with our definitions we can, but we should also to tolerate some imprecision, some uncertainty, partial truth and approximation for two reasons. One is because the human brain is actually quite good at that. The other thing is if we're not careful, we allow um, typically academics to get into very, very pedantic arguments, which doesn't necessarily help us. So some specific definitions that I'm going to take forward in this presentation and then in my work. Firstly, war and warfare. War is a collective armed violence for political purposes. Warfare, the conduct of war. And you'll see why those are useful to us in due course. Politics. Politics, the manner by which power is brokered within a society. We all come from democratic countries where we think of politics as what uh, our elected representatives do, what the town or the city council does, elections, those kind of things. Well, that's the way that power is bro brokered in a democratic society. You only have to step across the Ukrainian or the Finnish or the Norwegian border into Russia and realize that that's not the way that power is brokered in Russia. So when we talk about war as being, for example, collective armed violence for political purposes, it's about the brokering of power. I will take a very, very narrow set of definitions relating to strategy, which I've said before, the operational level relating very narrowly to the direction of military operations at the level of the theatre and campaign, and the tactical level below that as a level of individual battles and engagements. The discussion on winning and losing in particular is astonishing. The number of times I have come across good experienced and respected military historians saying that basically winning and losing in warfare have no meaning because they are so vague. Ah, oh, but we all know what we're talking about. Well, actually, no, we don't. Can both sides win? Well, sometimes they can. Can you talk about wars in which, for example, somebody won all the battles and lost the war? Well, actually, you can. So what do you actually mean? I'm going to avoid that. I'm going to talk in different terms, which I'll come to in a moment. But the other thing is victory. To the Romans, victory, and it is a Roman word, Latin word, is very, very simple. It is a declared political act. A victory was awarded, typically by the Senate, when a general came home and they said it was a victory. And it was more about the political act than actually what had happened on the battlefield. And that can make one very cynical, but I think that you have to be realistic about those things. Decisive. I'm going to be rude about our colleagues from the Air Force here, but I actually read something about such and such was partially decisive. Well, no. The definition of decisive is it resolves or settles an issue. Something can't partially resolve or settle an issue. It either does or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then at best it is contributory. But there you are, another very simple word, and you resolve the ambiguity. Conflict. I'm not going to define conflict, I'm actually going to talk about it in due course. Conflict is the broader, if you like, set of events which war is a part of, but there is a lot of conflict which is not war. And that's actually useful to us because we can start to get into our taxonomy rather better. If war is collective armed violence for political purpose, well, what about individual armed violence for political purpose? Well, that may be assassination. That may be something else. It's probably crime, but it's not war. What about collective violence which is not armed? Well, that's probably rioting. We have other words for these things. What about collective armed violence for purposes which are not political? Well, that's probably gangsterism. That's drug cartels. This is all useful because by looking at co uh, conflict and the definition of war that I came up with, we can start to break down and say what war is and what war isn't. <coughs> In every war that you've ever looked at, the politicians who are trying to give, by their own views, direction, political direction to the conduct of the war, also have ongoing business to deal with. For example, uh, when France was involved in the counterinsurgency in Algeria, they had enormous difficulty separating that from the government of France, not least because Algeria wasn't officially a colony, it was a department of France. Similarly, the British in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland is a part of the United Kingdom. And trying to separate domestic issues from issues related to what we would now call a counterinsurgency campaign in Northern Ireland was hugely difficult. Not least, we never referred to it as, as an insurgency for political reasons. <coughs> 
what is, which particular war are we talking about? I've seen writers, international relations historians, talking about the war against Germany which started in 1914 and ended in 1945. No, I haven't made a mistake. I think it is reasonable to say that there was a period of conflict which involved much of Europe and particularly Germany and some of it involved fighting during that period. But I think it's actually easier and more useful to say that it was actually the invasion of Belgium in 1914 which started the First War or the Great War and it was the armistice signed in France in, in November 1918 which ended the First War. Both of those were political acts. You can do similarly for the Second World War. And you can say that the period in between was a, a period of conflict of some type. But to say it's all one war, I don't think is very helpful. So it's useful, I think, to look at it in those ways. Please don't get hung up with the word spectrum because I don't really, I wouldn't want to go into it. I don't think spectrum is useful. But if you say that war is armed violence for political purposes, you can start to say, what are those purposes? You can then say what kind of violences typify them. So, for example, the violence that you encounter in, a counter in, in an insurgency or a counterinsurgency campaign are different from, shall we say, major interstate war. And we can start to look at our spectrum, let's call it that, and we're beginning to develop a taxonomy which I hope is useful. Purpose. There are many aspects of purpose, enough to fill at least a chapter of a book, and if you'd like to, you can buy it over there. <coughs> but some aspects of, of purpose which I think are relevant here. First of all, if there is no purpose to a war, then all that death and all that loss is purposeless. It's futile. And you hear this so often about wars, that because that's part of it, but there is another point. I think there needs to be what I've described as a golden thread of purpose from the highest level down to the lowest level. Now, a private soldier doing something isn't necessarily responsible for the political direction of the war, but is what he is doing contributing to the tactical goals, the operational goals, the strategic goals, or not? And if not, his actions are purposeless, they are futile, and quite possibly his death is futile. And I would go further than that, and I'm quite happy to defend this, but probably not now, to say that some of what we do under NATO's command and control procedures routinely breaks that golden thread of purpose, and that needs to be addressed. We come back to winning and losing. I say the terms themselves are so vague as to be useless, but can we say that a, a certain action for example, an ambush, say in Vietnam in 1968, achieved its tactical purpose, it was a tactical success. Yes, I think we can say that. Can we say that about, say for an example, um, an engagement on the Golan Heights in 1973? We can say that, or we can say it's failed. We can then say things like, did they contribute to the operational goals? And a very good example, I think it's 470 BC, the Battle of Thermopylae. Leonidas, king of the Spartans, 300 Spartans and several hundred other Greeks, tried to block the, the, the Greeks coming, sorry, the Persians coming through the pass at Thermopylae, the hot springs. After three days of battle, they lost. The Persians poured through. Every single Spartan was killed. Tactical failure, I think you will agree. A few months later, at a place called Leuctra, the Greeks had managed to assemble possibly as many and possibly even more Greeks than there were Persians. And Laocha was the defeat of Xerxes and Xerxes had to take his army back into Persia. The operational consequence of Leonidas' actions at the Hot Springs Thermopylae was to unite Greece. You could say that was a strategic consequence. So we can say in that case, clear tactical failure. Clear operational success and we can now talk in those terms i think you know this kind of discussion becomes quite clear but also how you end a war now some people in the ir community are very good at talking about this and i think it's very useful but <clears throat> what are the activities by which we bring a war to a conclusion and you say for example in the terms of the great war the paris peace talks of 1918 
Right, did they do a good job? Because we can now talk in terms of, for example, the strategic purposes. And actually, a lot of the discussion, what is it now, four years ago, points to the fact, here we are now, many years after the event, saying actually there were shortcomings in that process. But I think we can now look at that, we can now understand that. And I think that's now a little bit easier to see. Within conflict, there is often combat. What does combat mean? It's not a word that used to be used in British English very much, but there is a British English definition, fighting typically between armed forces. And that's mostly what we're here to talk about because, for example, we're going to talk about Ukraine, which is broadly, let's call it conventional warfare. And I think that's useful because it's the sort of paradigm that we are typically talking about, but I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail. The first thing to say about combat is it is irretrievably human. Now, I know that we're now talking about unmanned drone strikes in Ukraine, but we have been, for example, uh, over the Golan Heights literally since the early 1980s. I might be corrected, it might be earlier than that, and so on and so forth. But land warfare in particular is irretrievably human and we need to understand what that means because human emotion and human dynamics become deeply important. It's also adversarial. There is another side. And perhaps often one side is an alliance where people have lots of different uh, motivations and so on and so forth. But at not least, things are adversarial. So some, th some acti actions, activities may be literally impossible because the other guy is trying to stop you. Well, we understand that. But it's also violent and that's important in many ways. One is not least because there is death and wounding, but also because it is dangerous and that affects human emotion. An awful lot of what we read about on the battlefield is a consequence of stress and fear, which are human responses to the violence of the battlefield. It's also compelling. And there's another officer sitting there in the audience who will smile because back in October when I put that bullet up, he said, can you just tell us what that means? And I'd like to thank him because actually he more or less forced me to go and check in the dictionary. Compelling, he knows who he is, compelling or coercive. It obliges or requires the opponent to respond. In the case of the battlefield in fighting, we're talking about typically to protect himself or his forces. If you can compel or coerce the opponent to respond, you have for that moment a brief advantage. You have the initiative, the ability to dictate the tactical course of events. If you can then follow that up in a timely manner, you can maintain the initiative. This then gives us a benefit, an advantage in, first of all, preempting by doing something violent first and therefore compelling him to respond. But secondly, by continuing to act quickly and therefore all the discussion that you hear about tempo and speed and so on and so forth. Combat is also dynamic, and particularly land combat, in two ways. Well, first of all, there is movement, and that's important. But secondly, from a system's point of view, the environment, the system, the interactions are changing all the time. And that has a major consequence, which is complexity. If you then look at complexity theory, you find all sorts of things which tell us a lot about war and warfare. And in particular in land warfare, because there are so many actors, each of which has individual will, you get an intensely, astonishingly complex, almost chaotic environment. Look at complexity theory and what does it tell us? Any complex organization, any complex system has emergent properties. I would contend, and there is some numerical analysis behind this, that the most important are human. They are the phenomena of shock and surprise. They are more prevalent, not just to individuals, but units and whole formations than you may think. For example, one very, very well analyzed paper said that in some cases, surprise can have the same effect as a force ratio of 1200 to one. Now, in a sense, that's ridiculous because you never get force ratios that high, but it tells you if you multiply the most effective thing you ever thought you had up to 1,200 to 1, you can see how shock and surprise can come to dominate the battlefield. And if that's the stuff of battles and engagement, therefore operational outcome, therefore strategic outcome. And linked into what I was saying earlier about preemption, uh, 
Shock and surprise are human phenomena. They are transient, they wear off, they have to be exploited. And if you wish to maintain the initiative, you need to do so in a rapid, quick, high tempo manner. The other thing about complex systems, however, is that they are of themselves unpredictable. I don't think any of you would ever think, if you look at a historical account, that the people who went into a battle knew the course of the battle and its outcome in any detail. That just doesn't happen. We know it's unpredictable. But one of the reasons why it's unpredictable is simply the complexity. But the other one is the human activity. You may well commit some violence against an opponent. You don't actually know how he will respond. You may well think that he will respond, but you don't know how. And that all adds up to the intense unpredictability of contact, combat. Finally, under this list, combat is evolutionary. Each side always seeks to gain an advantage over the opponent, either in the short term, different tactics, different approaches. In the slightly longer term, development of tactics, development of weapons, and so on and so forth, up to and including, for example, strategic su su surprise. And this constant seeking for advantage is evolutionary, but I would argue, actually, when you look at the historical record, it's often not really revolutionary. And it's interesting to say what people think by the term revolutions in warfare. When we look at combat, there are two distinctive approaches, and what I'm about to say goes back to an American uh, military thinker uh, who wrote about 30 years ago. This is not at all Jim Stewart's thinking. I literally, I copied this from his book. But there are two distinctive approaches, which are the first one is so every day, so typical that we don't really have a name for it, and that's why I'm calling it the conventional approach. The other one is what he called the raiding approach, and it's more widespread than you might think. In conventional warfare, the, the critical thing is that territory has value. The aggressor attacks, if he's successful, he typically retains the territory, and the opponent typically attempts to counterattack and regain that territory. And think of the First World War, you might be thinking about one trench. Thinking about the Second World War, you might be thinking a bridgehead, a bridge too far, the Battle of Arnhem, or the, battle of the, the bridge at Remagen, or something like that. Or you might be thinking about, about a whole country. But fundamentally, I'm not saying that territory has the only value, but it does have value. In raiding, con con by comparison, territory has no particular value. The aggressor attacks, does damage and moves on. Typically, he withdraws, but not necessarily. Um, much of the impact is psychological. For those of you who are Americans or um, know, know about American history, think of um, Sherman's March to the Sea. A lot of that was effectively, a, should we call it, a strategic raid. But that raid may be a raid on a trench. It might be special forces operations. It might be air power. And just to really annoy air power theorists, almost all of air power is raiding for the very simple reason that aircraft attack and then they go home. It's raiding. And that is not to criticize air power or the, our air force colleagues. It's just to recognize that what they do is different or in nature from broadly what soldiers do. And of course, a sophisticated operational approach may, can, and often has, very successfully, combined both. Think, for example, of the northern side in uh, the uh, American Civil War, and hence Sherman's March to the Sea. <coughs> Interesting, when you look at it from a long-term perspective, it was uh, actually Archer Jones, the, where he comes from, he suggested that the stronger force typically raids for either to gain economically or politically, or perhaps to deploy or did, uh, dis deplete or destroy enemy supplies, typically Sherman. To live at the enemy's expense, also in that case Sherman. But also, interestingly, and not in the case of Sherman, to force the enemy to fight. So, for example, by invading the other guy's territory, you force him to come to battle to defend his own territory. And for some of you I notice who are naval officers here, you can imagine if you say in round terms, sea space rather than territory. There are analogies both on both sides of the equation, if you like. But interestingly, for the weaker force, three of those apply, but the other one is to avoid major battles. Typically, for example, terrorists or insurgents in the early stages of a, a contest are too weak to hold ground, and they know that if they try to um, hold ground, they will be fixed by a superior enemy who can then destroy them. 
So the sensible thing is, if you're an insurgent, take your AK home with you, hide it somewhere, and go home. That's raiding. To make some observations and conclusions. What I've been talking about so far is entirely qualitative. I've been trying to come up with some distinctive attributes of war and hence warfare, and I've done it in a strictly rationalistic way by looking at the meaning of terms and verbal argumentation. And I will very quickly, but it's about the use and the threat of use of violence, the role of purpose, essentially human nature of war. Please read on down, but you can see what I've effectively done there is highlighted what I've said so far. I think now, on Tuesday morning, and I finalise this on Friday, there's at least one built bullet missing there. I'll be very grateful for any of you, your views on that, either now or subsequently. But what we've also added into the mix, and it comes from reading Archie Jones, in my case about 30 years ago, and realising that much of it doesn't get into the mainstream literature on warfare, I think that's very important, particularly the fact that you can, in a very sophisticated way, integrate both of them. And not always well. What I would say is that, to put it politely, some adherents of, ra of raiding, pause, raid in order to pol further their own domestic political agendas. We are a better mm force because we're special, because we do this stuff. And I'm not going to be much more uh, specific than that. Quantification. There's a little bit of quantification. I came up with a figure of 1200 to 1. Yes, I think we can quantify some of these things. You'll hear Chris Lawrence speaking later, and, and, uh, and he will be in some cases quantifying some of these things. But have we got to the point where we can, like Wren, manipulate the mathematics developed by um, Newton? No, we're not there yet. Prediction. Prediction is very, very interesting. I did a quick study for the British General Staff about the, issue, the, um, uh, the troubles in Northern, uh, Northern Ireland, and there were issues, certainly, and I'm not going to discuss them in open mind, where we could make predictions about what would happen. They were often of a technical nature. There is some ability to predict things in war, and in that case it was actually predicting the enemy's response to something. I think we can reasonably predict, just to go back slightly, excuse me, that many of those things will persist. And I think you would probably agree with me. But when you looked at that list in detail, sorry, just go, go back on that one, to the issue of prediction, I think you will agree that it is likely that the course and the outcome of individual battles, hence campaigns, hence wars, will largely be unpredictable partly because of the complexity, but partly because of the intensely human aspect and the fact that we cannot predict in particular what the other guy will do. Most theories, when they are first proposed, have material which is familiar. And medieval stonemasons knew that things fell down, so N Newton wasn't novel there. However, his, his conceptualization that it was a force like other forces that could be considered mathematically was novel. And in some cases, new theories are contentious. Well, hey, don't mind that at all. But what I would be grateful for, either now, and I think we've got about 10 minutes left, or at any time from now on, including, please, and I'll stick up my email in future, if you have any comments or questions or thoughts, because this is very much a work in progress, I would very much appreciate hearing them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, Jim. As always, very interesting <laughs> to listen to your uh, concepts and uh, ideas. We now have 10 minutes for questions and answers. And uh, Major Brot has a microphone that we'll uh, bring around. So the first question goes to Kirklin Bateman. Hi, uh, Kirklin Bateman from Marine Corps University. Just, um, I, I really appreciate your presentation. Thanks for kicking us off. One thing I would, I would, I would think just as a consideration for your, one of your last slides when you talked about the raiding as a different type of warfare and the focus wasn't on territory, I think 
really what, what the author is talking about in that particular sense is irregular warfare, and the focus then becomes on the population. The population is the battle space, not a specific uh, territorial objective. And I think the same thing, your, your, your uh, um, interesting comment on, like if you're an insurgent or a terrorist, you're absolutely right, very defensively postured. You're not interested in holding territory because, again, the battle space is the population. The battle space is not necessarily um, a, a territorial objective or a piece of terrain. The, the objective becomes what kind of influence can you, can you have on the population itself. And I think that certainly Sherman's March to the Sea, as you mentioned in the U.S. Civil War, uh, a strategic raid, I think that's a very interesting uh, label to it. And, it. and again, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Is that really is the focus on the population um, and in that particular example is the focus on a particular geographic objective. From a regular warfare perspective, the, the objective is always influencing the population and gaining legitimacy or maintaining legitimacy. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. And I, uh, I agree with 95% of what you're saying, but I think we could, and I'd delight to have a discussion over a cup of coffee, extend that. I put up the fact that a lot of the impact of um, raiding is psychological. The subtext there is that the damage done in an individual raid, with the exception of something like Sherman's March to the Tea, is often quite modest. The effect is often on the people who perceive it. And your point, which I agree with entirely, is much of that is about the population. Will the population affect the politics? Of course they do, and therefore a lot of raiding gets from the fairly narrow tactical up to affecting the politicians pretty quickly. Of course it does. An American, and please forgive me for saying this, but I think it needs to be said, Al-Qaeda stri strikes the Twin Towers. It's a raid, except they didn't come back, but you, you get my point. Yeah. Now, it had a major strategic effect. Actually, it was poor decision-making, because all it did was annoy the most powerful nation on Earth. But did that raid have political impact? Did that affect the population? Yes, of course it did. So, yeah, I take your point entirely. But go also go back to those horrible days of 1915, in particular, on the Western Front. Why did the Brits, why did the French, why did the Germans raid? Largely because of the psychological impact on the opposition to try and make them afraid to come out of their trenches. So I think the general point, which we would probably agree with, is actually about the psychological effect. But yes, also, the thing about the gearing up to the population and the so what. Yeah, thank you very much for your remark. Thank you. Uh, Neil. Uh, Neil Mackay from England. Um, Jim, two authors, I think, to mention in the context of what you're thinking about. One is old J.F.C. Fuller, mad yeah. as a coot, of course, <laughs> wrote down Principles of War, 1916, which pervaded Western doctrine yeah. thinking. Um, his Foundations of the Science of War in the 20s, yeah. superficially, is occultist nonsense. Yeah. And that's what everybody thinks of it. Actually, if you get down below the surface, there's some seriously important thinking there that I think your work has to key into. Perhaps more seriously, uh, Seymour Deitchman is one of the very few thinkers in the States in the 60s to have bridged the qualitative with the quantitative. He wrote down the first sensible mathematical model of guerrilla war and also wrote a very good book called uh, was it Limited War in American Foreign Policy, I think. Um, he's a very subtle thinker. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're, you're thinking about the context of Archie Jones and, and raiding, then I think uh, Deitchman always needs to be one of the major figures in the, in the mix. Uh, thank you. Um, Fuller is actually is, is already in the draft chapter. Um, Fuller, for those of you who aren't particularly familiar, is, is one of the, the great interwar adherents of armoured warfare in particular. Um, and uh, as Neil then goes on to say, actually in some cases his thinking was a bit unusual. But he said that the, um, something along the lines that the principles of war are not very numerous, and he had a go at um, listing some. Before going there, I'd just like to say one other thing, which I think it was him that said it, which is if there's one thing which is harder to get into the collective military mind than a new idea, one thing is harder is to get a bad idea out. So he came up with this idea of um, uh, principles of war, and he came up with six of them. Or was it nine? Or was it ten? And I'm not looking at my British military colleagues, because I used to be one of them. Every now and again, we certainly, but I also know most other NA uh, NATO nations, define, redefine them from time to time. 
And I believe I'm right in saying, certainly my former German uh, colleagues used to tell me that the German army didn't have any principles of war. And I know for a fact that the Soviet Union, now the Russian Federation, has difficult, different principles of war. So my question would be, going back to Fuller, were they such a good idea after all? Or more to the point, and this is really the bigger broad thing, can we move on from, I know the principles of war, to having a better understanding, if you like a Newtonian understanding, of what's going on? And if we need later to reduce that to 10 quick headlines, I see no harm in that. But certainly when I was at Staff College, our military theory was that there was 10 principles of war. End of discussion. And then you realised actually they changed since the Second World War. So how fundamental were they? Mm. Point made, but thank you, Neil. <coughs> Jim, um, can there be uh, warfare without human interaction? So cyber war, uh, war in space, those other domains that have appeared in the last six years from somebody's imagination, can they... Can there actually be warfare in those circumstances, or is it something different? Space warfare, so that would involve putting weapons into space. Well, first of all, it's legal, but never mind that. Um, can we use collective armed violence for political purposes by putting weapons in space? There's the answer to that one. Cyber warfare. Um, we should be very careful of neologisms. Um, excuse me, because I'm checking my Oxford English Dictionary here. Uh, neologisms. A neologism is a newly coined word or expression. Cyber, Oxford English Dictionary, relates to dig uh, I didn't prompt Mr. Barnes to say this earlier. Cyber relates to digital information technology, the internet, or virtual reality. And the answer to that is no. Cyber warfare is the repackaging, using digital technologies, of many old things which people of my generation and older were deeply familiar with. Espionage, intelligence gathering, propaganda, electronic warfare, jamming and stuff like that. If you apply new digital technologies to that, you can move those forward into the 21st century. I think to call that warfare when there is no direct violence is deliberately using and importing the word warfare in order to help strengthen your hand. And if there are any cyber warfare guys out there, I make no apologies. I think what you're doing is very important. I think you're cheating slightly on the words, but that goes back to why I'm trying to come up with this kind of taxonomy-led theory. Thank you, Barney. Hi, hello. Um, you said earlier in your presentation that uh, NATO activity is futile as it uh, counters the purpose in, in some aspects. Can yeah. you expand on that, please? Well, um, 880,000 British soldiers died in the, in the Great War. What purpose was achieved? Now, with due respect, we can't answer that. Actually, useful purposes were achieved, and some of them the Brits are completely unaware of. Example, late 1917, a politician who Lloyd George carefully leaves out of his, Lloyd George was a British Prime Minister, carefully leads out of his uh, memoirs, um, Lord Alfred Milner, who was a strategist and had also been effectively the vo vo Viceroy in the Boer, Boer War. He and his group, came up with the idea that of the five major powers in Europe, including, say, Austro, Hungary and Russia, that the war should finish with Britain having a major advantage with regards to at least one of them. And that was Turkey. And so over the winter of 1917-1918, they effectively rebuilt an army in Palestine, reinforced the army in Iraq, and effectively made sure that the Ottoman Empire was destroyed. And they did. And you do not find that in British military history. But it's true, it's what they did. Now, did those British and typically Indian soldiers who die in, died in Palestine die for some purpose which furthered British strategic goals? Dead right. If they hadn't, it would have been to some extent futile. Is that a reasonable answer to the question? I mean, we could debate it at great length, but is that a reasonable answer to the question? Uh, it is. I was asking more about the uh, NATO activity that you identified. So I don't think I said NATO. If I did, I apologise. I can't remember the context. That is enough. Thank you. Well, but anyway, I do apologise if, if so. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Uh, I think we need to make a break mm -hmm. and uh, we'll have 50 minutes and the next uh, presentation will start at 10.15. Thank you. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, um, may I please ask you to take your seats? It is perfectly understandable if you uh, are not, uh, or if you need to um, be absent from some of the presentations, and that's okay. But please uh, keep the timing because we have several uh, attendants online, and if they have got up in the morning in, in the US, it's very early. So I would like to be uh, uh, precise and uh, honor their attendance. Next speaker is uh, Major Ben Griffin. He is an assistant professor and the chief military uh, historian at the Department of History at uh, West Point. He um, is the author of the recently published Reagan's War Stories which examines how the Reagan administration used fiction to think about the military balance of power in Europe and throughout the world. He is a military intelligence uh, officer and his most recent assignment was with the 1st Infantry Division. There he served as the S2 of the Division Artillery, the Division Collection Manager and the Division's Deputy Chief of Staff. In these roles, he worked extensively on targeting improving sensor-to-shooter linkage and participated in numerous large-scale exercises both in Europe and in the US with a variety of partner and allied forces. And now he will present Pacing Ourselves, how both US and Russian doctrine evolved since the mid-1970s and its impact on current operations. So Ben, please. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. Generals, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, your attendance and attention. Uh, thank you, Colonel Schmidt, for putting out this wonderful conference. Uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak to all of you today. Uh, I'm very proud to represent the U.S. Military Academy here, uh, though I should note that all the contents of the paper are my own opinions, uh, not necessarily reflective of the U.S. government, particularly the ones that you don't like or agree with. <laughs> Definitely all me. Uh, so there are a few cliches that get tread out more often than the idea that war, war never changes. Right? It's a favorite of video game writers and doctrine writers all over the world. Uh, yet, once a war begins, we find that we're fairly bad at this prediction thing, uh, much like uh, Colonel Storr said in the last presentation. We see that we're often ill-prepared for the conflict at hand because new strategies, technologies, tactics, or domains have rendered the hard-earned lessons from previous conflicts much less valuable. Uh, key reason is often that that next war is rarely where or against whom the planners expect in the interwar years. Yet despite all of this, it's still critical to prepare militaries based on reasonable expectations of what is to come. Uh, and this should really stem from you know, the ability to try and train um, based off of your national capabilities, the histories. We'll understand the ideas of how this emerging technology might shape the battlefield. So what this talk to do is to tell a story uh, about how the US and the Soviet Union and Russia viewed each other as pacing threats from the 1970s up through the present day. Uh, and while I'll largely focus on the US and Russia, I will at times pull back looking more broadly at NATO and the Warsaw Pact, but get this idea of how each identified the threat coming from the other nation and how they reflected their doctrine and their force structure in response to that. Again, using their own uh, policy, their own national histories, and their own concepts of warfare to execute this. Uh, we'll see places where this works fairly well, such as an Operation Desert Storm for the U.S. military, uh, and places where it goes poorly, like the present conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, these examples will be particularly useful in considering what balance NATO should be striking and what lessons we should be drawing from these conflicts in Ukraine, Nagorno-Karabakh, Syria, Libya, again, while keeping our own capabilities, histories, and this, again, emergence technology in mind as we're going forward. So the U.S. Army offered a very grim assessment to its leaders in 1976. There is included war in Vietnam, which at the time was the longest in U.S. history, uh, left the force broken, plagued with indiscipline and drug use and poor recruitment as we tried to listen to an all-volunteer military force. Uh, at the time, we appeared our weakest since the Second World War and hardly able to deter a resurgent Soviet Union. In fact, in 72, only four of the Army's 13 divisions 
were deemed ready for combat. And it was amid this environment that we debuted our newest operational concept, active defense. It drew on the lessons of the Yom Kippur War, uh, as well as American conceptions of Soviet strength. Uh, and in its doctrine, it warned that the first battle of our next war could, be well, could well be its last battle. Even worse, NATO and the U.S. would be at a disadvantage, since much of the Alliance's conventional military strength remained on the far side of the Atlantic Ocean, at the beginning of a long, vulnerable supply line. In the eyes of U.S. strategists, it was conceivable and even likely that the first battle could be fought, ending the war before any unit arrived from North America to help. It was critical then for NATO forces already in Europe to be prepared to fight outnumbered and to win. Successfully doing so would require Allied commanders to ensure they could mass adequate forces and weapons at critical times and places and substitute manpower for, or firepower for manpower whenever possible. Recognizing the challenge of this FM 100-5, the Army's manual describing active defense, helpfully highlighted the commanders that in order to do this, they would have to concentrate at the right place every time, which necessitated continuous instant communications that could not be interrupted and perfect intelligence. So many recognized that was impossible, uh, that the doctrine as written could not actually be implemented. This include the Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, who cautioned National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski about being too optimistic about U.S. conventional forces and warned that the nation was at risk of sliding behind rapidly in military capabilities across the board. The skepticism came in large part due to NATO's shared understanding of Soviet conventional capabilities in the late 70s and the early 80s. In its first publicly released comparison capabilities, Secretary General Joseph Lunds warned that the numerical balance of forces had moved slowly but steadily in favor of the Warsaw Pact over the last two decades. Again, as shown by the chart here uh, on the slide. Uh, and that the Alliance could no longer rely on substituting quality for quantity, as the same period saw NATO lose much of the technological advantage required to do so. The report highlighted the standing forces of the Warsaw Pact nations had 5.7 million personnel compared to just 4.4 million from NATO countries, of which only half of these were actually in Europe. Moscow's ability to call upon 40,000 more tanks than NATO further demonstrated an ominous situation on the continent. In addition to examining the force structure, the report commented on Soviet and Warsaw Pact doctrine as further cause for concern. The tendency of the Warsaw Pact to equate defense with offensive operations and focus its exercises on achieving large-scale penetration meant their forces were larger than necessary for traditional defense, and the doctrinal focus on surprise and rapid operations led planners to believe the Soviets would likely strike first in conflict to decisively win that first battle. These conclusions largely accurately reflect developments in Soviet doctrine and strategic thinking during the period. Soviet planners continued to rely on the basic conceptions of deep battle, first articulated by Marshal Mikhail Tukhachevsky in the late 1930s, but with an increasing emphasis on achieving a higher offensive tempo and operating an even greater operational depth. The introduction of the concept of three-dimensional battle, which relied heavily on transporting units and equipment by air to capture sites in the rear echelon of NATO forces, reflected this idea, this broadening of the battlefield. Planners suspected such actions to disrupt rear lines of communication, preventing the concentration of forces necessary for NATO uh, and the U.S. Army to successfully execute active defense, which is already a very difficult sounding task. Concerns about the ability of NATO to defend Western Europe were on the broader public's mind as well in the early 1980s. Former NATO Army North Commander General Sir John Hackett worked with several other flag officers to write a novel entitled The Third World War. Released in 1978, it quickly became the most talked about and frequently referenced scenario for a global military conflict. Though the book, set in 1985, does see NATO win, it warned that if the crisis took place earlier, as in at the time that it was published, uh, the, it was scarcely conceivable the Soviet plan could have failed, as would have capitalized on the locust years of the 1970s. This matched the prevailing sentiment of security hawks of the period that without a massive investment in capabilities, NATO would be unable to defeat a concentrated Soviet push. In the late 70s, the Carter administration came to similar conclusions based on these perceptions of Soviet advances, uh, both conventionally in Europe, but as well on the ground in Africa and in South America, uh, and their invasion of Afghanistan. Paired with the highly visible failures of the US military to achieve results, Carter and Brown invested in new technology and began to emplace the policies that would expand the size and capability of US armed forces that Reagan would then further expand in the 1980s. However, before the US and NATO could reap this benefit, it still needed a credible strategy to defeating a potential invasion from the East. The strategy relied predominantly on nuclear weapons. This arena also was a concern to NATO, given the recent deployment of the SS-20 
intermediate range missile by the Soviets throughout the Warsaw Pact. The new missile marked a significant increase in the Soviet capability as it could range the entirety of Europe, but was smaller and more mobile than anything previously seen in the Soviet arsenal. German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt worried the system would be used to tip the nuclear arms balance in Europe decisively in Moscow's favor and allow the Kremlin to effectively blackmail NATO members on the continent. Fielding the SS-20 required a unified NATO response, which initially manifested as a growing support for air-launched cruise missiles and eventually resulted in the double-track decision in 1979 that paved the way for the fielding of the Pershing ballistic missile and the Griffin ground-launched cruise missile. NATO leaders remained firm in deploying these systems despite significant domestic opposition in the form of the Nuclear Zero Movement and other protest groups with the first fielding taking place in 1983. As a result, NATO retained its advantage in strategic weapons and ability to deter, or in a worst case, disrupt a Warsaw Pact invasion. By the mid-80s, NATO also began to feel better conventionally. In 1982, the U.S. replaced the doctrine of active defense with that of air-land battle. The new doctrine called for the use of technology to enable allied forces to disrupt Soviet formations at depth and prevent them from achieving local superiority and forces uh, that their larger conventional armies would suggest that they were capable of doing. Of note, though, is the doctrine did still view an integrated tactical, i.e. short-range, nuclear conventional response as mandatory in the event of invasion demonstrating the great importance planners still placed on nuclear weapons. The U.S. Armed Forces were also benefiting from a near decade of increased spending and emphasis on research and development. During the first Reagan administration, the Navy fielded 34 new warships, while the Army received over 4,000 updated main battle tanks, the M1 Abrams. A number of new airframes entered service across all branches, increasing the ability of the U.S. military to conduct aerial command and control, develop intelligence, defend from air attack, and strike ground targets. As soon as 1984, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Vesey Jr., argued that the lead the U.S. opened up in high technology would result in neutralizing the Soviets' greater military industrial base. And the next year, all the Joint Chiefs were unanimous in agreeing that by every measure of common sense, the U.S. was more ready for combat and able to execute air land battle. NATO remained more sanguine about the balance of power between the East and West. The Lunds is forward in the 1984 force comparison know the continued efforts were necessary to preserve security as disparities in a number of crucial areas continued to exist. The report stressed the need for continued development of conventional and nuclear capabilities in order to avoid a situation where NATO's deterrent could be called into question. On the issue of technology, the Alliance's view seemed to starkly differ with that of the U.S., as the report highlighted NATO's clear leadership in most areas of technology as being eroded. This likely reflected the skepticism many of the Alliance had as to the feasibility of air land battle to use high technology to extend the battlefield to new depths in this nonlinear battlefield framework. However, by the mid-1980s, the West was, in fact, sniffing ahead in fields like computers, fiber optics, and satellites, and there was little ability for the Warsaw Pact nations to close this gap. While NATO members dramatically increased, the alliance would see an average of over 40% more spent annually during the period from 77 to 87, the Soviet Union increased to recognize the economic cost of trying to maintain an offensively-minded doctrine given these new technological developments. The USSR's military expenditures grew rapidly from the mid-70s to the early 80s, but that was in no small part due to the invasion of Afghanistan, which quickly became a massive drain on the Soviet budget. Similarly, their continued support to a variety of communist movements throughout the world uh, further reduced the funds available for developing their own force uh, in Europe. The prospect of further expanding spending then to match this growing technological capability of the U.S. and NATO was an unfavorable prospect, uh, which was also unlikely to succeed given export control measures and the Soviets' own limited technology base. Beginning in the early 80s, Soviet thought re-examined the relationship between the strategic offensive and defenses, adjusting their nuclear posture to focus more on retaliatory strikes. The latter came, up, came due to the recognition that matching the technology of the Pershing missile and of the Griffin missile, and then the notional Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, would be too expensive for Moscow to match. In response, they developed the dead hand, which unlike SDI was offensive in nature. It would allow for a large-scale nuclear strike even if Soviet leaders were annihilated in a previous attack, effectively using a drone missile to transmit radio orders to the rest of the arsenal to fire at pre-selected targets, with their first test succeeding uh, in 1984. Political requirements drove this as well. The 27th Party Congress in 86 introduced the idea of reasonable sufficiency and a clear acknowledgement of the great cost in maintaining a force capable of overrolling NATO given the technological edge. Soviet doctrine writers increasingly drew upon the defensive operations of the Second World War and the counteroffensive that resulted in the Battle of Kursk for inspiration. 
In effect, the Soviets expected to defeat NATO now by drawing them deeper into Eastern Europe and even into Soviet territory, allowing for the attrition of NATO's more bespoke systems and enabling a counterattack. The more retaliatory nature of this planning helped align the doctrine for both conventional and nuclear employment in the 80s, uh, and also lessen the requirement to have Warsaw Pact and Soviet forces stationed forward uh, in East Germany and other parts of Eastern Europe. This then allowed Gorbachev to unilaterally reduce these forces by over a half million soldiers in 1988. Uh, and as he announced the cut, Gorbachev noted that one side of the reliance on military power ultimately weakens the other components of national security. Again, a nod to the economic drain this extravagant and unsustainable spending had exacted on the USSR. The recognition that the cost condition was too high and the doctrinal shifts also allowed for pursuit of savings in strategic weapons. This was most dramatically seen in 1986 at the Reykjavik summit, where Gorbachev and Reagan nearly agreed to abolish all nuclear weapons within a 10-year framework. Only Reagan's refusal to combine SDI to the laboratory prevented this agreement, uh, causing it to fall apart. Uh, the near agreement only came about because of how both leaders understood both their conventional and their strategic forces. Gorbachev believed that the movement towards a defensive approach, followed by a counteroffensive, would overwhelm the smaller, non-nuclear NATO. Reagan felt the technological edge and ability to draw upon reliable allies would prove decisive. Each leader could then confidently abandon strategic weapons and fulfill more important policy goals, uh, economic reform for Gorbachev and nuclear abolition for Reagan. Reaction to the shocking proposal uh, was universally negative from other capitals in NATO countries. Western European media worried it reflected America's strategic decoupled from Europe. French leadership openly discussed increasing their own stockpiles uh, in order to make up for the gap in deterrence. Helmut Kohl worried it would only enhance a conventional balance in Europe still not properly addressed. United Kingdom Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher called Reagan directly to stress the importance of nuclear deterrence in the face of the imbalance of conventional forces, only for Reagan to recommend that she read Red Storm Rising by Tom Clancy to understand why the president disagreed. Uh, though Reagan and Gorbachev did not come to agreement then, in 86, they did the next year with the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, abolishing an entire class of missiles uh, to include the recently fielded SS-20s and the Pershings, uh, which were the source of so much acrimony earlier in the decade. Though it is worth noting that while that took those way of concern in 1987, uh, the abrogation of that treaty has brought that back to the forefront now as you look at new hypersonics and uh, intercontinental cruise missiles. Um, so despite taking place in the Middle East, Operation Desert Storm in 91 starkly displayed this disparity between the Soviets and the US I was describing earlier. Um, throughout the conflict, American technology and airland battle worked exactly as advertised. The US and its coalition partners were able to build a mountain of steel in Saudi Arabia and tap fully into forces from across the Atlantic. Once combat began, Iraqi air defenses were unable to seriously affect the bombing campaign. During the first night, they only shot down one of 700 aircraft that flew missions deep into Iraq. The 100 hours of ground combat resembled a turkey shoot rather than a conflict between two large armies, uh, most famously at the Battle of 73 Easting, where a company-sized element of U.S. Abrams tanks destroyed over 28 Iraqi tanks, 16 personnel car carriers, and 30 trucks. Throughout the battle, superior weapon systems and training allowed the Americans to eliminate a force four times larger than themselves in just under a half hour. Uh, exactly as airland battle promised would happen in Europe, but this in case the deserts of Iraq and Kuwait. The success of the U.S. coalition during this operation was humiliating for the USSR uh, in a number of different ways. Iraq was a long-standing ally, and Moscow found itself unable to mediate or provide any real assistance to Baghdad. As the crisis unfolded, Gorbachev tried relentlessly and unsuccessfully to prevent a U.S.-led invasion. Beyond geopolitical impotence, the brief war highlighted how far behind Soviet equipment was when compared to the most recent and up-to-date NATO equivalent. At no point in the conflict did Iraqi military hardware, largely procured from the USSR and its satellites, measure up. That the coalition offensive resembled a Nintendo game more than the true conflict raised serious questions about the Soviet strategy, defense, and counter-offensive. However, the USSR was ill-positioned to respond with the necessary changes, as less than 10 months after that war ended, they would cease to exist. And the following decade would be one of immense economic difficulty for Russia and a challenging environment to conduct serious reform of their doctrine and their force structure. Running in 1995, Russian First Deputy Defense Minister Andrei Kokushin, Kokushkin highlighted the need for informational superiority and how command of the air and domination of firepower would depend on achieving that superiority. The connections of these ideas to the Gulf War is clear. During the conflict, the U.S. coalition enjoyed air domination and used it to decapitate the Iraqi command structure from above. 
This air power integrated with maneuver and ground-based fires that handily defeated Iraqi ground forces uh, and throughout, coalition forces had access to quality intelligence about the location and composition of Iraqi forces and took steps such as purchasing the rights to commercial satellite imagery to deny Iraq the same. Kokushin recognized the financial limitations at the time, recommending five areas of reform to address the deficiencies of the Russian military. He first advocated moving away from pure conscription to a mixed recruitment involving contract soldiers. This would enhance the old professionalism of the force. He also advocated for improving Russian PME and training. Adjustments to Russian's command structure, which at the time had 16 districts, would improve the tangled and unwieldy system inherited from the Soviet Union. And his final two recommendations dealt with reforming supply and establishing stronger links between the military and industry. Each of these recommendations captured a portion of the U.S. reforms in the 1970s and 80s, which resulted in the force that won in Kuwait. The U.S. Army transitioned to an all-volunteer force, established training and doctrine command and combat training centers. And while the U.S. more broadly reformed combatant commands with the Goldwater Nichols Act, invested in industry and technology and war game logistics extensively. Russia, however, struggled to implement these reforms, much less provide new systems due to the economic collapse until the period from 1998 through 2008, which saw significant strengthening of the ruble against the dollar. Regardless, throughout the immediate post-Cold War, the U.S. remained Russia's pacing threat. The U.S. no longer saw Russia in this light. In 1993, the Bush administration released its first national security strategy to come after the collapse of the Soviets. It trumpeted the U.S. and NATO's collective victory in the Cold War as something which fundamentally challenged the strategic environment, which like fundamentally changed the strategic environment. Instead, militarily, the greatest threat to global security were now regional instabilities. U.S. forces could expect to become involved in humanitarian assistance in the midst of civil war and anarchy and undertake peacekeeping and peace enforcement missions that would be more complex than ever. These missions required a new force design, and so just after its moment of triumph, the Airland Battle Army became obsolete. As U.S. military organized to support George H.W. Bush's New World Order, and operate under reduced expenditures coming from Bill Clinton's efforts to cash in the peace dividend, the force again looked to do more with less. The 1993 version of FM 100-5 recognized the Cold War has ended and the need for air land battle to evolve. Notably, the Mayo significantly increases attention to joint and full dimension operations. The picture it provides of the Army was one that was part of a joint, combined, united, or interagency force, and one that was rapidly deployable and expansible. Along with doctrinal shifts, the Army also reduced in size and shrunk its footprint in Europe substantially. Forces declined by over 40% over the course of the 90s and focused mostly on light mobile capabilities, issuing armor, air defense, and heavy fires. Doctrinally, the Joint Force held responsibility for filling in these resulting gaps. The U.S. military experience during the 90s and 2000s reinforced these decisions. Peacekeeping operations in Bosnia and Somalia relied on the Joint Force and light, or on the Joint Force and light forces. And while armor had a brief moment in the sun in the early days of the 2003 Iraq War, the branch remained largely neglected. A turnaround in the Russian economy and rising energy prices in the 2000s provided the Russian military the opportunity to initiate these long desired reforms to its doctrine and force structure. Beginning in earnest in 2008, the new look reforms would seek to modernize nearly every aspect of the Russian military establishment. These reforms also adapted many of the ideas advocated by Kokoshkin in the 90s, uh, including merging the sprawling logistics structure into material technical support, uh, which was an effort to merge many rear services into a singular logistics organization. The reforms also modified military education, adjusted the structure of the NCO corps substantially, as those 16 military districts of the Soviet Union became the six of present-day Russia. New look reforms also set an ambitious schedule to update 80% of artillery systems and armor vehicles and every tactical missile system by 2020. While many of the updates to vehicles manifested as incremental improvements to sensors, particular attention went into developing new advanced rockets, cruise missiles, air defense, and radars. This emphasis and the requirement that all missiles be updated by 2020 came from the Russian understanding from Desert Storm that any war with NATO would be fought in a high-technology air land campaign even though the U.S. had moved away from that framework during the 90s and the 2000s. Utilizing forward bulwarks like Kaliningrad and Crimea as ways to deny NATO access to Russian airspace uh, and formations was therefore a critical calculation. The new reforms also led to adoptions of network-centric framework for operations. This approach relied on integrating reconnaissance and targeting and linking as rapidly to sensors as possible. The concept also built on the recognition about the need to achieve information dominance. Similarly, the Russians realized that Desert Storm's live depiction of battlefield events highlighted the importance the 
media's global reach had, and so their doctrine grew to reflect the way that armed forces could leverage that through the techniques and means of warfare. The relative ease with which Russia annexed Crimea and achieved a low-class stalemate in eastern Ukraine in 2014 led to the belief that their reforms were on the right track. This illegal annexation of Crimea caused a marked shift in how the U.S. and NATO viewed the threat emanating from Moscow. Though there had been prior indicators of aggression, such as the cyber attacks against Estonia in 2007, the invasion of Georgia in 2008, and repeated assassinations of Putin's rivals and critics across Europe, the attack was more brazen and norm-defying than anything that preceded it. The immediate impact for the U.S. Army was in the launching of Operation Atlantic Resolve in April of 2014. It established a 7,000-soldier rotational force on the European continent, consisting of a division headquarters, armor brigade, aviation brigade, and sustainment task force. The invasion also marked a shift in Army doctrine, training, and force structure, and NATO responded by increasing the size and frequency of its, of its exercises. The 2015 U.S. National Security Strategy noted Russians' actions endangered international norms, largely taken for granted since the end of the Cold War and highlighted the need to build capacity to prevent conflict. Similarly, the 2017 version identified Russia and China as challengers to American power, influence, and interest, who were attempting to erode American security and prosperity. The return of Russia as a pacing threat was quickly reflected in the updated FM3-0. Its introduction highlighted how U.S. success in Desert Storm led to several adversaries adapting, modernizing, and developing capabilities to counter U.S. advantages across all domains. Highlighting Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran in particular, the doctrine further argued that while there was a need to prepare for a broad contingency of operations, large-scale ground combat against a peer threat represented the most significant and most serious requirement. The most recent FM3-0, published in October of this year, builds on this as it codifies the multi-domain approach to operations for the Army. To do so, it draws heavily on past doctrine to include air land battle, full-spectrum operations, and unified land operations. Air land battle in particular seems resurgent in the new doctrine, as the large-scale battles envisioned would take place just east of where the planners in the 1980s expected. The Suwalki Gap has replaced the Fulda Gap as one of the more likely flashpoints for a NATO-Russia fight. U.S. perceptions of areas of Russian military advantage guided plans to design the Army of the near future. The plan for Army 2030 lays out six things the force must do as the U.S. refocuses on the pacing challenge of China and the acute threat posed by Russia. Identify needs to acquire sensors to see more, farther, and more persistently, to concentrate low signature combat forces, to deliver precise, longer range fires, protect from air, missile, and drone attacks, be secure from cyber and electronic attacks, and ensure sustainment all relate directly to the way Russia portrayed its growth over the previous decade. In addition to changes to the future force design, Russia's invasion of Crimea sparked a change in how the army educates its leaders and trains its force. It's updated its Decisive Action Training Environment, also known as DATE, to include a new scenario based on the Swalky Gap scenario and one on conflict in northern Ukraine. This is in addition to a previously created scenario tied to the Caucasus region. The Swalky scenario is presently used for culminating training events at the Command and General Staff College and the Division Warfighting Exercises. Similarly, as U.S. moved away from the War on Terror, the enemy at Combat Training Center shifted from various terrorist groups to the conventional army of Donovia. Uh, whose units bear an unsurprising resemblance to equivalent Russian ones. And, and if you're interested in all this information, you can find it online. Um, and there's an irony uh, in the name of this website, given where I'm speaking. It is odin.tradoc.army.mil. Uh, and so, yes, the repository of all Army knowledge on date is housed a site named for Odin. Uh, however, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 suggests that much of the U.S. and NATO response to 2014 was to face a force that does not exist. Though advertised by Putin as a special military operation, uh, with the expectation of a rapid push to seize Kyiv and eastern Ukraine, the remade Russian army immediately bogged down. A large factor in this was the misapplication of observations from Operation Desert Storm and, to a lesser extent, the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. In both cases, the militaries of the U.S. and partner nations achieved sweeping territorial gains in under a week through aggressive maneuver and overwhelming firepower. Russia sought to emulate this with mass using as many as 140,000 ground troops in their initial invasion in February, and trying to replicate coalition airstrikes with widespread missile strikes. The utilization of these forces differed significantly, though, as Russia failed to execute its theory of network centric warfare or conduct combined arms operations. There was no indication of careful coordination between air, ground, and naval forces, uh, as each seemed to operate in a vacuum. Uh, 
notably the absence of a follow-on plan to exploit the airborne operations seeding Kiev's Antonov airport, so just elements operating independently of each other. So too, the decision by armor commanders to push forward without significant support from infantry or fires, leaving them vulnerable to anti-tank forces along main approaches to the Ukrainian capital. As of November 2022, a result of this failure to combine arms effectively is that Russia is visually confirmed to have lost nearly 1,500 tanks and over 700 armored fighting vehicles. Russia's integrated A2 AD approach also failed. Though the famed ghost of Kyiv is an urban legend, Russian Air Force has suffered a surprising number of losses in the war's first days, and throughout the conflict failed to establish local air superiority, much less air dominance. Ukrainian pilots flying map of the earth and following roads to full radar suggests that Russian planners failed to envision any aerial approach other than the types employed by NATO in un or barely contested skies over Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Russia's most critical failure, though, was in sustainment. This represents another failure to understand or replicate U.S. success. Moscow seemingly attempted to emulate the U.S. mountain of iron approach uh, that the U.S. employed in advance of Operation Desert Storm with its months-long buildup prior to the invasion of Ukraine. However, its force design put too limited emphasis on sustainment elements and formations, which made it impossible for their armies to emulate what is, in fact, the superpower of U.S. forces. At almost every echelon, Russia opted for a supporting formation that was 25% of the size of an equivalent U.S. one. The result was that vehicles used in the invasion were poorly maintained, breaking down frequently, and units quickly ran out of fuel, ammunition, and food, leading situations like the famed 40-mile-long convoy stuck on the road to Kyiv. Russia's new look was an attempt to meld the technology and principles that brought the U.S. and its partners conventional success in Iraq, with the limited research and development capability and the economic limits experienced by Russia. However, the misapplication of these lessons and the ineffectiveness of reform to leadership development and operational approaches created an environment for Ukrainian forces supported by weapons from NATO countries to exploit. The failures reflect a misunderstanding of the force Moscow identified as its pacing threat on both a tactical and operational level. More critically, it reflects a misunderstanding of its pacing threat on a strategic level as Russia grossly misunderestimated the response from NATO and other European nations. Although Putin claims NATO expansion was a reason for his legal war and his desire to keep the alliance from Russian borders, it is now that NATO will be closer as Sweden and Finland shed decades of studied reluctance and formally join the alliance. Additionally, the size of the U.S. forces in the continent increased dramatically and is likely to remain at heightened levels for a significant period. NATO countries nearly across the border are also increasing defense spending, making the alliance more capable and ready, furthering Russia's strategic failure in Ukraine. Envisioning what the next war will look like and the type of force needed to wage it is an essential responsibility of military planners. An existing real-world pacing threat can be useful in this exercise. The comprehensive understanding NATO planners had of the Warsaw Pact allowed for the development of military technology, the creation of a doctrine and a force structure in which member nations could have used to very well win conventionally by the late 1980s. In 1991, the U.S. fought an opponent that met their preferred design with spectacular results. When the Soviet Union collapsed, removing the only true pure threat to the U.S. at the time, planners struggled to envision what forces were necessary for the next war. Creating a capability gap to the present-day force is working to close. For its part, Russia never lost its pacing threat. However, its failure to truly understand the underpinnings of NATO's success and why the alliance uh, appeals led it to make faulty force design choices, which are in part responsible for its current failure in Ukraine. Manic focus on a single branch or threat inhibited their capability and their flexibility. For the NATO nations, this does not mean abandoning a focus on Russian threat, uh, as it remains a foundational reason for the alliance, and represents one of the most dangerous contingencies. However, it's important to temper the focus on that pacing threat with creative thought about how evolving technological, cultural, and political influences may lead to different scenarios and force requirements. Um, thank you, and I'll wait any of your questions. Uh, a point to note for our uh, online attendees, um, if you have any questions, please uh, state initially whether it is a general question to the seminar or if it's a special question to the current speaker. Uh, so far it's been different, uh, difficult to, to differentiate. So um, do we have any questions for uh, Ben here? Yes. Hi, Ben. Uh, James Farrar from the Land Warfare Centre in the UK. Um, ben, thanks. Ex excellent presentation. Uh, love the sort of history and the development. How much do you think US um, military thinking has been shaped and changed by evolving US societal thinking through the 70s, 80s, 90s? Ben? 
So I believe that's a, a very large impact to how we kind of view our force structure. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot uh, when we're teaching the academy is how the design of the army is kind of reflective on, you know, what our population believes the army should look like. And so we see with the 1970s, you have the movement to the all-volunteer force. That's kind of the response to U.S. failures in Vietnam and the widespread unpopularity of that. Uh, you know, as we've gone along, you know, this emphasis on high technology, uh, focus on having, you know, the you know, strongest tank, the most planes, missiles, is all aimed at kind of reducing U.S. casualties and conflict, again, kind of keeping in line those lessons from Vietnam, which brought down the popularity of that war, uh, and then again, sort of the casualty adverse nature uh, of the American population as well. And so we're looking at ways that we can maximize what is our perceived technological edge to preserve uh, the man manpower force, and that's kind of a thread running through all of U.S. doctrine really over the last 40 years. Any questions from the online net, uh, audience? No? Yes, Jim. Ben, thank you. Um, picking up an idea from my own presentation, which I know is cheeky, if you were wanting to make a presentation, uh, sorry, a prediction, where would you see the Russian armed forces adapting and evolving maybe in 10 years? How do they see what's happened to them? So I, th I see them coming out uh, of this conflict in a spot very similar to what I described with the U.S. in the 70s, with very much a, a broken army that is, I think, divided from the broader population. And that's, I think, to your point about politics, where the Russian political system has very different demands in its force structure. And so I think it's going to be relearning some of the things they thought they knew about the importance of integrating combined arms. Um, the thing that surprised me as I watched this unfold in February and March was the failure to really employ their long-range fires effectively. You know, we, I talked about you know the you know, date scenario and warfighting exercises. All those open up looking at the orders of battle with massive numbers of Russian self propelled artillery, Russian rockets. And so when I was watching this, I was like, this is going to be the largest barrage of artillery that we've seen in Europe since World War II, and that didn't ever happen. And so I think the key lesson for the Russians coming out here is going to be, A, that combined arm piece, uh, but then also that sustainment piece. And that's where I noted in the paper that you know, the real power or real superpower of the U.S. is our logistics. Uh, is that we're able to get sufficient quantities of food, ammunition, gas anywhere in the world thanks to partners and allies um, and in a very large industrial base. And the Russians know that's important but failed to put in steps. And I have a colleague who's going to go into that in great detail here tomorrow. Um, so I think those are the two big things that I think they're going to take from this and try to apply going forward. Uh, thank you. Ura Shashta from the Military Academy. Do you think there is a uh, power struggle within the different services in the United States for whom should be, sh who should have the hand on the wheel? Uh, power struggle might be a little bit harsh. Um, you know, it's certainly, I mean, this has been an ongoing thing, uh, particularly in the post-World War II era, um, where, you know, you had the reforms to uh, the U.S. services, the creation of the Department of Defense, you know, and that begins with the revolt of the admirals in the late 1940s because they're worried about uh, the loss to naval funding. And so uh, there's been, through that period, this tug of war between you know, the Navy and their mission to preserve the global commons, uh, the Army believing that you, know, you win wars on the ground, uh, and the Air Force continually thinking that they can win airs just by bombing, um, much to Dr. Storr's point, where it's more of a raid than perhaps something that is decisive. Uh, and so this fight over funding, it, it's going to persist, and it's gotten a little bit nastier in recent years as we come out of the global war on terror. Uh, and I think each service is taking the lessons they want to learn. Right? So the Navy's pointing to China right now and saying, hey, look, the threat across the peninsula to Taiwan is the most important national security issue. The Army is saying, no, but look, Russia is in Ukraine. That's the most national security issue. And the Air Force is like, we can bomb all of it no matter what, so just give us planes. Um, <laughs> but I think that's going to persist. Uh, again, I don't think necessarily it's like outright warfare between the services, but when you're talking about billions of dollars, it does get rather nasty rather quickly. And I follow up, if I may. Uh, is it, do you think it's right to say that because, um, because of the atomic bomb, the, the, uh, the Air Force, the United States Air Force, had the wheel, uh, had the hand on the wheel, and the Army uh, thought that they had to do something in order to get more funding. 
that, that's very true, particularly in the 1950s. Uh, and you see the uh, creation of Strategic Command, uh, which is going to be kind of the source of all the uh, nuclear weapons. And so the Air Force dominates that one throughout its history. Uh, and so you see the you know, B-52 is going to be during the Korean War as the first kind of major new weapon system. Uh, pushed towards those first missiles by the late 50s, early 60s. And throughout this, the Army's kind of like, okay, what do we do now? Uh, and trying to show that we are relevant in a nuclear age. So you have the Pentomic Force is discussed in the 50s, uh, but there's also this insistence that the Army needs their own nukes, right? So the, uh, the Lancer cruise missile was a U.S. Army system. Uh, the Davy Crockett uh, is a famous one as well. This is a mortar-based nuclear weapon uh, where the effective range of the weapon is bigger than your ability to get away from the weapon. So uh, not, not something I personally want to employ. Uh, but it was certainly a case of the Army trying to say, here's how we're relevant in this nuclear environment. Here is why we can't be defunded and why I can't all go to the Air Force. Whereas the Air Force is focusing on these new bombers, the Navy is focusing on the you know, submarine aspect of that with the cruise missiles. And then the Air Force has the ICBMs uh, throughout the U.S. Thank you. One last question here. Um, Frederick Fleidmark in the Norwegian Army Staff. Um, thank you, very informative uh, brief, very interesting. Um, my key takeaway is that the key pacer for American policy in the last, since the Second World War has been Russia. But moving forward now, if you could give maybe a percentage, how important is Russia for pacing American policy and how important is China? And as a consequence of that, what does that mean for NATO and especially us in Europe? So I think part of that goes back to the, the previous question, looking at the, the route between the services, and it sort of depends on, on who you ask with that. Um, you know, I think certainly for the next decade, uh, you know, for our purposes, but I think even for U.S. purposes, Russia is going to be seen as the more acute and the more immediate threat, uh, given, again, their direct and hostile action. Uh, you start seeing some of the things that, uh, you know, leading policymakers talk about now with, you know, 2027, 2028 being a mark on the wall for when, you know, China's supposed to have the capability to perhaps take Taiwan, although, again, I'm, I'm not sure how much to read into what they're saying their force looks like given Russia's failures here. Uh, and so I think you're going to see this effort to try and balance between the two theaters. Uh, I know previously in the 20 teens, we had the pivot to Asia, uh, the pivot to the Pacific, and that never actually really took place. It was a long running joke. Um, but I think certainly there will be renewed focus on that. Where, though I think even though it, and China obviously doesn't border Europe, it doesn't mean that there's no NATO interest in what happens there, particularly given the impact on global supply chains, uh, global trade and everything else with that. And so I think there is still a role for NATO to play when discussing these issues with China, because what happens with that economy there does impact, I mean, globally, right? And we've seen some of that come out with the result of the pandemic, where we had these massive disruptions to the global supply chain, and that led to inflation across the planet right now, right? Everyone's paying a little more than we like for, for all these goods and services. So a, a conflict with China on any large scale would have a similar disruption, and so NATO would need to be a part of that um, as we're looking at what the long-term impact is for Europe, for the U.S., uh, and then what the framework for the world order looks like after that. I think NATO is a, a key and essential part of, again, what we have as the international order right now that I think China is trying to undermine pretty actively. Well, uh, thank you, Ben. Very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, you are definitely very knowledge knowledgeable about these I issues. So, big hand for Ben. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And now the slide changes. <laughs> and now we have a 15-minute break before we uh, get up. Uh, I would also like to mention we have Howgate Publishing House here. They are specializing in uh, books for the practitioners, and they have made several books for Sandhurst, for example. And Kirsten uh, Hargate, uh, she's here representing uh, the publishing house, and he has a, she has a stand outside with some of her books. So enjoy your break. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our next speaker. It is uh, Major Michael D. Greenberg, also from the United States uh, Military Academy. He um, uh, earned a BSc in Communications from Northwestern University in 2008 and an MA in Terrorism, Security and Society from King's College London in 2010. 
He enlisted in uh, the army in 2011 and commissioned in 2000, 2012 as a military intelligence officer. He has served in various assignments with the 10th Mountain Division, 1st Corps, and 1 to 2 uh, Strike Brigade uh, combat team. His military experiences include time in command, senior intelligence staff, and a combat deployment to Afghanistan. Major Greenberg started his studies for the Army Advanced Civil Schooling Track at New York University in 2019 and graduated in 2021 with an MA in History. He currently instructs in the American History Division at the United States Military Academy at West Point with specializations in United States 20th century foreign relations and national security. The Army recently des designated him for a strategic intelligence accession upon completion of his teaching assignment. And he is going to present intelligence observations and lessons learned in Ukraine. So, please. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you, Colonel Schmidt, uh, also Major Bradford, and the Norwegian Military Academy, Norwegian government for hosting us. It's been an incredible experience thus far and deeply appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, generals, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I begin, I just want to make sure that I also state, like, like Major Griffin did, that any of the statements that I make here today are of my, my personal assessments and they don't necessarily represent uh, the opinions of, of the United States Military Academy or the U.S. government. So, uh, in the initial salvos of the conflict uh, in the Donbass as well as in Crimea in 2014, we saw that the Russian censor-to-shooter process was, it seemed to be, incredibly effective. We were seeing effective targeting across the board. We were seeing the massing of fires. But now, of course, after nine months of war, we've seen a very different picture. Ultimately, the failure of Russian operations to this point is certainly influenced by several intelligence factors. First, Russian staff processes and intelligence assumptions were flawed from the beginning, influenced by rushed processes poisoned with confirmation bias and bureaucratic fear. When coupled with strategic miscalculations of Ukrainian capability and resilience and the West's willingness to aid Ukraine with information and weapons, Russian forces have failed to effectively integrate intelligence on the battlefield and have been repeatedly, effectively targeted by Ukrainian forces. So where are we now? As we've seen in the past few months, the Ukrainian counterattack has been effective. Uh, the falls of Liman, Izium, Kherson, the Russians have, by most open source estimates, committed roughly 60 to 70 percent of their national combat power but the results on the battlefield, as far as their losses, have been devastating, uh, with wounded and killed in action up to 100,000 soldiers. The Russians, by all accounts, have poor command and control. They're not exercising disciplined initiative. They have not achieved air superiority or dominance, and for reasons unbeknownst to, to many planners, have failed to employ their incredible overmatch or assessed initial overmatch in electronic warfare capabilities. Um, most analysts believe that we will now transition to a war of attrition, and this is putting stress on, on Western industrial bases and capacity. So this is something that we're looking at very carefully now. As far as uh, what I'm going to look at today, I do want to, before I, I go forward, is to talk, you know, hey, yes, the United States intelligence community and also the intelligence communities of, of some of our allies in NATO uh, the initial misunderstanding, although we understood the intention of the Russians to fight and the intention of the Russians to invade, clearly uh, did not necessarily recognize some of the fundamental weaknesses that the Russian forces were showing in uh, their capabilities. Uh, and, and also, one of the big qualitative factors, the Ukrainian willingness to fight in the end has been one of the factors that has been incredibly, incredibly important on the battlefield. And that's something that we need to stress. I'm trying to see if this will click forward here. There we go. Okay, terrific. Okay, so before we um, 
let's look at where the two sides started from an intelligence perspective and also from the advantage of hindsight. Ultimately, I'm going to look at intelligence uh, through the lenses of whether or not it's precise, whether or not it's actionable. Uh, and then I'm going to look specifically at different Russian as well as Ukrainian systems, capabilities, preparations, assumptions, and integration with operations. So, looking first at Russian organic capabilities, uh, just for shared understanding and, and you know, to, to spell out some of the intellese here on this slide. Uh, open source intelligence, when I'm talking about open source intelligence, I'm talking about online reports, news media, social media, basically taking a lot of those reports together that would otherwise be uh, unclassified, synthesizing them and created uh, a more finished product. But many of these products have been very successfully actioned throughout the conflict. I'm talking about IMINT, imagery intelligence, uh, talking about the overhead architecture and images that are basically being analyzed from satellites and also from tactical as well as operational unmanned aerial systems. For geospatial intelligence, um, talking well, first signals intelligence and electronic warfare, basically communications intercept, um, looking at, at different signals, radio frequency and electronic emitters to understand what do those, uh, what do those necessarily tell us about the enemy. For geospatial intelligence, most of this is being collected from overhead architecture, satellite infrastructure, uh, basically looking at this imagery and exploiting it for signals and signatures and using primarily geospatial information. When we're talking about measures and signatures intelligence, we're talking about looking at uh, capturing and measuring characteristics and components of objects. Most of what Mazent has been used for on the battlefield is to really determine troop movements. Now, Russian capabilities, ultimately the, the Russian military has many of these capabilities as does the United States, as, do, as does NATO. But ultimately, uh, what we've seen specifically is that their small and rather outdated overhead fleet, their satellites, are, have not really contributed to their war effort. And one of the things that, of all the Western sanctions that in many cases have failed, uh, they are, the sanctions are impacting Russia's ability to maintain and keep these satellites up to date. So this is a major sustain. Uh, their space capabilities within imagery intelligence and signals intelligence, yes, they are outdated, uh, but they are primarily oriented against deterrent threats. So they are very much looking at NATO troop movements, at American troop movements. Um, one of the things that we've seen in theater, and I've, I've got some you know, just sample systems up here that the Russians have employed on the battlefield. They have a very large tactical unmanned aerial systems fleet which they've used to identify uh, Ukrainian troop movements, which they've, uh, as they've used previously for targeting. But one of the things to note for both Russian UAS as well as Ukrainian UAS is the fact that there's been incredibly high attrition of these systems due to how slow they move, how loud they are, the signatures that they give off. So something that the Russians have failed to do is to provide bench stock, to have a lot of these systems in reserve, and we see them leaning on some of their allies in order to bring more of these systems into the fight. One of the things that they've also failed to do is to take their electronic intelligence systems, which measure uh, especially missile launches, artillery strikes, and they have failed to basically target Ukrainian forces in the current conflict because Ukrainian forces learned from their failures in 2014. So they are effectively using shoot and scoot tactics, which is basically as soon as they fire their weapon systems, they are displacing almost immediately uh, because they know that they're being detected by Russian forces. So in order to avoid the, the salvos that are coming in the sensor to shooter process, the Ukrainians have done this very, very effectively. And this is something that many NATO partners are also observing very closely. Russian communication security is a mess. It is a mess. So one of the things that I'll, I'll talk about here uh, in the next couple slides is the fact that all of these different systems that the Russians have been putting together for years, and we've been concerned about their encryption and whether or not this was going to be something insurmountable for collection and, and for forces to exploit. Ultimately, we've seen that these forces are being forced onto open nets, and this is something that our Ukrainian partners have been able to target very, very effectively. Now, importantly to intelligence preparations and assumptions uh, in the last year or so. Within the Russian staff process, intelligence is the second step. Um, their process is a much faster cycle 
than what we are traditionally used to in NATO. Now, this would be hypothetically effective, and of course, we have rapid military decision-making process when we are in a high kinetic fight as well. But ultimately, in order for this to be effective, what we really need to see are objective officers who are intellectually honest. This is something that has not necessarily occurred in many of the Russian staff processes. Uh, they are supposed to use, according to their doctrine, a correlation of forces and means. It appears that a lot of this was actually presented in these almost unfinished formats uh, based on what we're seeing, uh, likely presented to the highest echelons uh, and being used in order to make decisions. So we have here a, a picture of some of the Siloviki, the Russian defense establishment. And one of the things that they truly did not necessarily analyze, and, and as I stated earlier, one of the qualitative things in intelligence that's always difficult to do is to assess the will to fight. And as you can see here, you know, based on this quote from Vladimir Putin, Ukraine has never had its own authentic statehood. There is an assumption within Russian military leadership that there is no will to fight, that ultimately this inability to gauge the will of a free people to fight. It's of note that it is 2022 in Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, most people under the age of 40 to 45, have ultimately lived in a free country with, yes, it has its problems, but have lived free for their entire lives. This is something that, you know, despite Russian propaganda, despite Russian passportization, despite Russian thoughts about Russian language, none of these things have necessarily dominated this idea of freedom. There was also the assumption within the Russian defense establishment that the West would not intervene. And this ultimate decision was based off of the 2008 invasion of Georgia, of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, based off of actions in Syria and red lines that were ultimately not followed through on. 2014, uh, the, the West not militarily intervening after the taking of Crimea and Donbass. And of course, even before that in Chechnya, the atrocities committed in Grozny and, and in the Caucasus. But Clearly, that assumption was wrong. Um, one of the things that we've seen as far as the results, this, un this internal upheaval that we're seeing within the highest echelons of the Russian government are, according to open source reports, over 150 intelligence officers as early as April were sacked out of uh, different Russian intelligence agencies. And this is uh, a repercussion of Vladimir Putin and uh, those close to him basically firing those who they believed did not present an accurate picture. But all of this, many of these are self-inflicted wounds, the sign of an aging autocrat who surrounds himself with yes-men and has been crushing dissent for years. And when looking for an honest assessment from his intelligence community, did not get that. So as far as our really, really looking carefully at this necessity for intelligence analysis to be objective, to be honest, uh, this is something that did not happen at the highest levels of the uh, Russian staff processes. Now, as far as Russian military intelligence and, and their integration with operations, we've seen this idea of rhetoric versus reality, where they're saying one thing through official mouthpieces. For example, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the, uh, <laughs> the owner of the Russian Wagner Group, a mercenary group, he stated as, as late as or, as soon ago as, as, as October, that they're advancing 100 to 200 meters a day. And this is you know, very effective in modern warfare, that this is very typical and normal. Now, we all know that to be completely false. Uh, modern warfare is supposed to consist of significant maneuver. Even Russian doctrine itself says that they should be advancing up to 30 kilometers a day, and they're not doing that. <laughs> the Russian intention to succeed with maneuver warfare has objectively failed at this moment. Um, and regard this is regardless of what their leadership claims. And we can see this instead of advances, we're seeing the decimation of their forces. We're seeing failed offensives. We've seen vertical envelopments like the attack on the hostile airport completely thwarted by Ukrainian, the Ukrainian ability to respond. Um, their intelligence hasn't adapted to operations thus far. And much of this can be attributable also not only to this question of failed assumptions, but also the fact that you know, looking at some of the structural failures of the Nulik reforms that Major Griffin outlined from 2008. 
ultimately intelligence within these reforms at all echelons within headquarters elements. These, or these elements are incredibly small and ineffective. Uh, they're so small that they're not effectively coordinating or dynamically retasking collection assets. And as stated previously, the failure of communication uh, security has been severe, especially the quote unquote cutting edge encrypted Azard and Avigduk radio systems that were supposed to be at the centerpiece of the Russian war machine. So they've been forced to use open communications and ultimately they've destroyed a lot of the infrastructure, the backbone that they were hoping to use in order to run these encrypted communications. Much of this, it's self-inflicted wounds. They're also failing to conduct operational security. They're not masking their movements the way that they trained to or the way that they're supposed to according to doctrine. And they're also not implementing countermeasures or counterintelligence, which has been incredibly harmful to their forces. Ultimately, they're not the masters of denial and deception that they were made out to be before this operation. Now, whether or not this can change in the near future and whether or not they're going to radically strip their war strategy is, is to be seen. But the result has been catastrophic losses. We've seen, as stated before, roughly 100,000 wounded and killed in action. We've seen potentially over 10 general officers who've been killed in action, as well as colonels. You're seeing really, really high-level Russian officers who are being forced to go to the front in a very centralized army to lead from the front, and they're being targeted effectively. Using the case study of the 3rd Guard Spetsnaz Brigade, also we see the decimation of specific units. And you can see all of this on open source where relatives are reporting to the Russian media and the Russian media is now starting to tell the truth about the losses in Ukraine. And we're also seeing reports from telegram accounts, Russian social media, about the loss of sometimes up to 75% of unit combat power. So it is very hard. It is hard to hide. The, it is easy to hard, hide the truth, but not when it comes to body bags. And this is something that the Russian government is starting to have very difficult time with. As far as Ukrainian intelligence capabilities, the organic capabilities are, are rather minimal and rudimentary. But ultimately, they, although they have no uh, satellite fleet of their own, they've benefited greatly from intelligence sharing from both the United States and, and all of our NATO partners. And also the unprecedented amount of weaponry that's been flowing into theater uh, thanks to the industrial base and, and the arsenals of the United States and, and, our, and our NATO partners. Um, as far as imagery intelligence, they've benefited greatly from the use of commercial overhead technology. So commercial satellites and the proliferation of a lot of these communication systems is something that in recent years is providing some of these smaller actors on the battlefield with advantages that they may not have had in the past. So they're doing that and they're also using tactical unmanned aerial systems very effectively, whether that be American RQ-11 Bravos, and these are company level assets, very small, also Israeli systems, as well as the Turkish Bakhtar system. We've seen many of these systems employed in theater, and although there has been incredibly high attrition, the Ukrainians are clearly doing something that the Russians are not, which is taking intelligence, and they're then exploiting it very quickly. They're actioning it quickly. So it, it, it is going to be very important for us to look over time at different Ukrainian staff processes and what they've done, whether that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, and I know there's an, another panel on this as well. So, um, but that's the big point here. It's not just capabilities, it's also integration with operations. Now looking at intelligence preparations and assumptions, one of the things that the Ukrainians surely did was to be clear-eyed. Uh, many, just to give a little bit of historical background, U Ukrainian intelligence assets uh, derived after the fall of the Soviet Union. Many of the intelligence elements were derived from the Soviet army. Um, basically came from existing assets in Kyiv, Odessa, Carpathian military districts, the Air Defense Army, 17th Air Army, portions of the Black Sea Fleet. And these were all integrated into the, into the Ukrainian ministry in the, uh, in the 90s. And in 1994, they formally consolidated all of these elements into the Defense Intelligence Unit of, of Ukraine. Um, they've been able to prepare for this conflict. Uh, they watched what happened to their Georgian neighbors in 2008. They watched what happened in Syria, and they have owned and done extensive after-action reviews of their failure to prevent the taking of Crimea, as well as other pieces of Luhansk and Donetsk in the Donbass in 2014. This is a combat-tested unit. 
They've been fighting this war for eight years. Of course, the invasion set off a new phase, but ultimately the Ukrainians have been fighting this war for a very long time, and they're very familiar with their Russian enemy and their capabilities. They've been, since this time, they've been receiving additional advanced training from NATO partners, and they've been training to a very high standard. And ultimately, they have not trusted a single piece of Russian rhetoric that was said before, during, or after the invasion. They are working with what they see on the ground, and they are actioning it effectively. Now, as far as sharing, an area where I need to be careful. Okay, so I have a picture here of Starlink. This is just one of the uh, commercial systems that is being used very effectively by the Ukrainians to get real-time information. Uh, they're using this for you know, really solid, uh, steady communications across the battlefield. Uh, this is, implies, of course, that the Russians haven't been able to effectively jam it over time. Uh, and they've used ComSat. Uh, this is of, of note, we have a lot of American defense contractors as well as European defense contractors uh, and Israeli ones who are now speaking very publicly about the support that they want to offer Ukraine in the future, basically piggybacking off of some of the successes that we've seen with Starlink and other systems. Now this is not to say that American and NATO assets are not on the scene. Now of course you can see through flight tracking and other open source systems that there are American military assets, especially on the borders, whether that be in Poland, whether that be in the, over the Black Sea. Um, these are lots of aerial assets specifically, whether they be drones with imagery intelligence packages or signals intelligence packages or payloads. Uh, we've also seen birds that are, are capable of, of measuring me uh, Mazint in order to determine troop movements. And why are, why are these particular assets in theater? Well, of course, we, the United States, and then also our NATO allies have an incredible interest in seeing how the Russians fight and using this tactical data in our understanding of their critical communications, their high value targets, mission command, key leaders, aerial disposition. These are things that we really wanna look at as intelligence professionals and as practitioners of war in order to determine how they fight, but also how we can more effectively provide uh, different systems to the lethal aid package. So after sanitization, after we sanitize or, or clean some of these products to protect sources and methods, of course, some of this data is being passed to our Ukrainian allies. Of note, one of the things that the Ukrainians have done really well, and this is you know, based off of a lot of the training they've received from NATO, special operations forces is they are executing military deception operations. I mean, it, it would be literally impossible to execute a lot of the displacements and the concealment of artillery systems without the training that they've received. So th this is of note, it's not just intelligence sharing, but it's also sharing tactics, techniques, and procedures that are being used to evade Russian targeting. So that, that, that shoot and scoot is an incredibly effective tactic and that's something that we need to continue to sustain. Now, looking at Ukrainian intelligence integration with operations, ultimately, I need to provide a word of caution here that although the Ukrainians have provided us with, with numbers on wounded in action and killed in action, of course, you know, putting, putting out uh, numbers here would, would be irresponsible. So that is a word of caution where we don't understand the, the actual numbers. But we do know that their air defense artillery has suffered immense casualties. We've seen the targeting in, in, in public, openly, openly available information of these assets in Ukraine. But we cannot, once again, overstate the use that they've made of commercial technology in order to target different uh, Russian key leaders, as well as to prevent uh, different, different uh, Russian operations. Ultimately, we're seeing that the Ukrainians are allowing intelligence to flow freely to feed their operations and to push the intelligence cycle forward. Um, as far as targeting, uh, they're also doing this within 30 minutes sometimes. This is incredibly fast on a dynamic battlefield. So, you know, whether this means they're pushing things to lower echelons as far as release authority and decision-making processes. And I, I need to also reiterate that collection is incredibly important. I mean, ultimately, one of the things we're seeing is, is also ingenuity. For example, with uh, Ukrainian let me go back here, um, with Ukrainian human intelligence, where they're using crowdsourced applications in order to identify 
to get positive identification of, of Russian forces, and they're created, they're fusing complete pictures based on what they have between imagery intelligence as well as human intelligence, and they're using the Ukrainian population as a weapon. They're actioning it, and they're making the Russians pay for their mistakes. And that's both with ComSec as well as with operational security. And once again, here's a, an, another shot here from the, from the Hostomel airport where they were very able to quickly interdict Russian forces and prevent the seizure of that airfield. Now the way forward, some ideas. Um, in 1949, President Truman said that NATO is a quote, uh, a shield against aggression and the fear of aggression. But ultimately here in this particular conflict, I, I don't wanna let this go, that the Ukrainians deserve immense credit and that Russia needs, will, have to own its failures and explain itself to its population at some point. But things that we can do to continue to support our Ukrainian friends and partners, both in intelligence and in operations, ultimately is to, is to sustain this flow of tactical intelligence to Ukrainian forces, to continue to also, from a national security standpoint for the United States and also for our NATO partners, to place special emphasis on early threats, warnings and indicators of the deployment of potential tactical nuclear weapons, and also to work with the Ukrainians to you know, keep an eye on this. Of course, the, the assessed use of these weapons at this moment is low, but that could change tomorrow. It really depends on the, on the battlefield situation and of course the situation for the Kremlin at home. Uh, third, we could provide more data on, on missile launches and targets. And I, I'm, I was very glad to see that some of our Israeli allies are, are here to discuss uh, what is happening in Israeli policy. This could be a relationship that you know, between th that the United States and Israel in the future could foster to provide additional understandings and capabilities for air defense and also for potential employment of Iron Dome-like capabilities. We're seeing the Russians use lots of different assets to include uh, Iranian kamikaze drones that are being used to specifically terrorize the population. So th this is of course of note because one of the centers of gravity in this fight is the Ukrainian population and their will to fight. Um, also, we could provide data to potentially interdict these particular weapon systems. So these are being transferred to the Russians. There's also word that the Iranians are, and this is all open source, that the Iranians are potentially looking to start constructing some of these in Russia itself to remove that transfer. So. Uh, th this is a process that we need to you know, look at potentially disrupting. And lastly, the United States government and our NATO partners, we could also help pay Starlink's bill. This is something that I'm sure is being discussed in private that I'm not privy to, but the, the use of this particular system has been so critical, uh, commercial satellite technology for our Ukrainian partners, that uh, to not sustain this would, would be something that we really need to, <laughs> we need to make sure we don't do that, that we don't let that system go offline. Um, so, very recently, Secretary General of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg, said that we will keep supporting Ukraine and said, quote, for as long as it takes. This is a critical fight, a fight between democracy and autocracy. This is one of the fight of our ages. Of, this is one of the, the, the big fights of our age. So, um, I think this is incredibly timely and, and I appreciate the, the ability to speak here. Uh, and for all of us to, to discuss this, this incredibly important topic. Thank you, for, thank you for your time. Well, uh, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, I would like to kick off the Q&A session uh, with one uh, question regarding Starlink. Um, Knowing a little bit about uh, commanding operations, uh, I would guess that the initial Russian uh, onslaught with uh, standoff wef weapons and the air power would have reduced uh, the original Ukrainian capability for C2IS uh, dras drastically. And um, looking from the sideline, uh, I think that introduction of Starlink was a game changer. It was going from dark to not bright light, but at least light. So um, I don't know if you are able to uh, elaborate a little bit more about that, but I would s uh, guess that both for the use of
tactical targeting like uh, fire support systems uh, uh, operating what are the ukrainian um, fire direction system and also for more operational targeting it would be and strategic uh, communication as well it was uh, critical are you able to say something more about starlink in that or if, if you're not, then it's okay. Then we'll just uh, have open the floor for other questions. Yeah, it's, as far as, so Starlink is, is mostly being used for, for not necessarily just imagery, but for, for keeping communications open. So th this is something that has been uh, in, incredibly critical, uh, especially looking at, at the aerial question. Because at first we saw, you know, that this onslaught of the Russian Air Force in his major Griffin detail, they tried to basically recreate airland battle but the russian version of it and this is something that was not necessarily done eff effectively um and so but the ability to keep communications open to communicate to ukrainian forces to displace from their airfields especially early on in that campaign and also to keep the communications open to get air defense systems uh, the integrated air defense system of ukraine has never cracked entirely there have been weaknesses there have been failures there have been uh, different assets that have clearly been destroyed but ultimately, uh, their ability to continue to, to communicate with each other is what has kept them alive. Um, so in that, in that regard, Starlink has, has been critical uh, because ultimately, uh, as we've seen, communication security is everything. And this is something that the, the Russians have not been able to match. Thank you. There's a gentleman over there. Oh, so, sorry. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so one of the most fascinating areas of this is is the Ukrainian use of the information dimension to yes. to um, to reinforce those false assumptions in the Russians. Um, have you got any examples of the activity that went on before the war, where they were shaping the Russians to believe that they were going to collapse, where the will to fight was poor? Mm. So I, I think a lot of this was basically incubating within the Ukrainian population that any rhetoric coming out of the Russian military leadership or any of the different echelons uh, within the Russian military force, that a lot of that rhetoric was false, basically conditioning their own population not to believe what they were hearing. Because even if, you know, this whole question of rhetoric versus reality, and a lot of that they were able to observe uh, from especially I, I would say the, the 2008 conflict between the Georgians and, and the Russians, where the information prepara preparation of the battlefield was extensive. We saw that not only in denial of service attacks, we saw that in Russian media, we saw that very much in, in rhetorical overtures from the Russian command as well as the Rus Russian, Russian political dimension being messaged directly at the Georgian people who they saw as the center of gravity once again to basically destroy their will to fight. Uh, this is something that, that failed in Ukraine. So I, I think that, you know, countering the information operations campaign was critical to keeping together the, the fabric, the glue that ties an army together. Then we have a question. Major, Lasha. thank you. I'm Lasha from Georgia, happened to be. So uh, thank you for good analysis. But my question is that um, we are, we've seen Russians been the very strong They've been very strong intelligence-wise to infiltrate political elites and infiltrate, how would say, information systems for, for the... They've been especially successful in near neighborhood where still Russian-speaking population exists, but I would say that they've been quite successful in the West to uh, promote some kind of bizarre, for us professionals, crazy conspiracy theories, but it's been extremely effective for a general population to be so uh, Russians invested heavily to first um, um, polarize societies and then try as much effectively use their limited power to to get some kind of hold off of decision makers inside a governments either it would be their uh, near neighborhood or in the West, where they perceive to be their enemy. So how would you comment on this? Sure. So, I mean, clearly one of the goals of Russian information operations is to influence not only decision makers and the people of Ukraine, but also to influence populations in the West to basically destroy uh, the American and also NATO partners' 
population's willingness to support and fund uh, this continued fight. So uh, they, we've seen lots of different reports come out, especially in the United States, where uh, Russian information operations are seeking to further polarize our population to, you know, they see consensus and democratic function as a weakness. Um, we also are, of course, there are concerns of Russian false flag operations. So this, this question of denial and deception, uh, something that we have not see them, seen them employ effectively thus far in Ukraine on this particular iteration. But if one, of the, one of the great conclusions here is that this is not over. Ultimately, as we enter a war of attrition and the fight becomes potentially more, in, more industrial, more deadly, we see you know, trenches and, and lines being established that Russian information operations will continue to target this Ukrainian will to fight. Um, but I mean, th th this question about what, what are the Russians doing to target different political entities, ultimately, if they can break, uh, if they can break American and, and European populations away from the war effort, that will be a win for them. So I mean, one of the big things that they've been messaging to, for example, our European partners is the energy crisis that has unfolded over the last eight to nine months. And this is something that has deeply impacted populations here in Europe. Um, in the United States as well, but not as severely looking at, at the price action of commodities. So this is something where they're, they're seeking to exploit uh, some of the things within our systems uh, and ex expect to see it in the future. This is one of the, the tools they have, basically actions other than war. Thank you for reminding us um, that we have to be objective and also intellectually honest. It's quite a task and the bar is really high there. Yes, um, I'm not going to challenge you on those uh, trademarks. I will try to drag you down to the tactical level, um, uh, the ISR process, um, the models that we use to describe it. Do you think it's still sound or have we seen um, activities, especially on the Ukrainian side, that will lead us to evolve or to tweak the model? Thank you. That's a great question, sir. So I mean, one of the things that I was, I was definitely going to gonna talk about as far as looking at, at our panel tomorrow is what is what is happening within Ukrainian staff processes that is making them tactically capable of fighting an enemy which has all of these assets at their disposal. Um, from what we've seen, their staff processes, they're delegating a lot of the decisions that would otherwise be made at higher echelons down to the lower level that ultimately uh, release authority is being pushed to lower level commanders. Uh, you know, some of these targeting incidents where they're happening within 30 minutes, um, I, this is of course speculative, but I, I, would, I, I would imagine that these types of decisions are not being pushed up to a general staff. They're not being pushed to Kyiv for actioning. Ultimately, they're taking the decisions and they're doing much more of a horizontal process where whoever's running the sensor is calling the shooter. And but now the question of assuming risk, who assumes risk in that process? How do you avoid collateral damage? I mean, these are incredible questions that, you know, as, when we do the post-mortem on this conflict are going to be critical to ask because there's also, you know, there's, you know, fighting a high kinetic fight and whether or not we're willing to, to target things in a rapid fashion and the, who assumes that risk and at what level. So, uh, it's going to take some time, sir, to, to truly understand uh, what they've done and also, you know, the impacts of, you know, w if, when these decisions have been made and they failed and the wrong thing has been targeted. Uh, that is something that we, we, as a, we as an alliance need to need to examine very carefully, because if it works 95 to, you know, 96 percent of the time, I mean, is, is that a risk that a commander is willing to take in order to in order to exploit intelligence that is timely and potentially precise. So that, that, is, that is something that I, I believe our, our staffs are gonna be grappling with here over the next year. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I was <coughs> going to comment on that uh, as well, and whether or not our last decade of counterinsurgency operations has have made us kind of adverse to taking those kinds of risks yes. as well, and we need to implement that into our thinking. But, but my main question was another one. I think you pointed to a couple of classical, uh, I would say, intelligence pitfalls, namely um, 
confirmation bias politicization of intelligence. So what do we need to do now in order to protect ourselves from those pitfalls in assessing uh, the Russian military in the future? Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I believe a lot of this goes back to the schoolhouse and making sure that our intelligence officers, as we're training them, uh, we continue to, to state, hey, you know, rank, rank is important. And of course, we have a hierarchy of in the military. But ultimately, one of the things that, that we've always tried to reinforce in our formations, and I, I've seen it in our allies as well, is that it doesn't you know, rank matters, but ultimately, like a specialist can still brief like a, a junior enlisted soldier, at least in our formations. We, we encourage them to brief senior leaders all the time and to be objective. Um, whether or not, if, but of course you always have these dynamics within formations. Uh, and, and this is also a matter of training commanders. Like, hey, sometimes you're gonna have junior soldiers from the intelligence uh, cell, or you're gonna have you know, junior officers tell you things that you, you don't necessarily wanna hear. Now, of course, commanders can accept that analysis. Uh, they don't necessarily have to, but this is something that uh, certainly within our staff processes, we need to, to start thinking about this question of risk aversion, this question of, you know, maybe we have some exercises where we process sensor to shooter over and over and over again. I know that's something that we were practicing when we went to combat training centers, and, and this is, you know, within the last few years. How do we speed up that cycle? Uh, but also using junior soldiers uh, as well as junior officers and making sure that we, regardless of rank, regardless of pressure, regardless of biases, uh, that ultimately we are telling the truth, whether it's popular or not. Thank you. We will have two more questions uh, at the rear there. Uh, sir, if you track or follow the Ukrainian defense news on Instagram or on Twitter, you will often see that uh, the Russians have lost a lot of, I'm not telling numbers, but they have a lot of, lot of main battle tanks. They often seem to operate alone without any RT support, any flanking security, no recce or no sensors up front, and they still carry on uh, against uh, the Ukrainian forces. Uh, and that's not normally very smart tactics. Uh, why do they still carry on with it? I think that this comes down to Russian command, and ultimately it's incredibly top, top heavy, where formations are being given orders and they are not retasking based on what's happening on the battlefield in an active sense. They're not fusing information. And ultimately, if you can't, if your communication security has been destroyed and you're not able to reach other formations, you're not able to tell them to stop. So, I mean, at this point about I mean, armored, armored penetration and, and also inf you know, moving forward without infantry, without fire support, long range fires, without intelligence assets, I mean, one of the things we would, Optimally, we would never run a column up a road. We would attempt to, to, to use a different avenue of approach. We would seek to put unmanned aerial systems and other methods of detection in front of those columns to, deter, to determine what's in front of it before we send that force headlong into harm's way. Um, I, I believe a lot of this has to do with once mil Russian military command is giving an order, those junior commanders are pushing forward um, and, and ultimately, they're not necessarily getting called back due to disrupted communications and also just a, a failure of combined arms. Thank you. There will be one more question from the online audience. So, Howard? Yes, there is an online question. Uh, since the Ukrainian seems to be good at using open sources and civilian applications for uh, gathering valuable information, what is uh, your opinion uh, uh, the right balance in in OPSEC, uh, operation security, and using all the sources available? It's a great question. Um, you know, it, as Western societies, it is our proclivity to be open and to be as honest as we possibly can with each other, uh, with our people, to, to tell people what is happening on a battlefield, because ultimately that's how we maintain the support and, and consensus that we need in order to operate. Um, as far as how we do this better in the future, I know that in the United States, for example, uh, it, it, it's a matter of thinking of, of what, can we, what can we do from an operational standpoint? Um, do we push the information out? We, I mean, a lot of it, of course, has to do with timing. Ultimately, it's all going to come out in the end. So it's a matter of figuring out what does the public need to know? Uh, 
uh, and, and how are we going to process this? I, I know that we use a lot of centralized resources uh, in order to collate open source information. So this is something that uh, we as an alliance definitely need, need to look at as to what are we going to actually disseminate and, and how does that mix with operational security? Because this is critical, especially seeing the Ukrainian applications on phones, the fact that they're providing positive identification back to central commands. Um, this is something they're ultimately, not just the United States and NATO will use in the future. This is something that, you know, regardless of who our adversary is in a future conflict, they're going to be able to weaponize operational security. So it's something that we need to keep in mind. Thank you, Ben. Great presentation and very good answers. So thank you very much. <laughs> now we will have lunch and um, the hotel will serve uh, as soon as you have been seated around the table. Please gather so that we can fill up the tables and uh, they will serve you at the table. Uh, you don't need to go, uh, go around and look for the buff buffet. Um, the chief of the um, chief of defense, Norwegian chief of defense, he will be here at uh, 1300. So please be back two minutes before. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. General Sir, I would like to introduce our chief of defense, uh, Eric Christofferson as uh, the speaker for opening this uh, seminar formally. S and uh, without a large uh, run through of your biography, I think everybody at, at least from uh, Norway knows you here. You have been in the special forces, you have been chief of staff of the army and, and in the National Guard as well. So without further ado, sir. Thank you, thank you, Trygve, and, uh, and thank you for uh, hosting this. And, and it, it's um, important times we are living in. So I, I will give a, a sort of a quite free, open thoughts about uh, what are we facing right now. Uh, and uh, the importance of research and development is, of course, um, of utmost importance when you have to make very significant decisions in these times. So. Um, I have said it a number of times, I feel that the last two and a half, three years have been what I would call historical years. So we have lived through a pandemic, we have, uh, we have uh, left Afghanistan after 20, almost 20 years. Uh, we stood together for 20 years, that's important. But we also left uh, August last year. Uh, and I will never forget the picture I showed uh, General Berger, Commandant of the US Marine Corps. Uh, in August uh, last year when we had the uh, US Marines standing side by side with Norwegian soldiers, side by side with Taliban soldiers, try trying to control the, the, the entrance to, to Kabul airport. It was um, just a few days before the explosion that uh, killed uh, 13 mar Marines. Um, and then uh, we saw the Russian buildup uh, outside Ukraine last uh, fall. Uh, we implemented um, uh, readiness measures in the Norwegian Defence Forces from 8th of December and uh, this time last year I, I, was, I didn't feel very certain what was going to happen. I was quite sure that uh, there would be an invasion of Ukraine. Everything was stacked up for that uh, and we took Christmas um, vacation in Norway uh, feeling a little bit uh, uncertain about uh, what, what's going to happen. Um, and um, my assessment was that uh, as most NATO chief of defenses was that the invasion could happen late January, uh, but it happened uh, on the 24th of February. And then uh, after the invasion, Sweden and Finland applied for NATO membership. So it's four big events, uh, both the pandemic leaving Afghanistan, uh, war in Europe again, uh, and then um, Sweden and Finland applying for NATO membership, which is sig significant. And, and this all happens on a background which is even more serious with um, the effects of climate change that affects us all. Uh, I grew up in the north of Norway and you can actually see it. Uh, the glaciers I used to hunt on when I was uh, younger are now smaller, they are harder, it's hard to walk there. Uh, I actually felt uh, quite uncomfortable 
working on some of them uh, on, uh, of them uh, this uh, this fall, which I normally easy walk across when I go hunting up in the mountains. And, uh, and uh, at the same time, we also seen that uh, nuclear weapons is used and works as a deterrence. There was no coincidence that um, that Russia didn't uh, didn't uh, do their nuclear tests in uh, November, October, November last year. They did it in on the 19th of February. On, 19, on the 19th of February, Saturday, I was sitting down with um, Todd Walter, Sakur, and we discussed what, what are we going to do if the invasion starts next week. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we didn't know. Uh, and we decided that we're going to keep calm and carry on. We're going to continue uh, with the exercise cold response as planned. And we're going to show that NATO can do more things at the same time. So um, on this background, we have to make decisions. And, um, and uh, going back to, to our Norwegian Defence Forces, what have we been doing the last year? Basic basically, we have been doing exactly the same as NATO has been doing. So we have, we have kept our eyes on Russia. We have kept our surveillance up in the high north. We have increased it. Uh, and we have um, actually quite good control of what's going on outside our borders, both on the land in the maritime domain, in the air, and also later on now in, the, in, in space and, and, and the cyber domain. At the same time, we have uh, increased our awareness of uh, critical infrastructure uh, to include our, our um, uh, gas lines to Europe, but also other critical infrastructures. That's the second thing of importance for me this year, and I think that's going to happen for the next year as well. The third thing is support to Ukraine. We need to keep up uh, our support to Ukraine, I will come back to that, uh, for the foreseeable future. And the last thing uh, we have, I've been spend, spending a lot of time with is that is meeting with the Nord Nordic Chief of Defences. So me and Mikael from uh, Sweden, Timo from Finland and, uh, and Fleming from Denmark. I, I've seen them more often than my oldest, go uh, oldest uh, daughter because uh, she's 27 years old and I don't see her that much, but, uh, but I spent more time with them than her. Since, um, since May. So, uh, going back to, to the war in Ukraine. First of all, we have to, to realize that the risk we took as allies last year with the sharing of intelligence. So, we shared intelligence to make sure that Russia didn't have an excuse to attack Ukraine. And that sharing of intelligence um, implies two very significant risks. First of all, it's the risk about the narrative. Because even in Norway we had discussion, who owns the narrative? Is it the West who says that an invasion is, is about to happen? Or is it Russia who says that uh, this invasion is not going to happen because we, we are just doing an exercise? But the, the willingness to share intelligence was to, to support diplomacy to make sure that we didn't have a war in Europe. So meaning that if we had succeeded with sharing intelligence and diplomacy, the war wouldn't have happened. Meaning that the people who said Russia owned the nar narrative and, and, and Russia was right, they are not planning an in invasion. They would have said that, okay, you, um, your sharing intelligence shows that, that you are wrong. But that risk uh, I think everybody was ac accepting that risk to avoid a war, which uh, I think that's worth a study itself. And the second is, of course, the professional risk. When you're sharing intelligence, you share what you know, and then um, anyone who gets hold of that in information knows, could think, how do they know what they know? And they can find out methods and, and spies or whatever is being used to, to, um, to find out uh, and, and produce the intelligence. So, uh, so with two significant risks to avoid war in, um, in Europe. The other things we, I would um, say is that NATO stood together. So uh, we stood together in Afghanistan and we stand together in the, in, um, in the support to Ukraine. So that's also significant because people have been questioning is, ready, is NATO ready? Is NATO relevant? Uh, is NATO actually going to step up if something happens before we had 
if you go back some years, we had that discussions. Um, but NATO has shown that we stand together. We agreed very early that, first of all, avoid war. Second, we will stand together in our sanctions, our support to Ukraine. We'll stand together to make sure that this war doesn't escalate outside Ukraine. And if the war breaks out, we will all support Ukraine with whatever means is necessary. So we stood together, as we stood together in Afghanistan, but not only in NATO, but also with partners. And I think that's significant to, when you look at the world with China and Russia, it's important to remember that neither China or Russia has, any, has friends like Ukraine right now. So sometimes we, we compare sizes of Russia versus US, China versus US, but we have to compare Russia, China versus NATO with partners, with countries like South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, significant democratic countries with very modern military. And that changes sort of the weight of deterrence. Because if we stand together, we, we uh, are a significant deterrence force. Going back to the war, um, because this is about the war in Ukraine. That's what you're going to study and, and uh, look at for lessons identified. I, I would say it's a little bit early to identify lessons in an war, ongoing war. But there are definitely things we can learn from it. Uh, but it's early. We are almost 10 months into the war. Going back to 2014, we are more than eight years into the war. Uh, but, um, but the significance of this war will have impact for a long, long time. I have said it, it will last, outlast my life, you know, the, the, the impact of this war. We have people who have been moved from Ukraine to Russia. We have se separated families. We have refugees. We have to rebuild Ukraine uh, once uh, fighting is over. So this, this will take, take time. And we have to deal with a Russia that we cannot trust for a long, long, long time, if ever, under Putin's regime. But President Putin made strategic mistakes by attacking Ukraine. So I, I, will, I will mention some of these mistakes. So first of all, he thought that he could reach his goals with a limited special military operations, operation. What, what he, what he call, that's what he, called, what, what he called it. So his, his goals were to occupy most of eastern Ukraine, I would think. His goal was to remove um, the democratic elected leadership of Ukraine. And his goal was to demilitarize Ukraine and also to make sure that NATO didn't expand. And he has failed in all these goals. First of all, he's not able to change Zelensky's, uh, Zelensky and his people. That's not going to happen. Uh, the leadership of Ukraine has proven strong. Second, he's not able to control eastern Ukraine at all. He's not having any success on the battlefield. His land power is suffering heavily. He has lost so much of his land power now that, that it, it's significant for the future as well. He's losing and wasting missiles, which will be hard to reproduce in a long, long time. And he has lost also uh, uh, some of his um, maritime forces in the Black Sea and a small percentage of his air force. But he has lost some of it. Um, he do did not succeed in trying to stop any enlargement of NATO. So Ukraine is not a NATO member now, but Sweden and Finland has applied. And they are providing huge territories. They are providing a border with Russia from fin Finland, which is more than 1,300 kilometers long. And they are providing a modern military force into NATO. And Finland and Sweden will contribute to more security for all of us. I haven't seen any downsides of Finnish and Swedish mem NATO membership. I tried to really think about it, but I haven't found anyone. So it's, 
and the military integration of Sweden and Finland into NATO will go fast because they have been together with us in Afghanistan. They have been on exercises, they have been together on operations elsewhere as well, and they have a modern force. So the military integration will go really fast. Uh, so once the political process is done, I would say that within 2024, and the exercise we have now called Nordic Response, will sort of um, integrate the most important things of, uh, of Sweden, Swedish and Finnish NATO membership from a military perspective. And he hasn't achieved anything when it comes to splitting the West. So we stand together as we have ever done before, and we're gonna stand together for as long as it takes. And the setbacks for the Russian military is long lasting. It will take years and years to rebuild that. Looking from my perspective on the Kola Peninsula, my assessment is that the land forces will take a number of years to rebuild if they decide to rebuild them. And that's sort of President Putin's big lie, that he always said that NATO is a threat to Russia, and he has shown with his action against Ukraine and his movement of forces that he doesn't any, at any way, in any sense, he doesn't think that NATO is a threat to, to Russia. Because if he really believed it, he couldn't have moved all his land forces to Ukraine. Because it's quite open now on the eastern flank of NATO, on the Russian side. So Russia is suffer suffering. And they're going to suffer for this, in this for a long time because sanctions are going to work. And the lack of uh, raw material that it needs is going to uh, be a burden for, for rebuilding their forces. So in these historical times, we need to think fast and we need to, to act fast. And we need to think big. We need to think, what does this mean for us? What does it mean for NATO, the strongest military alliance in history? What does it mean with these changes we are seeing? And uh, one thing that is frustrating, being the chief of defense, is the way we talk about change. So we tend to talk about change in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. We cannot think about change in years. We have to think about change in five, 10, 15 months. We need to change faster. If you go back to Ukraine, one of the big lessons learned from, the, from this war is that Ukraine has been able to transition and to implement new equipment, new procedures in a very, very short time while they are fighting a war. So the innovation, the development of Ukrainian forces is going so fast. And we have seen that from the Norwegian perspective, delivering anti-tank missiles in the beginning. They were not used to using them. They learned it by just reading the book and knew how to use them. We trained Ukrainian soldiers on, uh, on our uh, M109 artillery pieces. They learned in a week how to operate them, how to maintain, uh, maintain them. And then we had to do some extra maintenance when it comes to to more complicated uh, reparations and fixing of the, of, the, of the pieces. We learn them to use Hellfire missiles. We learn them to use Mistral anti-air uh, anti missiles. We have learned them, learn, learned them how to use uh, NASAMS, air defense systems. And that's only from a Norwegian perspective. And then you can add on all the different equipment and systems that's been delivered across the board to Ukraine, and they have learned so fast. So we can change, and Ukraine has shown us that. So um, facing the Russian attack, Ukraine is actually leading the way in also how we could develop our forces. And that's why I'm interested in hearing what sort of lessons learned comes out of this seminar. What, what have we really learned? Finally, before we open up for, for questions, Ukraine is fighting a war for all of us.
They're not fighting a war for territory in Ukraine. They're fighting a war for everything we fought for during World War II. So after World War II, we had an international rules-based order. That order is being challenged by Russia with an unprovoked attack on Ukraine. And Ukraine is fighting that war for all of us. And it's hard to see what's happening without being able to actually getting involved. Because we cannot be involved militarily in direct fights right now, because actually, as I said, nuclear deter deterrence works. We don't want this war to escalate into a third world war. So they're fighting a war on our behalf, and they deserve our support. And the war they are fighting, every day they are beating down the Russian military. They actually contribute to our security. So we don't have to face the platforms that's being killed or destroyed in Ukraine. And that's why we have to dig deep, as the Secretary General of NATO has said, into our stocks to continue to support Ukraine. Because the risk for a conventional war in Europe outside Ukraine is less now than it was before uh, they started, Russia started to taking heavy losses in, in Ukraine. So we, we cannot allow Russia to, to win this war. Then we would have a totally new situation, uh, which is not acceptable at all. So we need to be in it for a long haul. We need to stay focused. We need to dig into our stocks. We need to support Ukraine. And I spoke with, um, with the Ukrainian chief of defense on, uh, on Friday. And definitely he knows what he wants for Christmas. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's what we call harde pakker. So it's uh, solid, solid stuff he needs. Um, for Russia, I don't see a Russia that at any point during my years as chief of defense, we could say that we can regain any trust. In Norway, we have kept some lines of dialogue with Russia open uh, to make sure that we have border security coordinated, that we have, s have some mechanisms to conduct search and rescue in the Barents Sea if needed, and that we continue with the protocols regarding incidents at sea agreement if something happens up there in the Barents Sea that we don't want to escalate. So we have kept those those um, lines open to make sure that we don't have any misunderstandings and unnecessary escalation. But how that's going to progress in the future, I don't know. It's, uh, it's actually up to President Putin. So it's up to President Putin to stop this war. And he has to stop it because if President Zelensky stops, Russia is winning. And that's not acceptable from both a Ukrainian perspective, but also from sort of an international perspective. We cannot let Russia win this, because then we allow uh, larger nations to use power against smaller nations in Europe. And that's, that's, uh, that should belong to history. And finally, I would say that we should be very careful with underestimating Russia. So don't underestimate Russia. They are still a big nuclear power. They still have, they are the largest country in the world when it comes to territory. They have potential and they haven't used all their potential in Ukraine. So Russia can still escalate the war while Ukraine is totally dependent on our support. So what we see now, I think for the next uh, months, maybe years, is, uh, is a more static prolonged warfare, which reminds us all of 1914 again. Trenches, artillery, um, suffering, both from the military and the, and the civilians in Ukraine. And that's going to last, unfortunately. Unless something unexpected happens, like a collapse in the Russian morale, or uh, 
a sort of peace agreement or whatever uh, could come up with between President Zelensky and Putin. But it has to be on President Zelensky's terms. We should not dictate anything there. It's uh, Ukraine's war. They're fighting it for all of us, and we need to support them for a long, long time. Thank you. I open up for questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, one there, James. So, good uh, afternoon. James Farrar from the Land Warfare Centre in the UK. So, we are running an R&D seminar looking at lessons from Ukraine. We're looking at Russia and Ukraine, or rather Ukraine fighting a war for, on behalf of NATO in some ways in Ukraine. Do you think others are looking at the same conflict from a different lens and seeing how NATO and other technologies are being employed and making their own deductions, running their own seminars elsewhere? If anyone else is doing similar things like this. From the other, other side, sir, you potentially have this in the future. Yeah, that's a, I, of course. Of course, Russia is doing it. Of course, Russia is learning from their war. Um, of course, China is watching. Uh, so, so uh, when I joined the military in 1988, it was the Falklands War. Before that, it was the Vietnam War we, we talked about. And then, you know, we, we didn't have any, any real wars to, to discuss. Now we have a variety of wars. We have um, the first Gulf War. We have um, Afghanistan, Iraq, the bombings in Libya. Uh, and now we have a war in, in, uh, in Europe, for, to mention some. And China is, of course, not involved in any of these. They're just watching and learning. They have learned from everything we have been doing without suffering at all. Russia is, of course, learning while they are fighting. And if there's something that brings, up, brings out um, innovation and new methods to, to fight, it's, it's being in a war. We saw that in Afghanistan. We, we saw how we, how we sort of modified our vehicles and everything in Afghanistan in a very short time. I think we had uh, on one vehicle that, that we procured while in Afghanistan, I think we had more than 200 modifications amongst the forces in Afghanistan. At the same time, back in Norway, we had like nine or 10 on the same vehicle. So it brings, it brings innovation. Uh, so Russia is learning as well. And that's why I said that re the regenerating forces in Russia doesn't necessarily mean regenerating what they had before the war. At least I wouldn't do that if, uh, if I was, and look, I'm happy I'm not, but if I was uh, in Gerasimov's shoes, shoes, I would not say that I'm going to rebuild what we had. I will build something new, uh, looking at, uh, at the, the environment around me and the lessons learned. So definitely. Um, but I think the most important is to learn from the Ukrainians themselves what they have actually experienced. Uh, right now, they, they are also doing the lessons learned, but, uh, but they are in the, mid in the mi middle of a war. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good question. I, I, I would say that the th what we are all facing, and that's another discussion, is, is when do we move? When do we change how we operate? So wha how do we invest? And that's, that's so why I'm so interested in this, because every, every NATO nation now is investing more and more in uh, equipment and uh, military material, and of course we should do that. We need to spend more money on, on defense, that's uh, obvious. Um, but uh, but uh, what are we investing in? That's a, that's a big discussion, and that's, that's something I've spent a lot of time uh, looking into, uh, because we have large investments in the Norwegian forces as well for the future. Yeah. Thank you, Brigadier General Paul Berglund. Yeah, General, um, <coughs> you stressed the, the importance of the West standing together in this for the future. Ca what do you perceive as the, the threats to allied cohesion? Uh, and what do we need to be yeah. sure that we continue standing together? Yeah, that's uh, so the between the military, we stand together. So our, our chief, uh, chief of defenses, um, army to army, navy to navy, Air Force to Air Force, Space Force to Space Force, and within the cyber domain, we stand together. Um, so the risk is, is more um, from the society or 
it's also a political risk. Because there are a lot of other priorities that has to be maintained and has to and will come up. So so uh, and that's what Russia is trying to that that's where Russia is trying to split us. So a weakened Russia, conventionally military, doesn't mean less Russian activity. And so it, uh, it doesn't mean that they probably it means the opposite. So a strong conventional force in Russia, with a strong conventional force in Russia, President Putin would feel more secure. He's not feeling secure at the moment because his conventional forces are weakened. And he sees the support to Ukraine. And his prestige is in Ukraine right now. Um, so first of all, the, the importance of, of nuclear deterrence the relative importance of that is, 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 uh, is more important for Russia now than it used to be. For Norway, that means just outside our border in, in the Kola Peninsula. Their submarines will be active, um, and they, they, they are hard to, de to detect, hard to track. But also what I would call, someone calls it hybrid threats or, or more, um, yeah, hybrid threats is maybe a good word. They will use other means to try to split us. So flying drones over a Norwegian airport, if Russia stands by it, stands behind it, it's not to take the final picture of that airport. It's to make us uncertain. If they're flying drones over oil, over oil installations, it's not to, to uh, at, again, not to spy on them. It's to make us uncertain. So if, if we all start to worry about energy, inflation, um, Taxes, healthcare, cold winter, new pandemic. If the more the more focus we are on ourselves, and the less we focus um, on the support Ukraine deserves, and, and see the the broad picture, the harder it will be for us to sustain that support. So, so it will it will cost something for all of us to support Ukraine in the future as well, because this this war and the effects of the pandemic is still hurting us when it comes to, to uh, supply lines and everything that we, we d rely on. So, um, so I, I see something happening if something happens like unexpected things like the Nord Stream 1 and 2. You know, it immediately starts um, dividing the support to Ukraine. So what's, what's more important is of course our People will think it's more important that we are secure than providing support to Ukraine. And that's, that's dangerous. And that's what they want to achieve if Russia stands behind anything of this. Hmm. We will have time for one more question. Okay. I guess I can read you loud and clear. It's an online question. So uh, one of the nuclear challenges that there is not that many people think of is of course adopting uh, armor nuclear units in the beginning. That tanks a necessary component in a combat credible combined joint force in the high north. If so, who should provide maneuver units with tanks in our area of responsibility considering the US Marine Corps has decided to remove tanks from their toolbox? It's an interesting question. I wonder why it came up. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to the Cold War. So we had uh, strong defense plans of Norway. What did they look like? Going, going, um, going to the time the US Marine Corps had main battle tanks. What did we say then? We said we needed main battle tanks to be aligned with the US Marine Corps. They are battle tanks, so we need battle tanks. So uh, going back to the first, second, and the war in Ukraine, what have we seen from the Russian side? We have seen columns of uh, heavy armor being ready for destruction. So. If I should say something about main, about main that battle tanks, they definitely have a deterrence effect. That's, that's unquestionable. 
Men battle tanks, have a, they have a deterrence effect. So, what do they also have? They have some sort of mobility. They have limited mobility over larger distances. They rely on, on um, some other means to transport them, either train or heavy trucks or ships, whatever. What do, they also, what do also heavy equipment require? They require logistics, maintenance, fuel, everything that, that uh, a main battle tank is, is uh, relying on. And third, um, what about uh, protection? Of course, protected very well in a tactical battle. And then they are uh, they have also some weaknesses when it comes to, to modern um, anti-tank weapons. So, so it's, a it's a always a dilemma that I think everybody stands in. It's, it's uh, firepower, mobility, protection. It, it goes to down to that. And how do you weigh, weigh that in the end? When it comes to Norway, we are in the process now of procuring main battle tanks. And uh, I will have a discussion with the government to make sure that they invest the right. That's, uh, that's sort of my statement on, on Norway's side of it. But it's very important to have an open, good discussion about the future of warfare. And that's what you're going to help me about this, this day. So, so we need to, to think. And one of, one of my, my um, allies, allied colleagues said that we're all facing the same dilemmas every day. And he said that when do we move from industrialized H platforms with technology that is battle proven into new, even more modern technology that we still don't say is mature enough. So when do you take those shifts? Do you take it gradually? And when do you take those gradually shifts? Um, because I don't believe in a sort of a rev revolution. Uh, but when do you have a good discussion about strengths and, um, and vulnerabilities for the platforms we are using? We will have the same discussions about surfer, pl surfer platforms in the Navy. Uh, we will have the same discussions about um, anything. We will have it with, uh, with the future um, fighter aircraft. So when do you move to technology that is, that is sort of um, not so dependent on, on um, protection, but has more mobility and flexibility and, and firepower? So it's a, it's a big discussion. And I'm not going to reply on exactly what I mean here. <laughs> yeah. OK. Thank you all. And, um, <coughs> And uh, what I have, so Norway is investing quite heavily in research and, and development. So, first of all, the Norwegian Defense Research Institute is, of course, the biggest institution. Um, and we have some of them here, I see. <coughs> and that's an institution that is more than, it started after the war, uh, it started under the war, maybe. Just after, yeah. So it's, uh, it's an institution that develops, it's focused on technology. It serves us well. We have this system where we, we call it uh, the three, it's, it's sort of three parties coming together. It's the users, users of military equipment, meaning officers, NCOs, soldiers, with industry, with the Research Defense Institute. That's, where, that's something where we can, that's a mechanism where we can develop things really fast. But that's sort of more on the technology side um, and developing on new, new equipment. Then you have the, the um, uh, Forsvarshögskola, the Norwegian Defense Academy, which is doing their research on 
the topics we are discussing today. I think it's very important now to, to broaden our minds and make sure that we do qualified decisions for the future. Because we are talking huge monies. And uh, finally, if, I, if there is one worry I have, is that if we overinvest and we're not able to sort of sustain it, we could easily end up in a situation where we have a lot of very good equipment for 2025, but we are losing the opportunity to change it in 2031. So, so the, the way we wo work with industry, the way we procure military equipment, is something we need to look into. So the most, if, if you use these examples of iPhones, if I've had all my top skilled military advisors on communications in 2005, 2006, if we succeeded, we would have been able to produce an iPhone 4 in 2011. And it would last for 20 years. No one has an iPhone 4 anymore. And that's the way it works also now with, with um, military equipment. Technology, the technology side is moving fast. I mean, need to, to stay on it. And that's where I think that's something we can learn from Ukraine. How, how good they are being at implementing new unknown technology in a very short time. So, Slava Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will have a short break. Um, please be back uh, in uh, eight minutes, and then we'll prepare for the next presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to uh, take your seats, please? The next speaker is uh, Dr. Uzi Rubin. He is uh, from the Bar Ilan University in Israel. And um, I asked him if I could call him the father of the Israeli missile defense system. But he said, no, you can, you can call me the uncle. So he's the <laughs> uncle of it. Yeah. Dr. Rubin has a BS in aerospace engineering from the Israeli Institute of Technology in 1962 and an ME in aerospace engineering from the Rensselaer, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute of Troy, New York from 1969. He also holds a PhD in political science from 2019 from Bar Ilan University of Israel. Dr. Rubin was the founder and first director of the Israel Missile Defense Organization with within Israel's Ministry of Defense, in charge of Israel's missile defense programs. He is currently a senior researcher in the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies and the Jerusalem Institute for Strat Strategy and Security. So, uh, Dr. Bin, welcome to Norway. Thank you. And Thank uh, you. the floor is yours. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. This is really a privilege. And um, I'm going to speak about the air war uh, in Ukraine, uh, which is a topic that is worth of a conference, three days conference itself. Trying to squeeze that to about 30 to 45 minutes is quite a feat. So I'll have to skip a lot. What I'll cover is uh, the first the timeline to, to frame everything, both of the ground war and the air war and its various phases. And I'll talk about uh, the Russia, Russian opening strike. Uh, then about the Russian strategic, this is now the complicated name given to him by the British Chief of Staff. Strategic Operation for Destruction of Critical, it's mouthful. And it has an acronym, SODSIT. Um, I'll speak about that, it's the main, main part of my presentation. The Russian Ukraine and missiles and UAV at war, and the Ukraine's air and missile defense in action. And what I say, tentative lessons. I mean, the lessons too, you can speak three days about them even just about the air war, but I'll squeeze it to the two main lessons that I personally take out from that. Uh, now I have to change my own slides. Let me see if it's working. No, it's not working. 
What do I do? Okay, there it is. The ground war, the upper line, you see the invasion of Ukraine, the three main phases. And then in the beginning of April, there was the pivot to the, uh, they gave up the northern uh, 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 um, invasion and pivoted to the south, to the east and to the south. And in early September, started Ukraine's uh, counteroffensive, which is now, I think this phase is about uh, uh, on suspension right now. Let's see what happens during the winter. In the air war, uh, it was much more complex. We had the opening strike, and then the SODSIT, the strategic offensive, had, I see in it, three main phases. Phase A was a general campaign against value targets. In the beginning, they didn't strike infrastructure, just value targets. A campaign then, this phase B against fuel and the railways. And now, uh, the third phase, which is going on, is the attack on the basically the electric grid. No? Uh, yeah. no why did it go back? What, what do I do? Can you change it for me? Next one. Thank you. The opening strike was uh, basically a standoff strike from uh, sea launch ballistic missile, ground launch ballistic missile, air launch ballistic missile, and uh, short range ballistic missiles. Also, we now know there was an element of an air war, of a fixed, fixed wing aircraft uh, attack. Quantitatively, next slide, please. Can we know about what I gather from all this is that the first strike included between 100 and 200 uh, air launch ballistic uh, air launch cruise missiles. Uh, about 100, probably is an underestimate, strikes by ballistic missiles and unknown number of sorties of uh, fixed wing aircraft. Targeted was uh, obviously this attack was uh, to suppress the uh, uh, Ukrainian air force and uh, ground-based defense forces. Uh, the strike definitely eroded the capability both of the Air Force and the uh, ground defense forces, but didn't uh, eliminate them. Uh, Vestigal capability ca remained. Why, uh, why was that? Why didn't the Russians succeed in eliminating completely with that strike uh, the uh, Ukrainian Air Force and ground-based forces? Uh, can you make the next, strike, the next slide, please? You can see here on the upper, two upper pictures, in the left-hand side is McGrader, which is uh, struck. The right-hand side is a freeze frame from a movie taken by a, a smartphone showing a lineup of uh, Ukrainian MiG-29s. They dispersed but didn't disperse enough. And you can see a strike in the uh, foreground of a uh, missile that hit the, uh, uh, the, the, air, the, the airstrip. On the, on the lower picture, see how they are missing. See the left-hand side picture? You see the airstrip or air airfield, airfield, and then it's the strikes in that airfield. Most of them didn't hit the, the, the runway itself. On the right-hand side, you see an attack on a base of uh, transportation aircraft, transport aircraft. Only three aircraft are hit, and about most of the aircraft are survived. So that means, uh, next slide, please. Uh, possible reason is, first, it's underpowered. It's too few missiles for too many targets. They weren't preparing for a real full cell war. They were preparing for some kind of a walkover. Missiles were inaccurate or targeting was not sufficiently ac accurate. And also, they were a uh, malfunction. Uh, subsequent, there was a lot of air, uh, conventional air activity, Russian air activity, to gain superiority above, above the axis of the invasion. And eventually, there was a revival, about two weeks' time, there was a revival of uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, ground-based air defense, which denied the airspace to uh, Russian aircraft, and, um, and uh, the incursion almost uh, stopped, except in the FEBA, in the front end of the budge line, where attack aircraft kept uh, operating. Next slide, please. Then came the SOTSI, the strategic offense. The phase, first phase was a mixed value targets. The main interesting thing is, was that, uh, uh, the campaign against the civilian airports. They started taking out the civilian airports one by one. It's in the map here on some of the airports that they took out. And interesting enough, they didn't hit the runways. They hit the infrastructure, the control towers, 
the buildings, the maintenance, the communication, in order to deny them to the Ukrainian Air Force. They attacked fuel, de uh, fuel depots, uh, military industries. You can see a picture here on the lower left-hand side of an attack on an arm factory in, uh, uh, in Kiev. Uh, they continue to try to erode the uh, ground-based air defenses and the one, at least one instance of focus assassination. Very interesting. Next slide, please. There was the attack on Venezia, on an office building in Venezia, where uh, 23 uh, civilians were killed. What the Russian explained that there was a meeting taking place in that building between uh, uh, Ukrainian commanders and the uh, suppliers of arms from the West. And that's why they attacked that building. Of course, there is no confirmation uh, from the Ukrainian side, but so they said that Zelensky fired his chief of intelligence, uh, that's not July 8th, but July 18th, excuse me for the typo. So maybe there is something in what the Russian uh, say. They certainly attempted that. Next slide. And that was phase also saw the first use of hypersonic weapons. Now, hypersonic weapons, again, I can go in three-day conference, but in short, there are three types, three kinds. The <coughs> aeroballistic ones that fly like ballistic missiles and maneuver in the atmosphere hypersonically. There is the <coughs> hypersonic gliding vehicle and the hypersonic uh, cruise missiles. Uh, these are the more difficult sides. The easier is the Kinjal, which is an aeroballistic one. Next slide, please. They fired, they announced three occasions of uh, using the Kinjal against targets that really didn't justify using this kind of advanced weapon, or probably it was shock and awe. They wanted to shock the West, and indeed it created a lot of sensation, if you remember the time, with incrimination why the West doesn't have similar weapons at the time. The West is going to have similar weapons very soon. In the next year, probably, is going to be operational in the United States. Uh, the Ukrainians said there were many more attacks. Next slide, please. And perhaps they are right. You can see one evidence that came out. You see on the left-hand side, the picture of debris, the debris of a kinjal, which was found deep in Russia, in Stravopol. And if you think that may have been fine to, uh, to Kiev, it's, it's about 1,000 kilometers. And that was found in September. That means there may have been more attacks. It's a kinjal that didn't uh, ignite, just fell from the plane and crashed to the ground. Next slide. The phase B of the strategic offensive was against uh, Ukraine's railway system. Why? They wanted to stop the flow of Western weapons to the... In, in Ukraine, the road system is not important. The railway system is important. So very systematically, they went after the... Uh, railway bridges, railway junctions, railway equipment, and they failed. Luckily for the Ukrainian, uh, the railway system is its Soviet uh, legacy. That means it's built for survival in war rather than efficiency, commercial efficiency. That means overcapacity, a very centralized organization, and a state within a state. Uh, uh, it's self-sufficient. It has its own workshops, its own experts, its own uh, everything and overcapacity of rails, and uh, so they stopped that, it, it, and then it, it, it's operating. The railway system is operating, active, and, and working. Next slide. <coughs> and then it's, uh, let me digress now. The question is, how many missiles did they fire? How many missiles do they are left? There were speculations here, and you see some of the speculation. By the end of mid, uh, by June uh, 22, the CIS organization estimated about two, two, 2,800. Zelensky himself, by mid-July, said that the Russian fired up to now about 3,000 cruise missiles. He was specifically cruise missiles. And then Reuters came out the, uh, by the August, about uh, 3,650, which gives you altogether a rate of about 700 missiles per month, which is large, which is a huge number. Also, compared to the German V1 uh, uh, campaign during the Second World War, it's still something the German managed to fire about uh, 1,200 of them per month, which, which is amazing. So it's smaller than that, but still it's a lot. Next slide, please. So the speculation was really from the beginning. Are the Russians running out of missiles? Uh, it's like the speculation is uh, Putin sick or is going to die. Uh, you hear it all the time. By the way, this is nothing new. In every war, think about the leader, it was the Second World War, the rumors from the start that Hitler is going to die very soon is something that... Uh, next slide. And because of that, there came the news that there are 
kind of improvising, taking missiles, air defense missiles, the S-300, using it in ground-to-ground -ground mode, which is possible. The S-300 has that capability. Very interestingly, the idea is that they are defending against missiles. It's a dual-use missile. It's an air defense and missile defense. But in order to defend against missile, you know whether we have missile where you can tra track the missile. You can track it to the origin, and if you know where the origin is, you can use the same missile in order to try to take out the launcher. A very, very interesting idea for the missile defense community. But the accuracy is not that great, and they also use anti-ship missile, the LJ KH-22, which is huge and has a one-ton warhead. It's like a usual cruise missile is about half a ton. And perhaps this explain. next slide, please. Uh, two instances of huge craters, much bigger than the usual cruise missile crater. Perhaps this explain it, although it has very little blast effect. Look at the building next by. There seems to be unhit. Next slide. Then came the surprising uh, the, uh, disclosure by the uh, Ukrainian Minister of Defense about uh, two weeks ago. He gave a list, a detailed list of how many missiles were fired on Ukraine until now. This is a very curious list. Altogether, you see about 3,400 missiles. I'm not counting the Ukrainian supplied missile, I'll talk about it later. Uh, but but this, this, this list is strange, very curious. L next slide, please. I painted the green, the one which are specialized for ground to ground attack, precision ground to ground attack. The Skanders, Calibers, Cage 101, Cage 55, which is uh, an older generation, and the Kijali cell. All the rest of them are not precision missiles against ground uh, targets. Uh, uh, the Yahont is an anti-ship missile, supersonic S-300, I talked about it, Cage 22 I talked about it. Cage 35 is a harpoon, is, uh, is a Russian harpoon. Uh, that against the ground target. So I, I don't know what to make of that list. You see that the dedicated missile, the special missile, is less than half of the total. So I can read two messages here. First, that the number of uh, dedicated missiles the Russians use is lower than estimated which explained the poor, relatively poor results. And that what he's saying here, that the Russians, is, the Minister of Defense, Ukraine Minister of Defense, is making a case that the Russians are running out of missiles. Because they need to use all this uh, actually undedicated, unspecialized missile as a fill-in. There may be something to it, because something that I didn't put in center, I just saw it this morning. A piece of information came out that uh, Two of the recent missiles that hit Ukraine in the last in, end of November, uh, the serial number was analyzed and uh, the code is known and did give the date of their manufacture and the date is new. Those two missiles were manufactured a month and two months ago. That means from the factory to the front line. So th probably they have some problem, their uh, supply, their uh, stockpile was not very large. And uh, this is also understandable because those missiles are very expensive. Actually, I uh, took the, the cost is about uh, $6 million, so they say between 3 and $6 million, which in real-time terms, in modern terms, is the cost of a bomber of the Second World War. So it's quite an expensive piece of machinery. Next slide, please. <coughs> Let me digress again, talk about uh, Ukraine's missile at war. Now, Ukra missile, Ukraine also was developing missile. It was developing its own version of the scandal, it's called GROM-2. We didn't hear about anything about it in this war. They had another precision missile of their own called the Zaporozhet, <coughs> uh, uh, I think, or I don't remember the name exactly. It was used successfully in the gorno karabakh war, but the Ukrainians don't use it in this war. I have no explanation for that. They have about 500 at least of uh, the old uh, SS-21, which they used uh, in, with limited success in Donetsk and Lugansk, but probably in more success in covert operation behind the lines. Like you see here uh, on the right hand side, the example of uh, fire and oil installation Belogrod beyond the border, probably instigated by um, uh, uh, Ukrainian SS-21s. This is a precision weapon, uh, quite, quite precise, but in a very old style. Uh, next slide, please. The main uh, Ukrainian missile is now, the HIMAR is not a missile. The missile is a GMLRS, uh, the guided MLRS, very precise. The HIMAR is the launcher, it's a scoot and shoot uh, launcher. Uh, very effective, you can see here on the right hand side, uh, Antonevsky, I hope I pronounced it, Antonevsky Bridge, 
The, the warhead is small, it's about 80 kilograms. It's enough to by itself to destroy, but when you fire many of them, uh, you drill holes into the, into the bridge until it becomes unserviceable. And that's what happened here. The Russians claim to have destroyed, uh, the, they, they claim that their air defense can shoot down the GMLRS. There is one example here which shows that probably the possibility exists. Can you do the hyperlink now, please? With two rockets hitting almost at the same time, followed up by an interception, then followed two more rockets hitting on the same position, followed by the six. Oh, okay, stop it. So probably technically it done be done by the SA-15. The Russian claim 50 to 80 percent success rate. This seems far-fetched. However, again, something which I couldn't put in the slides were too new. Uh, something that happened day before yesterday. The Russians are developed new algorithms, the software changes for their air defense in order to improve their score against the HIMARS. So expect the success rate of the HIMARS to go down because this is the usual game. We know it. They come up in our car too. They come up with a new trick uh, with the missiles from Gaza. We put new software and we overcome that. They put a new trick and so on. It goes on and forth. Next slide. Uh, Ukraine UAVs, the great hope was the, uh, the Bayraktar, which uh, gave good account of itself, Nagorno Karabakh. Not so successful here. In the beginning of the war, in the first two or three weeks, you see a lot of kills, and they are, uh, if you know the Oryx blog, they give you the exact date, they, 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 give, they show you the video, they give you the exact date, and you look at the number of successes going down and down. As far as we know now, uh, information is that the Russians managed to shoot them down faster than the Turks can manufacture them. Because why? Because it's a Thunderbird. It's a huge aircraft. It's bigger than F-16. It's flying at 200 kilometers an hour. That means a standing target at 20,000 feet. I mean, you can just hang a balloon there and shoot it down. Uh, so when there is no air defense, uh, like in northern Syria and Nagorno-Karabakh, they were very successful. Against very dense air defense, they are probably not, not very successful. There are about 14 confirmed losses, probably much more. Next slide. And Ukraine drones, uh, the one, the quadcopters, uh, they have a lot of uh, private companies that make quadcopters and drop light bombs. Effort propaganda is good, but it's, it's not, very, not very effective. Next slide. Let's talk about Russian UAVs. Uh, the main UAV in the beginning of the war was the uh, tactical reconnaissance, the Orlan. They had several hundred of them, very effective, good optics, very simple to operate, expandable. You can shoot them down, very cheap to make. But otherwise than that, uh, they had very few uh, capable observation and attack uh, 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 UAVs. There on the left hand side, you see something called four post, which is an adaptation of an Israeli um, uh, UAV. Next slide. And they started going into the heavier uh, Reaper like uh, uh, stuff. The, the, the American stuff here, you see the one of the first Orions. It has a different name in Russia. This is the export name. But very low rate of production. Some small factory making them in uh, Petersburg. And they managed to make a few per month and came, started the war with such a small number that they were completely insignificant. That's, uh, why is that? Is the Russian, next slide please. Uh, yeah, but they have the small ones, the small ones, the, uh, uh, the loitering ones uh, are quite effective. There are two types, the Kub made by Kalachnikov, uh, the Zalav division of the Kalachnikov uh, um, arms factor, arms complex. And the more effective uh, Lancet, Zala is uh, actually, uh, not Zala, the Kub is a uh, point to point, it's not loitering. It has to, you'd have to tell it uh, the coordinate and it goes there and uh, suicides on the coordinate. But the, but the Lancet is a real loitering uh, It has an optical sensor of its own and can, it can shoot, look, uh, search for target and shoot them. Uh, can you make a video walk now, please? You can see here, this is Russian footage, and below is the Ukrainian equipment, unfortunately. And uh, here you can see the Russians are scoring some successes. Look, here, here is the missile coming. Uh, the, the warhead is very small. It's like an anti-tank missile on wings. Uh, and here is the missile itself taking the picture of being hit. Is another one. Okay, stop it.
So the Russians, and, and, and you see more and more of these films coming out on the net. The Russians are gaining experience and improving in this. Next slide. So why, why the Russian? What was the shortfall? Because the Russians went into UAV business very late. Only in the Georgian war in 2008, they woke up to the importance of UAVs in the battlefield because the Georgians had a small fleet of Israeli Hermes 450s, uh, just reconnaissance without an attack capability. Most of them were shot down air to air by uh, Russian uh, fighters, but some of them survived and those that survived gave very good account of themselves. The result was that a few months later, the Russian chief of staff came to visit Israel. At that time, we were very cordial relations with uh, Russia. Remember, it's 2008 before 2014. Uh, they asked for our more advanced uh, UAVs. We refused. We gave them the first generation. They bought some searcher third generation and they modified them and started manufacturing them. So in the beginning of the Ukraine war, they found themselves with a very small arsenal of UAVs. Mainly they missed uh, what's called me medium altitude, uh, 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 long endurance UAVs with the capability of attack, ground attack, and long range uh, loitering suicide UAVs, which they went to, Ukraine, to Iran to buy. It's interesting and significant they, they bought from Iran, it's very significant from which, where they didn't buy. They didn't buy from China, apparently the Chinese refused, they didn't buy from Turkey, which is, uh, could be another source, selling to Ukraine, didn't refuse to sell to, to Russia. So you see the politics here too. Uh, Iran denied it emphatically until recently they admitted that uh, they sold uh, UAVs to Russia before the war. Next. Uh, two types that we know of. There are rumors about another type. Actually, three types. On the upper end, on the upper side, you see the, what's called the, Bayrak, the, the Mahajir Six, which is a male UAV. That means uh, medium altitude, long endurance, with both uh, observation capability and ground attack capability. Here you see on the right hand side the munition, which is a reverse engineer Israeli anti-tank missile called Gil. On the lower side, you see the uh, uh, Shahad 136. And uh, can you do the video, please? We'll see one of the first attacks in Odessa. You will see it in a minute. We, unfortunately, there's no sound track. It makes a terrible racket because it's a small piston engine. Uh, it's like the V1 that used to make the racket over London. You can see it. The explosion is not very big because the warhead is about anywhere between 20 and 40 kilograms, like a heavy rocket coming from Gaza. Uh, next slide, please. So they got two types. What you see in the previous one was the Hashad 136, which was the bigger one. Here is Zelensky sending by a Shahad 131. This is a smaller type. Uh, I won't bother you with a diff little difference. The uh, warhead is smaller. It's probably less than 20 kilograms. Next. Uh, the Shahad, uh, both of them in Ukraine are used not as loitering munition, but as cruise missile. Basically, they are slow flying cruise missile, point to point. You give them a coordinate, they go to coordinate and suicide it. If it's the right coordinate, they'll make a kill. It's uh, something that every one of you, each one of you is a handyman, do it yourself, can do in his own backyard. It's very small, you see only about two and a half meters, 200 kilograms. The engine is a German engine. Limbach Motor uh, L550, manufactured under license in China. And the cost of it is anywhere between $500 and $17,000. Yes, this morning I found before the credit, uh, an ad for $17,000. May maybe the price went up because the Iranians are buying them such a quantity. <laughs> so it's a black market. Uh, it, it's very simple. The ingenuity is in simplicity and it's low cost. About the use of it, uh, spokesman of, uh, spokesperson of the Ukrainian Air Force uh, very recently, a few days ago, managed, ma mentioned that about 400 of them were fired, about 340 were shot down or missed, I'm not sure. And none were seen, this is interesting, the last two weeks. And he says, interpretation says that they ran out of them. That was the initial batch and the Russian used all of them. And now uh, they are going to manufacture them in Russia in order to circumvent uh, uncomfort, they are uncomfortable, the Iranians want good relations with Europe and they don't antagonize Europe and, and selling that to Russia is quite antagonistic. So that's a solution uh, to manufacture it in Russia. Next slide. And now I'll go back to the Sotsi, the strategic attack and phase C, which is the most significant one, is the attack on the 
Ukrainian uh, uh, electricity system. Uh, this is the type the Ukrainians say that are uh, taking part in this uh, con uh, uh, attack. Mostly uh, cruise missiles, shahads used as cruise missile, a slow flying cruise missile, and some ballistic, both the S 300 and the Tornado S, which is the Russian HIMAR. They have an equivalent of that, shoot and scoot. Why it's not as effective as the HIMAR, uh, American HIMAR in Ukrainian hand, my guess is that uh, Ukraine, you need a lot of good intelligence for that. And I think the good intelligence is on the side of the Ukrainian with Western help. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, there were up to now, up to yesterday, five discernible waves. I won't go and won't read it to you, but I uh, can say as of this yesterday, it was the beginning of the sixth, sixth wave. Uh, altogether, uh, about between 200 and 300 cruise missiles and between 50 and 150 uh, drones, uh, Iranian drones took part in that. On the right hand side, you see the number claimed by the uh, kind to have been shot down. And can you do the video? We can see one example. This is an attack on a Kiev power station. First, this is a cruise missile, not uh, shards. The first one hit already. And in a minute, you'll see the second one coming. You see, and then you'll see the pooper. Does it, it does it uh, pop up? The, you see the engine uh, accelerated. You see a little smoke. It does it pop up and goes down vertically. And in a minute, you'll see the except. It's an interesting thing that it's not hitting the power station itself, but the installation around the power station. Next slide, please. <coughs> and the impact is devastating. Electricity system, this is the Achilles heel of every advanced country. This is a circulatory system. When you hit that, you hit everything. And here they were successful, much more successful than in uh, uh, transportation attack. You can see here a picture from a Russian blog. You can see the Black Sea, and above the Black Sea, you see a black space, which is Ukraine on the morning of November 24th from a Russian satellite. No electricity except on the western side near Lviv, you see some, some lights. So how much of the electricity system was taken out? 30%, 40%. Remember, some of the electricity went out because the Russian occupied the power station. Some nuclear power stations stopped. but. Generally, it's, it, it is effective, definitely. Whether this is going to be translated in uh, this diminution of the capability of the Ukrainian to wage war, for a smaller country, I'd say definitely. In Ukraine, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a very big country. So the jury is still out whether it's going to impair the, Iranian cap the Ukrainian capability to wage war. Next slide. The evaluation of this attack was uh, mainly based on the evidence of one of the manager of the electricity company in Ukraine. He said it's a very well planned campaign. The people who planned it knew the, the system. They have a return attack wherever they were unsuccessful in damaging. Uh, focused on transformation relays mostly in order to block uh, uh, circumventing. Collateral effect, the disastrous uh, disruption of water supply, storage, transportation, communication. Uh, remember, this was carried out from a distance. And we'll come back to the point. The defense was the porous, very high leakage rate. I say model for future war. Beware of that. That's going to be the face of our next slide. Uh, let's talk about uh, Ukrainian defense. There were several layers of defense. Air to air. We don't have time to see the video here. There's aircraft chasing the cruise missiles and shooting some of them down, although a very small percentage. You see the, um, you, you read the evidence from uh, uh, Ukrainian pilot, two out of six, three out of six, uh, the rate is poor. There is another problem, it's a, here is in the middle picture, is trying to shoot down a shahad. It's a slow flying target, so you see the fusing is too slow. The air-to-air -air missile explodes, the miss distance is good, but it explodes ahead of the, because it's, the shahad is a standing target. The air to air missile is not designed to, to hit such a slow flying target. And there was another problem. They flew, the fighters themselves flew to the debris and were actually down. You see the remains of one of them. That's exactly what happened in the Second World War against the V1. When the Spitfires tried to shoot them down, went into the debris and were sh themselves destroyed. Next. <coughs> and another layer is from the ground, from 
on the left hand side regular uh, air defense system which worked against cruise missiles, cruise missiles and aircraft. So whenever they managed to found them and, and, and uh, improvised the defenses like in the middle you see in uh, Odessa, uh, uh, people, uh, the, the military uh, uh, improvised uh, two guns on a civilian truck with lasers, uh, beams that try to locate them at night. It sounds to me very fantastic. Laser beam is very narrow, how to find the target at night with that narrow beam. But that's what they said. Down to soldiers firing light arms against the, mainly against the Shahabs. The Shahabs, the Shahabs are firing very, very slow. Uh, Iranians say, the Iranians say, the Ukrainians say they're shooting down 70% of them. No, no corroboration for that. Is it legible? I'd say 70% don't hit percent because they miss. But whether they were shot down, I'm not sure. Next slide, please. And the uh, Western reinforcement, we see the Gepard, the Iris T, uh, NASA, which is uh, recently and in the future, the US vampire. Uh, there are reports about successes, but they are not specific. And there is an undertone that the success is achieved if and when the weapon is in the right place in the right time, which to me as a missile defense person means two things. Too few assets and very small footprint. See the shortcoming of that. Uh, can you run the uh, video here? This is an important video because this is. Handy videos uh, aus der Ukraine belegen. 80% aller Raketen sollen abgeschossen worden sein. It can, can be done. It can be done. If given enough missile defense, uh, enough air defense, the, um, the cruise missile can be shot down. Next slide. And uh, let me start concluding here, but uh, uh, generalizing. Uh, this, up to this time, this is largely no contact war. The Air Force don't, uh, don't come into contact. It's an uh, approximate war from a distance, off, off standoff. And, and, and I'm quoting Rusi here, a report from uh, since March, the VKS, the uh, Russian Air Force, is not penetrating the skies of Ukraine. Instead, they're using ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. Yet, with that, without contact, they're achieving strategically meaningful results against uh, uh, Ukraine infrastructure, especially the electricity system. And they are doing that by cruise missiles. Look what, th this is a revolution, because in the past, you did it to penetrate with big bombers and do carpet bombing to achieve the same thing. Linebacker II in 1972 had the same uh, objective, to take out the infrastructure of North Vietnam around Hanoi. And he did that at the cost of 11 B-52s, mostly with their crews. Each one had a crew of about 10 airmen, so you can calculate the losses. Today, you're standing a thousand kilometers away from the border, from the border, you shoot a missile, which is quite expensive. And the total cost could be as much as a, bomber, a fleet of bombers, but no, no one is lost. Uh, next slide. And my, this is the last slide, or the one before the last, the tentative lessons that I take. As I said, only two lessons. First, send-off weapons fired, and there are two probable reasons for that. One, of course, you don't risk your crews, you don't risk your, your expensive aircraft. Why take the risk, even if the risk is small? Stay out, you have the tools to do it from a distance. And why do it with cruise missiles and not ballistic missiles? Because the cruise missiles are more cost-effective. They are cheaper to manufacture. They have a longer range because the breath air, you don't have to put the oxidizer inside. So for the same weight, you get much longer range. And it's more effective weapon. If you can use that, there's no defense against it, use that. So I say this might be the phase of future war. And the next thing is, a, as a member of the missile defense community, let me confess, we saw missile defense up to recently as ballistic missile defense. That was the legacy from the SDIO war. No, it should be against cruise missile too. We have to wake up to that and start devising effective way with big footprints, long range uh, surveillance in order to uh, early warning detection and to, uh, to cure this sh small fo footprint of Shorad. So foot future stress of missile defense should be cruise missile defense. And as for the future, next slide, who knows? And with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Now we open up for uh, questions and answers. And um, if, if you want to pre present a question, please speak loud, clear, and not too fast. Okay? Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. I have a question regarding the European Sky Shield that Germany has taken initiative European? for. European? Sorry? The European what? Sky Shield. Ah. Yeah. Uh, it's a combination of Iris T, uh, Patriot, and Arrow 3. Do you think that would work, given your, especially given your final comments um, regarding cruise missiles? I don't want to sound like uh, <laughs> a salesman. <laughs> But uh, let me say here that uh, there is nothing like uh, I, I Aero 3, which has nothing to do with the Aero that developed. That was Aero 2. Aero 2 is a completely different design based on a patented idea of two young engineers in Israel, like F-23. Because it's patented, the Russians may copy it, the Chinese may copy it, but in the West it's not copied, it's unique. And it defends continents, not countries. So uh, whoever buys that and logs it down has a very robust defense against very long-range missile because it's uh, intercepted deep, very high in the outer space. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, one question regarding um, the cost of intercepts, as in the main challenge if we're going to focus on high volume saturation attacks from cruise missiles or expensive and also very cheap platforms like the Shahat, uh, how to deal with the uh, challenge from uh, the price of air defense missiles and other weapons? You're 100% you correct. This is a problem. The main problem of missile defense against no, no, non-nuclear threats. When you're talking nuclear, there is no... Every, every penny that you put there is worth the price because the damage is unacceptable. When you're talking about uh, conventional missiles, then the, there is the economic game here. And uh, one of the reasons of the success of Iron Dome would ask me why Iron Dome is so successful. What's the secret? I said the secret is the cost of unit. It's the cheapest missile we ever manufactured. I don't want to manufacture numbers, but uh, uh, it's really cheap. It's the cost of ammunition and not cost of missiles. And this is a real trick. How to do that? You have to invest in value engineering, even sacrificing some of the performance. I mean, it's against the grain in Western uh, military industry thinking. You are looking for quality and capability rather than for cost. In, in this matter, you have to think exactly the opposite. Make the cheapest weapon that you think, even if it's like the, it's better to have more weapons than to have more performance. Anyone else? Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Rubin. It was uh, very interesting to uh, listen to you, and thank you for taking the, uh, your uh, time coming all up to our conference. A few uh, administrative uh, remarks. If you have signed up for the dinner later, and you have found out that you're not able to attend, please tell Major Brot uh, that you're not able to attend tonight. Um, we have 20 slots open. So if you have not signed up for dinner, but would like to join us and do some networking, eat good food, you are still open to sign up. And uh, also with regard to food, we have some cakes outside for the, for the break so that we can get you even faster out and back again. So thank you very much. Then we will have a break until um, uh, 15, uh, 40, uh, sorry, 1445, and then we'll start up again. Ladies and gentlemen, um, our ne next speaker is uh, a professor I had the pleasure to, to listen to in September. So uh, I would like to have him over and uh, listen to, or get him to present what I heard earlier to you as well. He is uh, Professor Neil Mackay from the Department of Mathematics at the University of York. He, after his first uh, degree from Cambridge, a uh, PhD at Durham and a postdoctoral fellowship in Japan, he returned to Cambridge 
first to Queen's College and then to the Stokes Fellowship at Pembroke College. He moved to Sheffield as lecturer in 1998 uh, and to York in 2000. He is primarily a theoretical physicist working on algebraic structures related to quantum field theory and string theory. Over the last 15 years, he has developed wide-ranging interests in military operations and on historical problems with colleagues at York and York St. John Universities, founding and leading the York Historical Warfare Analysis Group. And uh, I'm sure you're going to explain how you can utilize mathematics to solve some tactic tactical problems as well. So. Neil, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. If anybody over dinner wants to know about the current state of fundamental physics, please feel free to ask, but there's a danger. At some point, my, my eyes will light up and yours will glaze over. So if we're both drunk, it'll be okay. Okay, um, so I, this needs, I need to be on the screen, right? Nothing. Oh, there we are. Okay, great. Good. Right. As with all my projects in this area, this is done in a mind meld of some people in York. Uh, myself and mathematician, systems biologist Jamie Wood, and my historian colleagues Chris Price and Ian Horwood. So this is all to be thought of as a joint effort, even though Jamie is not a co-author on this paper which is what I'm going to talk about, which is something we wrote for the Royal Air Force Air Power Review in 2014. Um, as a summary of various bits of, of work that we'd done, um, we gave a, a lecture at RAF HQ in 2014, and I think what we said there is pretty much what I'm going to say now, and the lessons stand up reasonably well, but, you know, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether that's so. Um, whoa. Okay, uh, a bit of context concerning doctrine. Um, Phil Meilinger, in his highly cited 10 propositions regarding air power, says air power is primarily an offensive weapon, and talks about the offensive quite a lot. That seems like a potentially contentious statement. Um, a wise commander defeats his enemy's strategy, but that's inappropriate in air war, apparently. Um, you can, again, read the paper, make up your own mind. Um, John Warden, the architect of, uh, well, an, an architect of instant thunder um, in Iraq in 1990, says, the history of air war has shown clearly that masses in the air can only be opposed by counter masses. Right, in response to that, I'll show rather than tell. Um, in case you thought those were straw men, just easy targets, well, actually, uh, the main capstone US Air Force doctrine publication Still says, uh, air power exploits the principle of mass. It wangs on about mass for a while. If you ask it to define mass, it says the purpose is to concentrate. doesn't define what concentration is, but it is clearly still meant to be concentrated in time and in space, always. Okay, so what we're going to do is have a look at some historical data. What can the data tell us about the nature of concentration in air combat? And uh, a little more about historical analysis, what can we learn about the implications for tactical and operational principles. Right, now comes the maths. If you do maths, and the maths is high school calculus, essentially, and if you have a background, a degree in physics or engineering, or um, maybe not computer science, but mathematics, you'll be fine. If not, and those are the people I'm talking to, listen to what I say, don't try and read the equations. Just shut out the equations, and I'll try and make sure that everything I say makes sense in words only. And I'm going to be talking about the very oldest, well, okay, generalizations of the very oldest mathematical model of warfare, uh, written down by the British engineer Fred Lanchester in the winter of 1913 to 14. Now, if you talk to modern software developers of complex uh, military simulations, they will say, oh, no, we, we don't use those old simulations. We don't use simple differential equations. Ridiculous using these old fashioned things. And then you talk to them in detail about the guts of their model. And it turns out that they have units which have some sort of independence from each other, some sort of independent capabilities. If that's so, then you're doing Lanchester's equations. Now, you may put in crowding effects, you may put in problems of target acquisition, you may put in density effects. To the extent to which it does, you do so, you're getting away a little bit from Lanchester. But the danger is that actually what you're doing unconsciously is incorporating these equations in your models. Why is that a danger? Because these models are simplistic and wrong. But as George Box said famously, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is a really useful model because it's a very good provoker of thought. So let me tell you what it means. Um, unconventionally, and it's not because I have anything against the colorblind, I've set up red against green here. Um, 
we've got each force causing losses in proportion to its numbers. So we've got, in the first case, green losses being proportional to, via a constant of proportionality, which is unit effectiveness, red numbers, and vice versa. And what you do with your high school calculus is to divide one rate by the other, and what you get is a casualty exchange ratio, a loss ratio. And it is proportional to the force ratio, inverted. So uh, red losses divided by green losses is proportional to green numbers divided by red numbers. Uh, if you rearrange that, then you get what, for somebody who's done that first course in calculus, is um, an ex uh, a relationship between in infinitesimals. So the small, sort of short time losses of red multiplied by red numbers, multiplied by red effectiveness, is equal to the same thing for green. And then you want to add up these infinitesimals. That's called integration in calculus. You do so, and you get something that's famous as Lanchester's square law. As I said, this is uh, almost never true. Um, Perhaps the only context in which it is demonstrably true was First World War, dreadnought, battleship, naval warfare. Um, going back to the equations, so if you're not uh, interested in the maths, you're thinking, well, when might this be true? And there's a lot of nonsense written in the literature about the conditions under which this holds. Much of the nonsense amounts to writing down sufficient but overstrong conditions, which are by no means necessary. And I think for somebody who doesn't want to think about the sort of mathematical context, the simplest way of characterizing when this might be true is when both sides experience a target-rich environment. Now, of course, that's a fighter pilot's euphemism, which is usually one-sided. It's highly unusual for both sides to, perce to perceive a target-rich environment in which you have long-range aimed weapons, which can quickly always acquire another, another target. If you do so, then the constancy of the difference between effectiveness times numbers squared tells you, crucially, and this is what these models are about, how to combine numbers and effectiveness, and so it will tell us, it will allow us to ask questions about concentration. And in particular, it tells us two things. Um, in Lanchester's model, numbers win in some sense. If we begin with twice as many reds as green, but greens are three times as effective, you might think, ah, oh, two versus three, three wins. But in this case, because of the square, it's two squared that's bigger than three that wins. And winning in this case, if we define it very simplistically as annihilation, you can see immediately why, whether or not this quantity, this difference in squares, is positive or negative is the crucial fact. Because suppose that quantity is positive, then in that case, green cannot possibly win. Because to do so, you'd have no reds, some remaining greens, and that quantity would be negative. So it's impossible in that case for green to win. Perhaps more importantly, um, this model tells you that concentration is good. Suppose green had been able to divide the twice as numerous reds into two separate groups with same numbers, fight the first group first with three times the effectiveness, green definitely wins, and then it turns out green has enough units left to defeat the other red group. And it does so with a surprising number, so nearly 60% of the original green numbers remaining. So it perfectly uh, models for you the idea of defeat in detail. And I think perhaps uh, that is one of the reasons why it had quite a life of its own. One mustn't think of it as solely Fred Lanchester's model. Um, I said that the only play thing it was really good for was battleship warfare in World War I, and indeed it was arrived at separately by different people in four different countries. The essential point is there in a book by Baudry in France, uh, Osipov in Russia, and in the States, Chase and Fisk. For non-mathematicians, Fisk's is actually the easiest read. He wrote down what are known as Fisk's tables, which we would just recognize as spreadsheets. Just spreadsheets to work out what's going on. Um, now, okay, there's something really weird about this, this law, because it takes individual effectiveness times numbers squared. And, uh, you know, you might object to Fred Lanchester, you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. My intuition is that surely, if this has any worth at all, we should be multiplying numbers, not squared, but just numbers by effectiveness. And Lanchester says, well, yes, actually, I have a number of models that will give you precisely that. If instead of green losses being proportional to red numbers, we just have some number n, which is the same for both sides, and it can vary however you like, the reason it can vary however you like is because if you divide one loss rate by the other, you just get a constant. Then you end up not with the square law, but instead with the role that was um, 
uh, taken by the square law, being taken up by the difference between effectiveness multiplied by numbers for the two sides. And that's known as the linear law. And that applies whenever you have essentially the same scaling of loss rates on the two sides. So Lanchester also writes down what is effectively a model for artillery fire, where green losses are proportional not just to red numbers, but also to green numbers through some kind of density effect. In that case, in either of these cases, you're back to the much simpler idea that what matters is numbers times effectiveness. Um, you can write down a variant of this in which the rule for the two sides is different. So, for example, um, well, Deutschmann in 1963 writes this down as a model for guerrilla warfare, where <coughs> red are the insurgents here, red are able to cause losses in proportion to their numbers, but green cause losses to reds in proportion not only to green's numbers, but also to some multiplier involving red's numbers, because the more visible red is, the easier it is to attack. Anybody who's done any engineering would recognize why I've put in this rather arbitrary factor k here, which I could have absorbed into lowercase g, but then the dimensions would have been wrong. If you want to make dimensional sense of this equation, then OK, what might be going on? Suppose red's advantages are of cover and concealment. There's effectively a diluting factor. Anything that's has a dilution of effect through decoying makes that k bigger. And you can see how that works in the equivalent of the square law. Green benefits, as in the square law, from numbers. But red, as well as benefiting from numbers, makes itself a target through larger numbers. And so you don't get a square law for red, but you do get this multiplier of k, which is the effect of this decoying, dispersal, cover, concealment. So to summarize Deichmann's model, um, green benefits more from numbers and concentration if it scales up its numbers, but there's that extra factor of a half there. It needs its effectiveness to be twice as great, or numbers root two times as great, as they would have to be to win a symmetric aimed fire battle. Deichmann's paper's lovely. Um, there's an awful lot of subtle thinking in it, as well as the mathematics. And as I said, there's his book, uh, I think it's American Foreign Policy and Limited War. I might have transposed foreign and limited there, I'm not sure. No, that's not right. Okay, um, above all, if you remember nothing else, with this asymmetry, red has a defender's advantage. So what we're going to do is interrogate the data by attempting to fit a model in which we have arbitrary powers of numbers on both sides. So uh, what you could, okay, well, I'll talk about it later in the context of air war, but suppose we do that, we're going to have some parameters to fit, R1 and 2, G1 and 2. Um, before we do that, if you play the same game as we did in the last few slides, divide one loss rate by the other, rearrange, integrate, then you get an, a generalization of the square law in which the quantity that is constant and that determines the winner is, now this time I will read it out, uh, the red effectiveness divided by something I'll call the red exponent, multiplied by red numbers to the power of that exponent. So all of the action is in these quantities that I've called the exponents, rho and gamma. Um, above all, red should concentrate its force if rho is bigger than one, divide if rho is less than one, and if, red, uh, sorry, if rho is less than gamma, then red has a defender's advantage. The number that was a half on the previous slide uh, is now gamma over rho. Right, OK, um, when we come to think about air combat, it's actually going to be easier to think directly about, and John Warden was have us do this, the casualty exchange ratio as a function of the loss ratio. And just to specialise what I wrote down on the last slide, the cases we've seen before, for the linear law, remember, we only had linear proportionality to numbers, so rho and gamma were both one, and then the casualty exchange ratio did not depend on numbers. In the square law, the casualty exchange ratio was proportional to the force ratio. And in Deichmann's asymmetric model, uh, the casualty exchange ratio was proportional to 1 over green numbers. Now, green and red numbers are typically highly correlated. What you might better say is that it's proportional to 1 over numbers, whatever numbers mean. And I'll have to get on to that. So numbers of units, what does it mean? Um, so we had to think about the Battle of Britain, and this was with a, actually a BSc project student, Ian Johnson. Um, the Battle of Britain's quite good for playing around with this because, well, it was a battle of attrition, that's what these models are for, and intended annihilation, 
in which one day's fighting was much like another. There are stationarity tests to be done on the time series for people who like words like that. Essentially, it passes. Uh, Single-seat fighters on each side are well matched. All units were seeking engagement. It seemed like good data to set a student loose on. And what we'll do is to take daily loss rates for um, British RAF and German Luftwaffe aircraft and fit to, and our unit numbers here will be sortie numbers. The sortie is your resource in air war, essentially. Um, daily, well, you might say, aren't there aggregation issues there? Yes, there are. Of course there are. A day's data is not arrayed, and one has to think about that. Uh, I won't explain the detail here, but I'll tell you the outcome um, when we get to the results. So in order to do that, anybody who knows what a logarithm is can see that this immediately becomes a nice, simple, linear regression if I just take the logarithms of both sides of my equation. So I'm going to fit the log of red loss rates to some combination of the log of green and log of red numbers. Is that the right thing to do? Well, it depends on the error structure, which has to be essentially more or less constant. Uh, anybody wants to ask me about that afterwards, you're welcome, but I haven't got time to go into it here. So we'll cut straight to some numbers. So what we've got along the bottom here are log of German daily sortie numbers in the Battle of Britain, and on the right, log of British daily sortie numbers, and on the vertical axis, in both cases, we have the log of RAF losses. And you might think, oh, I've seen lines fitted to worse data than that. That's not quite so good. So uh, red losses fit pretty well to green numbers, and indeed they do. In fact, the proportionality to red numbers uh, has a confidence interval that includes zero, so you can drop that. And hey, hooray for Lanchester, he got it right, it seems. So red losses really are roughly proportional to green numbers. Okay, good. And flush with our success, we move on to the Luftwaffe losses. This is a bit, yeah. We've got German Luftwaffe loss numbers here. Along the bottom, on the left, the log of RAF sortie numbers. On the right, uh, the log of Luftwaffe sortie numbers. And the fit's better on the right here. And that's really weird, because actually these German sortie numbers are RAF observed estimates. The Luftwaffe data no longer exist. Um, and that's strange, because we've got German losses proportional to German numbers. Let's see how it plays out. Um, yeah, this time you absolutely reject having any involvement from red numbers. You have Luftwaffe losses proportional to Luftwaffe numbers, roughly. And that's not so good. If you said, OK, I don't like that. I know that uh, Luftwaffe sortie numbers are roughly are pretty well correlated with RAF sortie numbers. Let's just insist on fitting to RAF sortie numbers. Well, the fit isn't very good. It explains or describes about a quarter of the, the, the variance. Um, so what do we do with that? Well, what we could do instead is what I suggested in the last slide on modelling of um, looking at whether or not the casualty exchange ratio, remember John Warden says that it depends exponentially on the force ratio, is dependent on the force ratio. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I don't think you'd get anywhere fitting any kind of trend uh, through that cloud of dots. Yeah. Right. On the other hand, if you fit the loss ratio to sorties, well, there's a bit of a downward trend here. That's not bad. Um, now, the previous slides, we got these rather impressive looking um, linear fits, but you must expect that if you put more planes in the sky, more stuff will happen. And that could be as simple as being an aggregation issue. If I took data with no structure whatsoever and then t took random aggregations of days, of course you'd find that the more days I aggregated into one data point, the bigger the number would be. So actually, there wasn't a lot of information in that. The information ought to be lurking in these kind of plots. <coughs> so in this case, what we've done here, actually, is to take, rather than a uh, log of German sortie numbers, we've got um, a geometric mean of sortie numbers overall. And there, there's at least something of a, a downward trend. It explains uh, a bit less than 20% of the data. Well, medical trials make a lot of money from worse fits than that. Um, and all of this plays absolutely into the big controversy of the Battle of Britain, which was, more or less, should the RAF squadrons, all other things being equal, which they never were, mass into wings, three squadrons, or big wings, five or more, before engaging. And we now have a way of turning that into a modelling question about the data. Um, in, again, in words, this is just, is mere concentration of numbers advantageous for the RAF? In our model, it's simply, is the RAF exponent row bigger than one? 
And the answer is no. Rho is a bit less than 0.8, while gamma, the German um, exponent, is more than 1.3. So that says, well, let's just go. That says that massing numbers is not good, or at least days with large numbers of sorties are not good for the RAF. Um, British Air Doctrine was based upon Lanchester. Um, in terms of the history of it, uh, so Trafford Lee Mallory, who was commander of 12 Group in the RAF to the north, he was very keen on big wings. Uh, Douglas Bader is the more famous proponent of big wings, who talked a load of nonsense. Um, here, to the extent to which Rho is less than Gamma, the RAF has, in our modelling terms, a defender's advantage. And the achievement of, of Keith Park, who was the commander of 11 Group, which bore most of the, uh, the, the brunt of the fighting in the Battle of Britain, lay in. Now, I've said creating and exploiting this advantage. It's not that the war happens and then, you know, th th this model describes the conditions. What you do is you also create the conditions. You create the model, which best fits, and thereby create conditions which are to your advantage. And Keith Park was, knew that he was fighting a defensive battle. Uh, the quote I like here is, it's better to have even one strong squadron of our fighters over the enemy than a wing of three climbing up below them. The point there is that all things are not equal. It takes a long time to build up a wing in the air. Um, the RAF's advantages, I would characterize them here, were of dispersal of force effort and parsimony, being cautious and careful in how it deployed its forces. And I'll say more about that a little bit later on. Um, if you're interested in the organisational aspects of it, we wrote a paper for the journal History. Uh, I think it's quite a nice book-ended problem that in 1914 you've got a Briton, Fred Lanchester, writing about the nature of concentration in, in air war. Then 25 late years later, it just happens that the nation which has to fight the first attritional air battle is the same nation. And in between, you create this organisation, the RAF, out of nothing, which has, in historians' terms, to invent its tradition, to create its doctrine. And tracing how that happens and the things they got right and the things they got, got wrong is quite a good object lesson, I think. I won't say more about that here. Um, Generalising a little bit, so going back to that uh, campaign from what I now realise in this talk is my bet noir, John Warden, that the casualty exchange ratio depends exponentially on the force ratio. He cites a study of Korea and World War II. Well, uh, it doesn't actually justify what he says. Um, let's look actually at another campaign first, the Pacific Air War. Imperial Japanese Navy versus the US Navy. Um, here again, I've got casualty exchange ratio vertically along the bottom. I've got um, log of the force ratio. I don't think, again, you'd want to fit any trend to this data. If you had good arguments that these points were outliers, then you might want to start thinking about diagonal lines. But there is no such strong argument. On the other hand, once again, if you fit the log of the force ratio, sorry, the log of the casualty exchange ratio to the log of the force ratio, then you get a rather clear downward trend, which explains about 30% of the variance. And indeed, if we try and give a final score by just looking at these numbers, which I use to encapsulate the conditions of, uh, of air combat, the exponents, I've already told you that the final score for the Battle of Britain is uh, Germans 1.3, British 0.8. In the Pacific Air War, it's Americans 1.3, Japanese 0.9. <laughs> In Korea, it's Americans 1.2, uh, North Koreans 0.1. But that's not to really to be trusted, this data. The Korean data is more aggregated. There are more problems with it. Um, I said I would come back to the issue of aggregation, which I'm going to sum up, say that the, all of the, the, the statistical analysis ends up telling you that aggregation issues cause the differences in these numbers to be understated. And in fact, typically, these numbers would be further from one if you had true data than they are. So the aggregation issues push these exponents towards linearity. And that's something, again, I could sort of uh, explain in the sort of school maths terms, really, but with 15 minutes and some pencil and paper. So that will leave me isolated at dinner, won't it? Right. Um, <coughs> so something's going on here. <coughs> um, let's have a think about Vietnam as well. So here we've got really good data. This is the, the so-called Red Baron data. Um, and going back to our original model, essentially what we were asking is, does a sortie lead to a loss or a kill or neither? And remember that the scaling up or down with numbers, so what we're trying to understand is whether more or fewer numbers cause you to be more likely to have a sortie lead to a kill or a loss or neither. 
this was kind of fun because I'm a, a dodgy theoretical physicist who does things that have no connection with experiment and uh, I just processed the red barren data and stuck it into just a very basic regression model and uh, as my finger hovered over the key I realized that I was actually engaged like a proper experimental scientist in falsifiability in that if the answer was exactly the opposite of what I expected then the whole paper was scuffered but I decided no I must be brave press the button uh, and it worked in the sense that um, well, most simply, um, F-4 sorties, US fighter sorties, tended to cause um, Vietnamese People's Air Force losses, but not US losses. Thuds F-105s tended to cause neither. There was a tentative conclusion that the US did better when F-4 sorted in numbers. If you're Vietnamese, then your sorties tended to cause losses on your own side. The conclusion, so increased numbers tended to cause disproportionately more losses on your own side. So sortie sparingly, disrupt, avoid engagement. And there's an absolutely lovely paper on Vietnam um, by William Sayers, the Red Baron reports what they really said. To our shame, we did not refer to that in our 2014 paper. I didn't know about it. Uh, when I read it, I thought, OK, that's, this is really good. So I'm going to quote extensively from Sayers' paper. Um, so when he says the US Air Force learned the wrong lessons, he said that all the conclusions were justified to, uh, used to justify a radical overhaul of fighter training. Although actually, almost all of Vietnamese kills were made from a position of unbeatable advantage. Um, most of US losses occurred when the crew were completely unaware that they were under attack. Indeed, a lot of the solution that I won't talk about was the T-ball system, essentially fused information put into the cockpit of US fighter pilots. So uh, what are the correct air power lessons, according to Sayers? Well, um, Sayers emphasizes Mao and writings on terrorism and guerrilla war. And he says the Vietnamese were truly outstanding tacticians. They ceded air superiority to the US in order to wage a guerrilla war. And he talks again and again about the ideas inherent in guerrilla warfare. Um, of course, they had very early, good early warning and ground controlled intercepts. Um, dense and sophisticated Sam and AAA. Um, in terms of our modelling, this is the, the crucial sentence. They never committed their aircraft to battle unless they had a f high probability of a kill and not a loss. So they were very tightly controlled and very cautious and made sure that they did not waste their sorties and thereby waste their aircraft. Um, so to get towards some conclusions, tentatively, air combat absolutely need not be symmetric. Um, it absolutely does not obey Lanchester's square law. Uh, this matters because that principle of mass in U.S. Air Force doctrine, well, okay, what does mass mean? This goes back to Jomini, of course, but for 200 years we've known that mass is not concentration. From the mass Napoleonic column that encountered the dispersed fire of a line of British musketry, uh, it was clear that mass is not concentration. Um, we call that the fallacy of mass. Um, so, in the case of air power, we can identify an asymmetry between the attacker and the defender of surface targets. Um, there is probably some Lanchestrian advantage in numbers and concentration for the attacker, but the reverse is true for the defender. I guess, okay, now this is where I perhaps go a bit too far with my numbers. I thought, let me try and put a proportion on this from the data. Most of defensive air law is just linear law combat. No surprises what you might expect if you were to try and think through the numbers game. Uh, Wayne Hughes used to like to call it a, a sum of duels. But what is left, maybe a fifth, maybe a quarter of the effect, is asymmetric in the sense of Deitchman, of being like guerrilla warfare. So if you want to see the, the full connection thought about between Deitchman's model and guerrilla warfare, read his paper, it's very, very good. And uh, the lessons are fairly obvious, really. Um, they are disperse, disrupt, be sparing, be parsimonious, make minimal fleeting attacks from positions of advantage. Of course, in the B Battle of Britain and everywhere else, create fused, filtered, so s integrated information sy systems which give the person on the ground signal over noise and thoroughly integrate with ground-based air defence. That, that's all kind of fairly obvious, really. Or at least it seems fairly obvious to everybody, I think except the writers of US Air Force Doctrine. Um, there is actually now a, another, so if you go down through Doctrine, of course it's updated at least every two years, there's a section on counter-air operations, and uh, it's rather sweet. So the, the writer of that has to live with this terrible idea of mass sitting there at the top level. And at one point they say uh, that uh, force does not have to be, quotes, so what 
humanities historian uh, academics call shudder quotes, meaning I don't like this term, quote, massed, uh, so they don't, if they don't have to be massed in order to achieve distributed concentration of effect. Um, and he italicizes distributed. But then he carries on getting a bit confused, or she carries on getting a bit confused, the writer, because they say, uh, what is it, that uh, there is always there's a danger if you disperse your forces too much that you lose offensive effect. And I think really you need to step back from it and think a little bit about causality, what causes what. Sometimes you are on the defensive, that's the way it is. Um, and in fact, actually, that the way it's written echoes for me the stuff that we wrote in our history paper at the Battle of uh, Britain about the development of RAF doctrine between the wars, which reaches the, the sort of apogee of confusion in 1938, when they really, the, the commander of the RAF Staff College, doesn't really have any clear thoughts about whether you need to mass to attack incoming enemy or not. Um, I think I mean, we have an answer now. I think I will leave you there. Um, I will finish just with a few bits of text from our 2014 paper, which can sit there on the screen while I answer questions. But thank you for listening. So, um, we'll have some uh, questions and answers. And uh, I think I'd like to, to challenge you with the uh, Having looked at this uh, with air war, um, do you see how this can be applied on a much more complex situation with ground war? Um, it needs new ideas. Uh, I've had a succession of project students. So the best, the best case I had was Kursk, the Kursk database. But people fighting the Battle of Kursk were a bit too busy doing other things to keep score carefully. And even with the Kursk data, I don't think there's anything meaningful you can do like this. I guess, I mean, y you might say there has always been in land warfare um, a big spectrum of masses, sizes, velocities, kinetic effects. And that's now moving up off the ground with UAV systems right down from the little few kilos carrying a grenade at section level up to, I don't know, you know, really big drones at a higher level. Um, there are, okay, so um, hmm. if, if there were a good way to go, it would be by talking to my colleague Jamie Wood, the systems biologist, because actually the mathematics of modeling ecosystems has become enormously more uh, accomplished over the last 20 or 30 years. And there are many ways of dealing with predator prey systems with size spectra. Um, there are interesting ideas there, but they, they have to, they're very much using current ideas rather than old ideas. And they would, I think, crucially. As you say, so it, you, you've got to get the complexity down to an, a meaningful essence somehow. So, for example, uh, you can look at predator-predator <coughs> predator models effectively in the sea. Big fish eat little fish without discrimination. And you can look at what unbalances fishery systems as big fish eat little fish eat smaller fish and so on. And they, you get quite interesting dynamics in which um, the size spectrum may or may not approach an equilibrium. Um, that's the kind of broad context of the kind of modeling which might possibly say something worthwhile, but nothing like that has been done yet. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's very interesting. I guess the question I have is, does the model account for uh, cases where the type of loss might be different? Right? So when you're looking at the Battle of Britain, for example, a German loss of system and pilot is effectively the same thing because a German shot down over Britain spends the rest of the war in a POW camp. Uh, a British pilot shot down, back up the next day. Same thing like good wood on the ground where you, know, you have British tank crews getting three or four tanks the course of the battle, but a tiger that's destroyed is, is out for, for good. No, it doesn't. Um, the Germans were better at picking up pilots in the English Channel, actually, than the RAF were. Um, this is just airframes, essentially. And, of course, the British were outbuilding the Germans in airframes enormously at the time. Um, no, it doesn't. We do have a later paper which uses a completely different technique, uh, which we call bootstrapping the Battle of Britain. And we introduce a weighted bootstrapping for counterfactual history. And there, are, uh, the crucial summary statistic on the British side is number of pilots, not number of airframes. But this is just airframe numbers. There's a uh, question from uh, Brigadier General Jorn Morten Mangersnes. Uh, 
I'll try one. If you please go back to the um, the, lo um, the previous slide. No, thank you. That again. Yeah. No, that one. Um, Sorry, did you say not that one? This the second. No, forward, please. Well, um, okay, I'll take my <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> that one. The one summing it, summing it up. The point is, um, 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 have you this this one? Yes. Have you discussed applying this type of uh, study on the current war uh, between Russia and Ukraine? Um, We're thinking I'll about it. I'll I have nothing to say, and I certainly have no good data. Because I'll caveat it. Uh, uh, currently, I think the data is very scarce and not available. Uh, but I also think that in due time, when um, we know more about the Russian air operations and the Ukrainian air defense and offensive operations, I think we will. it will be highly interesting to see what findings that can, uh, what knowledge and information that can give us in uh, understanding how to plan for war in the future. I agree. If <laughs> through any means possible, I can get hold of some data that would be great. I should perhaps uh, at least advertise Michael Armstrong, Brock University in Canada, has a paper on uh, using uh, some generalizations of Lanchester's equations created by Wayne Hughes for analyzing the effectiveness of Iron Dome. And that paper is in uh, operations research. I don't think perhaps that, that the models that were being used there are general enough to capture uh, what's really going on yet. But that was an interesting start. So Michael Armstrong. Colonel Harling. I'm also not an air expert, as you probably guessed. Uh, I'm coming from the uh, Army School of Land Operation and Tactics. And um, when you say that this applies or the study that you have made uh, are sort of the best case you can find uh, because you have the, the right conditions to apply the mathematics. And then the, the outcome is that uh, you Basically, this is the outcome. It doesn't apply that uh, you should use mass the way we use in modern doctrine. But since this is one of the few cases where we actually have the conditions, wouldn't then sort of a good conclusion also be that we should avoid uh, conditions like we had in the Battle of Britain and try to seek conditions where, we, where these laws do not apply and where we are quite sure to win? It depends whether you're the aggressor or the defender of surface targets. And if you're in charge of a small air force defending surface territory, then I think the lessons from every conflict we've looked at are clear enough. It gets more complicated with Yom Kippur, say, just because of the complexity of the interaction with GCI and SAM um, systems. But it depends. I mean, if you are... Uh, creating strike packages to attack defended territory, then you could take the lesson from this that in the past larger numbers have been more effective. I think you'd want to think about that fairly thoroughly before you continue to advocate mass. Why? Because US Air Force doctrine uses this concept of mass very uncritically and very in a very question-begging manner without ever really defining it except as an intrinsic good. And that's the sort of lack of questioning of authority that looks uh, pretty dreadful to me. I guess I'm used to academic seminars where species are, are sort of mercilessly questioned afterwards, never let go, and then really pressed hard on the detail by button, buttonholing them over coffee. And actually, the Russian tradition is even stronger than that of academic physics, physics seminars. So they, they really do make sure they get to the bottom of things. Funny how it works in society, isn't it? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, how do you think this would look like in the future with artificial intelligence and automated systems? Far too complicated for me to say anything sensible about. There's more expertise in every head in the room than I have. What would I say? I mean, to begin with, you could take the lessons from uh, Dr. Rubin's seminar. Um, that the, the spectrum is moving upwards from the ground. What is the role going to be for manned aircraft, uh, you know, the generation of the Tempest? It's all going to be about information and control and what kind of killer drones are we going to have? We've got Hornet drones yet that can, at every 
size and speed intercept drones and shoot them and get rid of them? I don't know. I mean, that's not for me to say. It's going to get complicated. It may be that all this stuff, you know, that maybe that the era of simple minimal numbers of types of roughly homogeneous manned aircraft is over. So actually, this is just history. I don't know. Do we have any questions uh, from the online audience? Well, uh, Neil, thank you very much for an interesting uh, presentation. And uh, we, ha we will have a break for 15 minutes before the last uh, presentation, which is uh, online from the US. So we'll gather again quarter to uh, four. Thank you, Neil. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to take your seats, please? <coughs> Our next speaker, uh, he is working at the uh, US Marine Corps University at, uh, and he is a course director on theory and the nature of war. His name is Sean Callahan. He um, works at the Command and Staff College Distance Education Program. And Sean, he served in the US Marine Corps as an F-18 weapons and census officer from 1992 to 2014. His operational deployments include support of campaigns in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia and Kosovo, Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as deployments to the Western Pacific Theater. While on active duty, he pursued a second career track in military education, earning a Master of Arts in History from George Washington University, teaching history at the US Naval Academy, and serving as a syndicate leader at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College. Since his military retirement in 2014, Sean has been providing contractor support to Marine Corps University through Davis Defense Group. He is the content writer and director for the Command and Staff College's uh, non-resident theory and nature war course, and also supports several continuing education electives on maneuver warfare. Sean is currently a doctoral candidate at the University of Maryland, finishing a dissertation on the Cold War origins of maneuver warfare doctrine. And he will today speak about implications of the war in Ukraine for forces with maneuver-based doctrine or doctrines. So, Sean, I hope you're with us. Uh, very, I'm very happy yes, to have evening, you as a speaker. Evening. And uh, the the web is yours. Thank you. Thank you. How was the How audio? Was the audio? Can somebody, can somebody somebody know somebody know you hear me? Can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you very, thank much, very much for the much introduction. introduction. Um, um, I must apologize, apologize that I'm here presenting, presenting from uh, Annapolis, Maryland, near Washington D.C., uh, because I really uh, wanted the opportunity to come to the conference this year. Last year in Oslo, I found it to be a very professionally rewarding uh, conference, and uh, it's great to see so many people attending this second year. And I hope to see uh, it again in the future and have the opportunity to, tra to travel to Oslo to participate. Um, before I begin, I need to make two brief disclaimers. Um, yes, I am a contract employee of the Marine Corps University, but everything I present here today is going to be my own private opinion. It has nothing to do and is not the opinions of the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps University, or any other U.S. government agency. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that this presentation is going to be based entirely on open sources. And I know there are many conference participants there who are much closer to the events going on and probably have knowledge of events that uh, will contradict some of the things I present as fact based on what I've gathered from open source uh, in sources. So with that in mind, I look forward to, uh, to learning from them as this conference goes on, much as I have already this morning. And uh, I think the spirit of what I'm about to present will nonetheless remain consistent but I look forward to revising it as uh, the circumstances call for. So with that, I'll begin my paper. <clears throat> 
The Russian, Russian invasion of Ukraine has resulted in a 10-month war which does not seem likely to end in the near future. The combatants and their supporters are learning lessons from the conflict regarding doctrine, force development, training, and strategy that may increase their prospects for success in this war and in future conflicts. Many nations and forces which do not have a direct role are also studying this conflict. For example, the U.S. Army had planned to release the newest version of its operational doctrine, Field Manual 3 tac 0 last spring, but delayed that publication until October so it would have time to consider what the war in Ukraine meant. Analysts are also sure the People's Republic of China is considering what this war means for its ambitions to seize Taiwan, though it is not clear what conclusions the Chinese are drawing. One thing is clear no matter who is doing the looking. Disciplined analysis is needed if valid conclusions are to be reached, rather than rushing to hasty judgments or confirming preconceived notions. Some have, for example, used the events in Ukraine to claim that revolutionary changes in the character of war are underway, such as by prematurely announcing the death of the tank or manned aircraft. Over the last few decades, several NATO nations have adopted maneuver-based doctrines to lesser or greater degrees and they should be acutely interested in the war in Ukraine. This is especially true because maneuver warfare is a concept which has been surrounded by great debate since its inception in the 1970s. The war in Ukraine can be a means of clarifying misunderstandings about maneuver warfare and assessing its relevance to future war. That is the aim of this paper. Before considering the implications of the war, it is important to clarify what is meant by maneuver warfare. It is after all a concept that is still surprisingly misunderstood and subject to contentious debate. In its simplest terms, maneuver warfare prioritizes disruption of enemy systems over the physical destruction of enemy combat power. It does this by intentionally trying to change the tactical or operational situation faster than one's adversary can make good sense of it. It is hard to provide a more precise definition, especially in this international forum, because there are differences in how it is understood and described even among the very forces which embrace disruptive maneuver as the basis for their doctrine. I generally see two schools of maneuvers thinking, a British tradition and an American tradition, or perhaps more precisely, a late Cold War American invention. The British developed theirs first, and it reflects Sir Basil Littlehart's emphasis on the indirect approach and exploiting initiative and tempo. The Americans came later, inspired by the German way of war, as interpreted by William S. Lind and giving theoretical elaboration by John Boyd. The American approach is certainly informed by Liddell Hart, but became much more explicit in its emphasis on using time as a weapon to unbalance and confuse an adversary, shattering his ability to act effectively as a cohesive whole. What these two schools share is that both seek to wage what JFC Fuller referred to as brain warfare. They seek victory by attacking an adversary's ability to understand and act. What I am discussing in this paper includes both the British concept of maneuver and the American idea of maneuver warfare. So I will refer to any doctrine along these lines as maneuver-based doctrine. The alternative to focusing on such disruptive maneuver is placing a premium on the destruction of the adversary's combat power, most often through the liberal application of firepower. We have come to know this mode of fighting as attrition warfare. I must pause here to explain that too much has been made of the contrast between maneuver and attrition, pitting them as polar opposites, a dichotomy which forces us to choose between one or the other and allowing no blend. This was a rhetorical technique adopted by the American maneuvers in the Cold War. They looked to the potential war in Europe against the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s and did not believe the U.S. and its allies could ever hope to match the sheer mass of Warsaw Pact forces. As a result, they wanted to help the U.S. military understand its habitual overdependence on industrial resources and firepower to overwhelm adversaries, and they wanted to promote a smarter way of think fighting, one that attacked an enemy system to destroy its cohesion rather than physically destroying it piece by piece. The maneuvers were trying to shock the American military into making a choice, to abandon dependence on mass and firepower in favor of a new way of fighting that could deliver outsized results. Unfortunately, in their zeal, by presenting these two modes of warfare as binary opposites, the maneuver warfare advocates fostered misunderstandings. Critics of the new concept argued that it was silly to think that maneuver might somehow deliver bloodless victory. They ridiculed the maneuverists for seeming to think they could win without actually fighting. 
Neither of these was actually true. The maneuverists always understood violence to be omnipresent in war and firepower to be a vital ingredient in forcing one's will upon the enemy. By presenting a model that placed disruptive maneuver on one hand and destructive firepower on the other, however, the maneuverists seemed to create a dichotomy. By arguing that physical violence was not the key to success, they appeared to repudiate the very grammar of war. They're placing everything familiar about war on one pole and their ambitious vision for a new way of fighting on the other. In arguing that war could be won with less bloodshed and destruction, they appeared to be making unrealistic promises, fundamentally odds with how Americans tended to understand war. Now, in recent years, some of the original maneuver warfare advocates have come out and admitted this was a mistake. They now see that it is better to view these two approaches as existing on a spectrum and perhaps complementing each other. For example, they point out that sometimes a campaign or war of attrition might be unavoidable, but maneuver tactics might still prove valuable for winning individual batters, battles at lower cost, contributing to attritional progress in the larger picture. What does this mean for this discussion? I do not see the maneuverist and attritional approaches as mutually exclusive, but rather a necessary yin and yang, a balance of disruptive maneuver and destructive firepower. Now, that being said, I do see that some forces clearly favor disruption or destruction as their preferred defeat mechanisms, and these different doctrinal approaches matter. Among other things, it has a deep imprint on organizational culture with wide repercussions. I therefore frame my analysis of the Ukraine war through a contrast of two styles which are not mutually exclusive. In fact, in the end, I'm going to argue that the blend of these two approaches is probably best. For the sake of contrast, though, when I discuss maneuver-based doctrine, I'm referring to ways of fighting which intend to bring about the adversary's defeat by disrupting his cohesion and use fling firepower to play a supporting role in bringing that about. They will also use firepower to defeat dislocated adversary forces in detail. When I refer to the attritional way of war, I'm talking about approaches that seek to defeat the enemy through physical destruction of his combat power, whether it be a decisive battle of annihilation or a more incremental erosion of his forces, resources, and willpower. With these clarifications out of the way, we can finally turn to the war in Ukraine and what it means. But first, the big picture. The war to date seems to have evolved in three stages. The first was the initial Russian invasion and Ukrainian response from February 24th to April 7th of this year. The second was a more static phase from April 8th to September 5th. In this period, military effort was focused on contesting the expansion of Russian territorial control in the oblasts in the east and southeast. The final phase began on September 6th and appears to be ongoing today. It was characterized at first by dramatic Ukrainian counteroffensives towards Kharkiv, then continued in a more gradual, man gradual manner, recovering territory southeast to Kherson and farther east into the Donbass. The onset of winter and the outcome of the current Russian offensive against Bakhmut may signal a larger change, but it's still too early to tell. So despite the second phase being defined by a static front, while the third phase has seen progressive Ukrainian territorial gains, the essential character of these two parts indicates more similarities than differences. I will therefore analyze this conflict as a progression from a failed attempt to fight a rapid campaign of maneuver to a more incremental conflict where successes have largely been a product of firepower. The initial campaign of maneuver. There have been many comparisons between the initial Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. First, the Russians made only a limited commitment of the Russian Air Force and failed to achieve air superiority. While air supremacy is not a vital ingredient for decisive maneuver, flexible and responsive combined arms is. Maneuver forces can increase their mobility by going light on organic supporting arms but ideally this should be compensated for by the close integration of long range indirect fire systems and aviation fires. This is simply not how the Russian Air Force is designed. Is designed. And absent flexible aviation support, the Russians were increasingly dependent on organic indirect fires. When they encountered unexpected resistance, the Russians could not stop, could not bring the firepower of responsive combined arms to bear to sustain tempo and achieve deeper maneuver. This problem was compounded by another factor once the advance began to stagnate. The Russian columns were soon handicapped by inadequate supply, particularly fuel. Roadbound and immobile, they became easy targets. 
effective maneuver forces expect to travel light, but they realize that this imposes limits to operational reach. Reliable and flexible logistics are a necessity for helping them adapt to unforeseen setbacks and opportunities and to sustain their momentum. Another key ingredient missing from the equation in the Russian advance was flexible tactical leadership. The Russian army has long lacked a system for developing non-commissioned officers who are prepared to take on the burden of tactical leadership in dynamic situations. This meant an over-reliance on junior officers in combat with heavy ca casualties in these ranks. This contributed to tempo and momentum becoming quick victims to the friction that is inherent in warfare. The Russians were slow to react and adapt to changes going on around them, and when resistance brought progress to a halt, senior leaders had to go forward to personally try and restore the advance. This led to generals being targeted and killed, further spreading dysfunction within the Russian system. The result was a net loss of agility that made it easier for smaller Ukrainian forces to deal with the leaderless Russian units. A key trend in these three factors is the lack of flexibility in combined arms, in logistics, and in leadership, all of which were identified by the developers of maneuver warfare long ago as critical prerequisites for sustaining successful maneuver. Of course, the Russian failure in this initial campaign was as much a result of Ukrainian achievements as it was of Russian missteps. By the end of this phase, a dramatic difference in the quality of these forces and their command styles became clear. In contrast to the dysfunctional Russian system, which depended on top-down decision-making and pressure from above, the initial Ukrainian resistance was provided by a pickup force acting when and where it could in response to the developing situation. Either by design or by necessity, the Ukrainians in various types of units, and even acting individually, were making decisions at lower levels to take advantage of opportunities as they arose. This created tactical agility that made it harder for the Russians to defeat Ukrainian counterattacks. One Western advisor closely connected with the Ukrainian efforts has suggested that the defenders in this war seem culturally disposed to taking individual initiative. Perhaps, or maybe this is more a matter of necessity created by the urgent circumstances of being forced to fight on their own homeland. Whatever the reason, it seems to have conveyed not just tactical advantages, but systemic ones. Already holding a home field advantage in battle space awareness, the Ukrainians quickly fielded volunteer units of drone operators. They developed a web application allowing a wide variety of users to crowdsource Russian unit locations from cell phones. They then turned these into an operational strength for targeting, creating a flexible fires network, which some have referred to as artillery Uber. Now, there were definite limits to how much firepower the Ukrainians had available in these early weeks, but their military leaders stated that artillery was decisive. This was because they were able to use what they had very responsibly, putting pinpoint fires on Russian forces at the right times and places. In essence, Ukrainian fire support was much better configured for supporting a quickly changing tactical and operational situation than the one the Russians brought to fight their own high mobility campaign. Many analysts were surprised at how quickly the deficiencies of the Russian army were exposed in this campaign and the poor quality of its forces certainly has much to do with its failure. Regardless of the root causes, however, it is important to note that many of the things the Russians got wrong are exactly those that maneuver warfare advocates warn against. What the Russians attempted was little more than a bum rush on Kiev on maybe two or maybe three axes. They were defeated by a force with less overt combat power, and many of the things the Ukrainians got right are suggestive of maneuver warfare principles. And the offensive towards Kiev was not an isolated or unique case. Similar factors produced similar results in southern Ukraine, where the Russians launched another offensive out of Crimea. The Russians made some deep thrusts, but the most aggressive past Mikolaev was defeated leaving them with more modest gains in the Kherson and Zaporizhzhia oblasts. While many of the factors I've described are essential components of maneuver warfare, some have continued to plague the Russians after the initial campaigns, even as the war took on a very different character. Indeed, I would say it is this human element, combined with the enormous disparity in the commitment and willpower of the Ukrainian people compared to the Russian invaders, which has allowed them to prevail for so long, and redefine this conflict into something that President Putin never sought. Rather than quickly achieving victory in a short yet limited special military operation, he now faces a sustained war of attrition 
stretching national resources to their limits. The ongoing war of firepower. After the Russian failure to deliver a rapid victory in phase one and subsequent expulsion from the region around Kyiv, in early April, they reconcentrated their efforts on the east. This major reinvestment allowed some gains before the way war stabilized in the eastern oblasts. This is a much shallower occupation than originally planned in a region the Russians probably originally intended to be their rear areas. This relatively static phase of the conflict in the east lasted until early September, after which the Ukrainians have generally been making progress in operational counteroffensives, what some consider a third phase of the war. Despite the differences between the two phases, there are enough similarities that is best to analyze their common character. These two phases stand out more in contrast to the first than they do from each other. In this ongoing war concentrated in the east and southeast, the evidence indicates that firepower has been critically important. Artillery has been tactically decisive, bringing the initial Ukrainian counterattacks to a halt and causing significant casualties to Ukrainian forces over the next several months along that front. While the Russians did make some slow advances, these were limited, and most of the Russian casualties sustained in the process were also due to artillery. The predominance of casualties caused by artillery is just one indicator that firepower is the decisive element in this ongoing war. A prerequisite to tactical gains has been preempting the enemy from using his own heavy fires, ideally by destroying them. Both sides have placed a premium on attacking their adversary's firepower in an all-domain contest to find and destroy artillery, rocket, and missile assets. Reconnaissance forces focus more on locating enemy fire units and headquarters to target than finding opportunities for maneuver. Signals intelligence has been most decisive not at divining enemy intentions, but in pinpointing targets, such mo so much so that it has been said, if it radiates, it dies. As time has gone on, counter-battery fires have caused fewer casualties, but only because both sides have learned to move immediately after shooting because to do otherwise invites destruction. Here it is clear that maneuver is serving firepower. It might be even better to say that it's merely mobility that is serving firepower. Even deception efforts serve less to create ambiguity and disguise friendly intentions than to facilitate friendly fires and frustrate enemy fire. The Ukrainians, for example, built wooden high Mars decoys to encourage the Russians to waste their reconnaissance and strike assets. So what I'm describing is not merely a contest for fire superiority in support of tactical maneuver or immediate terrain objectives. It is a campaign of fire and counterfire for operational superiority in firepower. Certainly, the Ukrainians had little hope of contesting the Russian army in this aspect for long without the significant support they have been receiving from NATO nations. In this ongoing war of attrition, long-range farm-provided systems like HIMARS have been invaluable along with enabling capabilities like signals intelligence. A great portion of NATO support has also been in the form of artillery ammunition and tubes, and the barrels are wearing out at such a rate that NATO is now providing upper echelon maintenance in Poland to keep these weapons in action. The Russian army has long been known for its heavy reliance on artillery, but providing these weapon systems to the Ukrainians at scale has enabled them to essentially meet the Russian army head on. This symmetric capability has been matched with asymmetric efforts, using deep fires to nullify what should have been strong Russian advantages. Deep fires into Crimea on targets like airfields have denied the Russians a sanctuary and severely limited their ability to present Ukraine with a multi-axis strategic problem. Deep fires have also been decisive, the decisive element in the maritime domain, denying the Russian Navy free use of the Black Sea to support operations in Ukraine. The Russians proved unable to hold Snake Island under artillery bombardment from the mainland. The Ukrainians also skillfully carried out a successful coordinated attack with the Neptune missile system to sink the Moskva, the Russian flagship and the centerpiece of Russian fleet defense. Despite what appeared to be a strong Russian advantage at sea, Ukraine put the Russian fleet on its heels. They then followed that up with innovative surface drone attacks into the Black Sea fleet base at Sevastopol forcing it to withdraw further eastward into the Russian port of Novorossiysk, where it was again subjected to attacks. The skillful and innovative use of deep fires redefined the war in the south. 
Lacking similar targets to attack, the Russians have repeatedly re resorted to using their deep fires on what might be considered strategic targets, infrastructure and civilian morale. President Putin is trying to make life as hard as possible on the Ukrainian people in an effort to undermine their support of the ongoing war. These Russian missile attacks seem to correlate with battlefield setbacks for Putin's forces. This suggests that these strikes are at least partially a sign of Putin's own frustration with the Russian army's inability to achieve a military victory in Ukraine, despite an exhausting commitment of resources. So to many then, it would seem that the ongoing war in Ukraine is one more step on the path towards a new era of warfare between reconnaissance strike complexes. Many have forecast this change in the character of war and others have actively sought to promote it. In this form of conflict, maneuver primarily serves firepower. Movement within the battle space makes it hard for the enemy to target one's own forces while putting friendly fire units in a position to destroy the enemy. There have been indications, however, that maneuver still offers other possibilities. The Ukrainian counteroffensive around Kharkiv in September, for example, suggests that maneuver still has great potential. The Ukrainians attacked with surprise in that region not to destroy enemy forces outright, but to penetrate, bypass, and encircle, putting their own forces in Russian rear areas so that the resistance of the entire region crumbled. More than 6,000 square kilometers of territory was recaptured in two weeks. Now, the Russians have claimed that this was largely a function of the region being defended not by well-organized regular forces, but by the Donetsk People's Militia and Luhansk People's Militia. There is some dispute as to how much of the First Guard's tank army was present around Kharkiv at the time of the offensive. But even if most of it had been relocated to Kherson, the Ukrainians still deserve credit for causing this through a maneuverist approach and operational shaping. They presented the Russians with many happenings on the southeast front especially further south towards Kherson, preventing the Russians from understanding their intent. With Russian attention directed southwards, the Ukrainians then struck along a path of least expectation in the north and achieved dramatic gains before the Russians could shift combat power to react effectively. The disintegration of, Russian, of the Russian system south and east of Kharkiv was so complete that it forced a fundamental reassessment of Russian operational objectives. When the Russians shifted combat power north to try and preserve their hold in the Donbass and over critical lines of communication, the Ukrainians were able to shift effort back to the south in an offensive towards Kherson. This again forced the Russians to reevaluate how badly they wanted to fight to keep the only oblast capital they had captured in the initial invasion, or the only one they still held. Ultimately, the Russians withdrew when it became clear that the cost of holding Kherson would be too high and demand too much combat power needed for the fight in the Donbass. All of this was happening against the backdrop of a larger reevaluation of the Russian strategy in the war, leading President Putin to in all practical terms concede that the special military operation had failed and a massive mobilization was needed. Put another way, decisive events in this campaign of firepower and attrition in the Eastern Oblasts has been the result of dramatic victories enabled by operational and tactical maneuver. Again, however, maneuver being decisive has been the exception rather than the rule in this ongoing war. Opportunities to employ maneuver to good tactical and operational effect will also decrease over time due to the very nature of the battle space. The closer the Ukrainians come to restoring their original borders, the less space they have for deep maneuver, at least without making overt incursions into Russia's own territory. They've wisely avoided doing this so far in the war and it's unlikely the operational advantages of deep maneuver across the border into Russia would outweigh the strategic advantages of fighting an essentially defensive war. Accepting that the Russians will have a sanctuary across the border, the shallower the Russian occupation becomes, the denser its combat power gets and the closer it gets to its base of supply. Possibilities for decisive maneuver, even in tactics, become even more limited. The essential character of the Eastern Front is that the Russian military is still entrenched in about 20% of Ukraine and is going to be very difficult for the Ukrainians to push them out, especially considering the Russian ability to absorb losses. While maneuver has had episodic utility in this war of firepower and resources on what is becoming an industrial scale, that is less likely to be the case if things continue on the current trajectory. <laughs>
In the end, neither the catastrophically bad performance of Russian forces nor the considerable achievements of the Ukrainians definitively proves or disproves the relevance of maneuver warfare as a concept or maneuver-based doctrines as a basis for future war. Just as events in Ukraine seem to confirm the emergence of war by reconnaissance strike complex, it also suggests that maneuver still has some continued relevance. For those countries and forces which maintain maneuver-based doctrines, however, it does provide an opportunity to reflect and reevaluate, and I offer three pre key points to consider. First, to continue to treat maneuver warfare and attrition warfare as a dichotomy is more harmful than useful. Doing so obstructs a deeper understanding of how fires and maneuver relate. If we can get past simplistic ideas, which long ago served beyond their purpose in energizing the maneuver warfare movement, we can instead focus on how to understand the relationship between these two ways of thinking about war and how to balance the two. This leads to my second and third points. Second, we should acknowledge that maneuver-based doctrine places a premium on flexible and decentralized command, combined arms rather than supporting arms, reliable and flexible logistics, and effective small unit leadership. These are traits that will generally be beneficial in all forms of conflict, which are not emphasized in doctrines which place an overemphasis on massing fires under centralized control. Forces which seek to apply firepower on a massive scale against an adversary that is trying to do the same in return tend to focus on maximizing net efficiency. Net efficiency tends to improve under centralized control but net efficiency is not the same thing as combat effectiveness and may not be enough to win a war. For example, a nation's size or strategic position may dictate avoiding protracted campaigns against more powerful enemies. In such a case, the disadvantaged force needs to privilege the qualities which go along with maneuver-based approaches to war, knowing that they will probably sell, serve well in any form of conflict. We should be cautious, however, and admit that maneuver is not the solution to all problems, leading to my third and final point. We must also admit the character of interstate war seems to be placing a greater premium on targeting and firepower. This is not how your military prefers to fight. It may still be a style of fighting imposed upon your nation. You must prepare for it, and it is unlikely that merely being able to operate with more initiative and at a higher tempo will yield victory in a campaign of attrition. It takes more than just talent to win a war of attrition, and doctrine is more than just a preferred way of fighting. It is also the basis for force design or a complement to force design. Maneuver forces tend to build themselves to be light and fast at the expense of heavy logistics and firepower. Daring tactical maneuver can win battles, but these losses can be absorbed by an adversary with superior resources. The implication is that maneuver-based forces need to think hard about equipping themselves with the systems needed not just to facilitate tactical maneuver, but also to participate in the large-scale destruction of adversary reconnaissance strike complexes. Is some compromise possible between being a maneuver-based force and a heavy firepower force? This needs to be looked at more closely to find new balances between mobility and firepower, and to find ways to exploit initiative and flexibility without overdependence on centralized information sharing networks. The key challenge here will be one of culture and process, one that gets the fundamental differences between the maneuverist and attritional views on war. Can the qualities that the maneuverist prize be harnessed to increase the net effectiveness of winning a contest of fires, even at the cost of immediate efficiency in applying firepower? Can that trade-off between immediate efficiency and ultimate effectiveness be made tolerable? I humbly submit these questions for your consideration in the hopes that they will lead to productive inquiry, moving past some of the hang-ups and misconceptions that have characterized debates about maneuver warfare for some time. We need a better understanding of the relationship between destructive firepower and disruptive maneuver to build forces with enough competence in each mode to adopt either approach as might be best in any particular situation. With that, I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions on this idea and any other aspects I've discussed. Uh, we'll open up for questions from the audience. Yeah. Maybe give him a hand first. 
So um, do you have any questions from the audience? And we can use the microphones. Uh, he will hear us. Would you like to uh, make any final comments uh, or uh, ideas that you or express any ideas uh, that you have been thinking about after we open up? Well, aside from my pre-planned comments, uh, maybe the only other thing I would share is a little bit of insight that I've gained from uh, our time in Quantico. Uh, many people may not be aware that uh, the Marine Corps has been undergoing a significant uh, change in the last two years under a program called Force Design 2030. Uh, I think your general early admitted to the, or acknowledged the fact that the Marine Corps has uh, gotten rid of its tanks. Um, this is not something that is driven by um, the idea that tanks are irrelevant in warfare, but instead by uh, the United States' increased emphasis on countering China in, and other nations in the littorals, and the Marine Corps wanting to play a more unique role in that fight. So this abandonment of uh, tanks and adoption of more long-range uh, artillery systems, missiles, anti-ship missiles, and uh, rocket systems is more a reflection of the Marine Corps adopting a more unique mission than any uh, um, sense that the character war is fundamentally changing. Now, that being said, one of the things that got me so interested in this topic is the fact that getting involved in the naval fight places the Marine Corps in a combat environment that is very different than it's uh, the way it planned to fight ashore. Um, naval combat has been described by its experts as something that is fundamentally attritional and uh, very much sounds like a reconnaissance strike complex at sea. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how the Marine Corps negotiates this. This kind of gets to the theme of my paper. If the Marine Corps strives to be a maneuverous force and previously equipped itself that way, it now seems to be seeking a better balance between maneuver and attrition. But one of the toughest parts of this is going to be trying to negotiate how to be a part of a maritime domain that is uh, commanded and controlled in what seem to be fundamentally different ways from what the Marine Corps saw it, sort of strove to uh, practice over the last few decades. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts on that. And uh, I know that uh, there has been or there's uh, an ongoing question uh, to this uh, new concept uh, of the US Marine Corps. And um, I'm very happy to, uh, to hear your thoughts on that. Well, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, a hand for uh, Sean again, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope I have the uh, invitation to come next year and be there in person. I hope so. I will invite you definitely uh, if you are going to have a new seminar. Um, <coughs> I have uh, some uh, information for the dinner, but before that, I have a really good uh, some really good news we are have been able to stack up one more presentation no i'm just kidding <laughs> uh, <coughs> we'll have an icebreaker at uh, 5 30 p.m 17 uh, 30 and there will be drinks available at the bar and uh, at 18 30 or 6 30 p.m we'll uh, go for dinner, the same place as we had the lunch. And uh, we will also serve, for those of you who, who would like to have that, uh, wine. You, you can also choose to have beer. Just uh, move over to the bar and we'll uh, provide that. And of course, we'll also provide non-alcoholic uh, soft drinks. So, um, are there... Yeah. Um, with regard to uh, dress code, I think uh, we have uh, put it on the web page, but we'll go for civilian uh, attire. So jacket, no tie for everyone. So you can get out of this and feel a little bit more comfortable. Are there any questions b before uh, we uh, finalize here and then uh, prepare for the icebreaker? <coughs> 
Well, thank you very much for today. I uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 8 o'clock here. Um, before that, we'll have some uh, uh, socializing in the bar and around the dinner table. So, thank you.